Chapter One of Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter One. Treats of the place where Oliver Twist was born, and of the circumstances attending his birth. Among other public buildings in a certain town, which for many reasons it will be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name, there is one anciently common to most towns, great or small, to wit, a workhouse. And in this workhouse was born on a day and date which I need not trouble myself to repeat, inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader, in this stage of the business at all events, the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. For a long time after it was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear any name at all in which case it is somewhat more than probable that these memoirs would never have appeared. Or, if they had, that being comprised within a couple of pages, they would have possessed the inestimable merit of being the most concise and faithful specimen of biography extant in the literature of any age or country. Although I am not disposed to maintain that the being born in a workhouse is in itself the most fortunate and enviable circumstance that can possibly befall a human being, I do mean to say that, in this particular instance, it was the best thing for Oliver Twist that could by possibility have occurred. The fact is, that there was considerable difficulty in inducing Oliver to take upon himself the office of respiration, a troublesome practice, but one which custom has rendered necessary to our easy existence, and for some time he lay gasping on a little flock mattress, rather unequally poised between this world and the next, the balance being decidedly in favour of the latter. Now, if during this brief period Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses, and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman, was rendered rather misty by an unwonted allowance of beer, and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract. Oliver and Nature fought out the point between them. The result was that after a few struggles, Oliver breathed, sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish, by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for a much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. As Oliver gave this first proof of the free and proper action of his lungs, the patchwork coverlet which was carelessly flung over the iron bedstead rustled. The pale face of a young woman was raised feebly from the pillow, and a faint voice imperfectly articulated the words, let me see the child, and die." The surgeon had been sitting with his face turned towards the fire, giving the palms of his hands a warm and a rub alternately. As the young woman spoke, he rose and advanced to the bed's head, said with more kindness than might have been expected of him, "'Oh, you must not talk about dying yet.' "'Law bless her, dear heart, no,' interposed the nurse hastily depositing in her pocket a green glass bottle, the contents of which she had been tasting in a corner with evident satisfaction. "'Law bless her, dear heart, when she has lived as long as I have, sir, and had thirteen children of her own, and all on him dead except two, and them in the workers with me, she'll know better than to take on in that way, bless her dear heart. Think what it is to be a mother, there's a dear young lamb, do.' Apparently this consolatory perspective of a mother's prospects failed in producing its due effect. The patient shook her head, and stretched out her hand towards the child. The surgeon deposited it in her arms. She imprinted her cold white lips passionately on its forehead, passed her hands over her face, 
gazed wildly round, shuddered, fell back, and died. They chafed her breast, hands, and temples, but the blood had stopped for ever. They talked of hope and comfort. They had been strangers too long. "'It's all over, Mrs. Thingamy,' said the surgeon at last. "'Ah, oh, poor dear, so it is,' said the nurse, picking up the cork of the green bottle, which had fallen out on the pillow as she stooped to take up the child. "'Poor dear!' "'You needn't mind sending up to me if the child cries, nurse,' said the surgeon, putting on his gloves with great deliberation. "'It's very likely it will be troublesome. Give it a little gruel, if it is.' He put on his hat, and, pausing by the bedside on his way to the door, added, "'She was a good-looking girl, too. Where did she come from?' "'She was brought here last night replied the old woman, by the overseer's order. She was found lying in the street. She had walked some distance, for her shoes were worn to pieces, but where she came from, or where she was going to, nobody knows." The surgeon leaned over the body, and raised the left hand. "'Ah, the old story,' he said, shaking his head. "'No wedding ring, now see. Ah, good night. The medical gentleman walked away to dinner, and the nurse, having once more applied herself to the green bottle, sat down on a low chair before the fire, and proceeded to dress the infant. What an excellent example of the power of dress young Oliver Twist was! Wrapped in the blanket which had hitherto formed his only covering, he might have been the child of a nobleman, or a beggar. It would have been hard for the haughtiest stranger to have assigned him his proper station in society. But now that he was enveloped in the old calico robes, which had grown yellow in the same service, he was badged and ticketed, and fell into his place at once, a parish child, the orphan of a workhouse, the humble, half-starved drudge, to be cuffed and buffeted through the world, despised by all, and pitied by none. Oliver cried lustily. If he could have known that he was an orphan, left to the tender mercies of church wardens and overseers, perhaps he would have cried the louder. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Two. Treats of Oliver Twist's growth, education, and board. For the next eight or ten months, Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house, who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need. The workhouse authorities replied, with humility, that there was not. Upon this, the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that Oliver should be farmed, or, in other words, that it should be dispatched to a branch workhouse, some three miles off, where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day, without the inconvenience of too much food, or too much clothing, under the parental superintendence of an elderly female, who received the culprits at and for the consideration of sevenpence halfpenny per small head per week. Sevenpence halfpenny's worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for sevenpence halfpenny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. So she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use, and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still, and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher. 
everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher, who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating, and who demonstrated it so well that he had got his own horse down to a straw a day, and would unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal on nothing at all, if he had not died four and twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air. Unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care Oliver Twist was delivered over, a similar result usually attended the operation of her system. For at the very moment when the child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food, it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten, either that it sickened from want and cold, or fell into the fire from neglect, or got half smothered by accident. In any one of which cases, the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world, and there gathered to the fathers it had never known in this. Occasionally, when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead, or inadvertently scalded to death when there happened to be a washing, though the latter accident was very scarce, anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm, the jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions, or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance. But these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beadle, the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside, which was very probable indeed, and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted, which was very self-devotional. Besides, the board made periodical pilgrimages to the farm, and always sent the beadle the day before to say they were going. The children were neat and clean to behold when they went, and what more would the people have? It cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's ninth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature, and decidedly small in circumference. But nature, or inheritance, had implanted a good, sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet of the establishment, and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any ninth birthday at all. Be this as it may, however, it was his ninth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with a select party of two other young gentlemen, who, after participating with him in a sound thrashing, had been locked up for atrociously presuming to be hungry, when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of Mr. Bumble, the beadle, striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate. "'Goodness gracious! Is that you, Mr. Bumble, sir?' said Mrs. Mann, thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy. "'Susan, take Oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash em directly.' "'Oh, my heart alive, Mr. Bumble! How glad I am to see you, surely!' Now, Mr. Bumble was a fat man, and a choleric, so instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit, he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake, and then bestowed upon it a kick, which could have emanated from no leg but a beadle's. "'Law! Only think!' said Mrs. Mann, running out for the three boys had been removed by this time. "'Only think of that! That I should have forgotten that the gate was bolted on the inside on account of them dear children. Walk in, sir, walk in, pray, Mr. Bumble, do, sir!' Although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsy that might have softened the heart of a churchwarden, it by no means mollified the beadle. "'Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Mann," inquired Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane, "'to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate, when they come here upon parochial business with the parochial orphans. Are you aware, Mrs. Mann, that you are, as I may say, a parochial delegate and a stipendiary?' 
Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Pample, that I was only a telling one or two of the dear children, as is so fond of you, that it was you a coming," replied Mrs. Mann, with great humility. Mr. Bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance. He had displayed the one, and vindicated the other. He relaxed. "'Well, well, Mrs. Mann,' he replied in a calmer tone, "'it may be as you say. It may be. Lead away in, Mrs. Mann, for I come on business and have something to say.' Mrs. Mann ushered the beadle into a small parlour with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beadles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. "'Now, don't you be offended at what I'm a-going to say,' observed Mrs. Mann, with captivating sweetness. "'You've had a long walk, you know, or I would mention it. Now, will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble?' "'Not a drop, nor a drop,' said Mr. Bumble, waving his right hand in a dignified but placid manner. "'I think you will,' said Mrs. Mann, who had noticed the tone of the refusal, and the gesture that had accompanied it. "'Just a little drop, with a little cold water, and a lump of sugar?' Mr. Bumble coughed. "'Now, just a little drop,' said Mrs. Mann, persuasively. "'What is it?' inquired the beadle. "'Why, it's what I'm obliged to keep a little of in the house, to put into the blessed infant's daffy, when they ain't well, Mr. Bumble,' replied Mrs. Mann, as she opened a corner cupboard and took down a bottle and glass. "'It's gin. I'll not deceive you, Mr. B. It's gin.' "'Do you give the children daffy, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Bumble following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing. "'Oh, bless em, that I do, dear as it is,' replied the nurse. "'I couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes, you know, sir.' "'No,' said Mr. Bumble approvingly. "'No, you could not. You are a humane woman, Mrs. Mann.' Here she set down the glass. I shall take an early opportunity of mentioning it to the board, Mrs. Mann. He drew it towards him. You feel as a mother, Mrs. Mann. He stirred the gin and water. I, I drink to your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann. And he swallowed half of it. And now, about business, said the beadle, taking out a leathern pocket-book. The child that was half baptized Oliver Twist, is nine year old to-day. "'Bless him!' interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with the corner of her apron. "'And notwithstanding half a reward of ten pounds, which was afterwards increased to twenty pound. Notwithstanding the most superlative, and I may say supernatural, exertions on the part of this parish,' said Bumble. "'We have never been able to discover who is his father, or what was his mother's settlement, name, or condition.' Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added, after a moment's reflection, "'How comes he to have any name at all, then?' The beadle drew himself up with great pride, and said, "'I invented it.' "'You, Mr. Bump! I, Mrs. Mann. We name our fondlings in alphabetical order. The last was a S, Swabble, I named him. This was a T, Twist, I named him. The next one comes will be Unwin, and the next Vilkins. I have got names ready-made to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through it again. 
when we come to Z. "'Why, you're quite a literary character, sir,' said Mrs. Mann. "'Well, well,' said the beadle, evidently gratified with the compliment. "'Perhaps I may be, perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann.' He finished the gin and water, and added, "'Oliver, being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back into the house. I have come out myself to take him there. So, let me see him at once." "'I'll fetch him directly,' said Mrs. Mann, leaving the room for that purpose. Oliver, having had by this time as much of the outer coat of dirt which encrusted his face and hands removed as could be scrubbed off in one washing, was led into the room by his benevolent protectress. "'Make a bow to the gentleman, Oliver,' said Mrs. Mann. Oliver made a bow, which was divided between the beadle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table. "'Will you go along with me, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble, in a majestic voice. Oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness, when, glancing upward, he caught sight of Mrs. Mann, who had got behind the beadle's chair and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance. He took the hint at once, for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body, not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection. "'Will she go with me?' inquired poor Oliver. "'No, she can't,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'But she'll come and see you sometimes.' This was no very great consolation to the child. Young as he was, however, he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away. It was no very difficult matter for the boy to call tears into his eyes. Hunger and recent ill-usage are great assistance if you want to cry. And Oliver cried very naturally indeed. Mrs. Mann gave him a thousand embraces, and what Oliver wanted a great deal more, a piece of bread and butter, lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse. With the slice of bread and butter in his hand, and the little brown-cloth parish cap on his head, Oliver was then led away by Mr. Bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years. And yet he burst into an agony of childish grief, as the cottage gate closed after him. Wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind, they were the only friends he had ever known, and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time. Mr. Bumble walked on with long strides. Little Oliver, firmly grasping his gold-laced cuff, trotted beside him, inquiring at the end of every quarter of a mile whether they were nearly there. To these interrogations Mr. Bumble returned very brief and snappish replies, for the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated, and he was once again a beadle. Oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour, and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread, when Mr. Bumble, who had handed him over to the care of an old woman, returned, and, telling him it was board night, informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith. Not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was, Oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence, and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry. He had no time to think about the matter, however, for Mr. Bumble gave him a tap on the head, with his cane, to wake him up, and another on the back, to make him lively, and bidding him to follow, conducted him into a large, whitewashed room, where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table. At the top of the table, seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest, was a particularly fat gentleman, with a very round red face. "'Bow to the board,' said Bumble. Oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes, and seeing no board but the table, fortunately bowed to that. "'What's your name, boy?' said the gentleman in the high chair. Oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen, which made him tremble and the beadle gave him another tap behind, which made him cry. These two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice, whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool, which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease. "'A boy?' 
said the gentleman in the high chair. "'Listen to me. You know you're an orphan, I suppose?' "'What's that, sir?' inquired poor Oliver. "'The boy is a fool. I thought he was.' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Hush!' said the gentleman who had spoken first. "'You know you have got no father or mother, and that you were brought up by the parish, don't you?' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, weeping bitterly. "'What are you crying for?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat. And to be sure it was very extraordinary. What could the boy be crying for? "'I hope you say your prayers every night.' said another gentleman, in a gruff voice, "'and pray for the people who feed you and take care of you like a Christian.' "'Yes, sir,' stammered the boy. The gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right. It would have been very like a Christian, and a marvellously good Christian, too, if Oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him. But he hadn't, because nobody had taught him. "'Well,' "'You have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade,' said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair. "'So you'll begin to pick oakum to-morrow morning at six o'clock,' added the surly one in the white waistcoat. For the combination of both these blessings in the one simple process of picking oakum, Oliver bowed low by the direction of the beadle, and was then hurried away to a large ward, where, on a rough, hard bed, he sobbed himself to sleep. What a novel illustration of the tender laws of England! They let the paupers go to sleep. Poor Oliver! He little thought, as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him, that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes. But they had. And this was it. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once, what ordinary folks would never have discovered, the poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes, a tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea, and supper all the year round, a brick-and-mortar elysium, where it was all play and no work. Oh! said the board, looking very knowing. "'We are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time.' So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house, or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issued three meals of thin gruel a day, with an onion twice a week, and half a roll of Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations, having reference to the ladies, which it is not necessary to repeat. Kindly undertook to divorce poor married people, in consequence of the great expense of a suit in doctors' commons, and instead of compelling a man to support his family, as they had theretofore done, took his family away from him, and made him a bachelor. There is no saying how many applicants for relief, under these last two heads, might have started up in all classes of society, if it had not been coupled with the workhouse. But the board were long-headed men, and had provided for this difficulty. The relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel, and that frightened people. For the first six months after Oliver Twist was removed, the system was in full operation. It was rather expensive at first, in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill, and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers which fluttered loosely on their wasted, shrunken forms after a week or two's gruel. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers, and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall, with a copper at one end, out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose, and assisted by one or two women, ladled the gruel at meal-times. Of this festive composition, each boy had one porringer, and no more, except on occasions of great public rejoicing, 
when he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides. The bowls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again, and when they had performed this operation, which never took very long, the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls, they would sit staring at the copper, with such eager eyes, as if they could have devoured the very bricks of which it was composed, employing themselves, meanwhile, in sucking their fingers most assiduously, with the view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon. Boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger, that one boy, who was tall for his age, and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had kept a small cook-shop, hinted darkly to his companions, that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. A council was held. Lots were cast, who should walk up to the master after supper that evening, and ask for more. And it fell to Oliver Twist. The evening arrived. The boys took their places. The master, in his cook's uniform, stationed himself at the copper. His pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him. The gruel was served out, and a long grace was said over the short commons. The gruel disappeared. The boys whispered each other, and winked at Oliver while his next neighbours nudged him. Child as he was, he was desperate with hunger, and reckless with misery. He rose from the table, and advancing to the master, basin and spoon in hand, said, somewhat alarmed at his own temerity, "'Please, sir, I want some more.' The master was a fat, healthy man, but he turned very pale. He gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds, and then clung for support to the copper. The assistants were paralysed with wonder, the boys with fear. "'What?' said the master at length, in a faint voice. "'Please, sir,' replied Oliver, "'I want some more.' The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle, pinioned him in his arm, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. The board were sitting in solemn conclave, when Mr. Bumble rushed into the room in great excitement, and addressing the gentleman in the high chair, said, "'Mr. Lemkins, I beg your pardon, sir. Oliver Twist has asked for more.' There was a general start. Horror was depicted on every countenance. "'For more?' said Mr. Lemkins. "'Compose yourself, Bumble, and answer me distinctly.' Do I understand that he asked for more, after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary? He did, sir, replied Bumble. That boy will be hung, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. I know that boy will be hung. Nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion. An animated discussion took place. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate, offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take Oliver Twist off the hands of the parish. In other words, five pounds and Oliver Twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade, business, or calling. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, as he knocked at the gate and read the bill next morning. I never was more convinced of anything in my life than I am that that boy will come to be hung. As I purpose to show in the sequel whether the white waistcoated gentleman was right or not, I should perhaps mar the interest of this narrative, supposing it to possess any at all, if I ventured to hint just yet whether the life of Oliver Twist had this violent termination or no. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens – Chapter 3 – Relates how Oliver Twist 
was very near getting a place which would not have been a sinecure. For a week after the commission of the impious and profane offence of asking for more, Oliver remained a close prisoner in the dark and solitary room to which he had been consigned by the wisdom and mercy of the board. It appears at first sight not unreasonable to suppose that, if he had entertained a becoming feeling of respect for the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat, he would have established that sage individual's prophetic character, once and for ever, by tying one end of his pocket-handkerchief to a hook in the wall, and attaching himself to the other. To the performance of this feat, however, there was one obstacle, namely, that pocket-handkerchiefs, being decided articles of luxury, had been for all future times and ages removed from the noses of paupers by the express order of the board in council assembled, solemnly given and pronounced under their hands and seals. There was a still greater obstacle in Oliver's youth and childishness. He only cried bitterly all day, and, when the long dismal night came on, spread his little hands before his eyes to shut out the darkness, and, crouching in the corner, tried to sleep, ever and anon waking with a start and tremble, and drawing himself closer and closer to the wall, as if to feel even its cold hard surface were a protection in the gloom and loneliness which surrounded him. Let it not be supposed by the enemies of the system that, during the period of his solitary incarceration, Oliver was denied the benefits of exercise, the pleasure of society, or the advantages of religious consolation. As for exercise, it was nice cold weather, and he was allowed to perform his ablutions every morning under the pump, in a stone yard, in the presence of Mr. Bumble, who prevented his catching cold, and caused a tingling sensation to pervade his frame by repeated applications of the cane. As for society, he was carried every other day into the hall where the boys dined, and there sociably flogged as a public warning and example. And so far from being denied the advantages of religious consolation, he was kicked into the same apartment every evening at prayer-time, and there permitted to listen to, and console his mind, with a general supplication of the boys, containing a special clause therein inserted by authority of the board, in which they entreated to be made good virtuous, contented, and obedient, and to be guarded from the sins and vices of Oliver Twist, whom the supplication distinctly set forth to be under the exclusive patronage and protection of the powers of wickedness, and an article direct from the manufactory of the very devil himself. It chanced one morning, while Oliver's affairs were in this auspicious and comfortable state, that Mr. Gamfield, chimney-sweep, went his way down the high street, deeply cogitating in his mind his ways and means of paying certain arrears of rent, for which his landlord had become rather pressing. Mr. Gamfield's most sanguine estimate of his finances could not raise them within full five pounds of the desired amount, and, in a species of arithmetical desperation, he was alternately cudgelling his brains and his donkey, when passing the workhouse his eyes encountered the bill on the gate. Whoa! said Mr. Gamfield to the donkey. The donkey was in a state of profound abstraction, wondering, probably, whether he was destined to be regaled with a cabbage-stalk or two, when he had disposed of the two sacks of suit with which the little cart was laden. So, without noticing the word of command, he jogged onward. Mr. Gamfield growled a fierce imprecation on the donkey generally, but more particularly on his eyes, and, running after him, bestowed a blow on his head which would inevitably have beaten in any skull but a donkey's. Then, catching hold of the bridle, he gave his jaw a sharp wrench, by way of gentle reminder that he was not his own master, and by these means turned him round. He then gave him another blow on the head, just to stun him till he came back again. Having completed these arrangements, he walked up to the gate to read the bill. The gentleman with the white waistcoat was standing at the gate with his hands behind him, after having delivered himself of some profound sentiments in the board-room. Having witnessed the little dispute between Mr. Gamfield and the donkey, he smiled joyously when that person came up to read the bill, for he saw at once that Mr. Gamfield was exactly the sort of master Oliver Twist wanted. Mr. Gamfield smiled, too, as he perused the document, for five pounds was just the sum he had been wishing for, 
and as to the boy with which it was encumbered, Mr. Gamfield, knowing what the dietary of the workhouse was, well knew he would be a nice small pattern, just the very thing for register stoves. So, he spelt the bill through again, from beginning to end, and then, touching his fur cap in token of humility, accosted the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'This here boy, sir, what the parish wants to prentice, said Mr. Gamfield. "'Aye, my man,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, with a condescending smile, "'what of him?' "'If the parish would like him to learn a right pleasant trade in a good, spectable, chimbly-sweeping business,' said Mr. Gamfield, "'I wants a prentice, and I am ready to take him.' "'Walk in,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Mr. Gamfield, having lingered behind to give the donkey another blow on the head, and another wrench of the jaw, as a caution not to run away in his absence, followed the gentleman with the white waistcoat into the room where Oliver had first seen him. "'It's a nasty trade,' said Mr. Limkins, when Gamfield had again stated his wish. "'Young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now,' said another gentleman. "'That's a cause. They damp the straw afore they lit it in the chimbley, to make em come down again,' said Gamfield. "'That's all smoke, and no blaze.' Fear a smoke ain't a no use at all in making a boy come down, for it only sends him to sleep, and that's what he likes. Boys is very obstinate, and very lazy gentlemen, and there's nothing like a good hot blaze to make em come down with a run. It's humane, too, gentlemen, a cause, even if they've stuck in the chimbley, roasting their feet makes em struggle to extricate theirselves. The gentleman in the white waistcoat appeared very much amused by this explanation, but his mirth was speedily checked by a look from Mr. Limkins. The board then proceeded to converse among themselves for a few minutes, but in so low a tone, at the words, saving of expenditure, looked well in the accounts, have a printed report published, were alone audible. These only chanced to be heard, indeed, on account of their being very frequently repeated with great emphasis. At length the whispering ceased, and the members of the board, having resumed their seats and their solemnity, Mr. Limpkins said, "'We have considered your proposition, and we don't approve of it.' "'Not at all,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Decidedly not,' added the other members. As Mr. Gamfield did happen to labour under the slight imputation of having bruised three or four boys to death already, it occurred to him that the board had, perhaps in some unaccountable freak, taken it into their heads that this extraneous circumstance ought to influence their proceedings. It was very unlike their general mode of doing business, if they had, but still, as he had no particular wish to revive the rumour, he twisted his cap in his hands and walked slowly from the table. "'So you won't let me have him, gentlemen,' said Mr. Gamfield, pausing near the door. "'No,' replied Mr. Limpkins. "'At least, as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered.' Mr. Gamfield's countenance brightened, as, with a quick step, he returned to the table and said, "'All you give me, gentlemen, come. "'Don't be too hard on a poor man. What will you give?' "'I should say three pound ten was plenty,' said Mr. Limpkins. Ten shillings too much,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Come,' said Gamfield. "'Say four pound, gentlemen. Say four pound, and you've got rid of him for good and all. There.' Three pound ten, repeated Mr. Limpkins firmly. "'Come, I'll split the difference, gentlemen,' urged Gamfield. Three pound fifteen. "'Not a farthing more,' was the firm reply of Mr. Limpkins. "'You're desperate hard upon me, gentlemen,' said Gamfield, wavering. "'Poo! Poo! Nonsense!' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'He'd be cheap with nothing at all as a premium. Take him, you silly fellow. He's just the boy for you.' 
He wants the stick now and then. It'll do him good. And his board needn't come very expensive, for he hasn't been overfed since he was born. <laughs> Mr. Gamfield gave an arch look at the faces round the table, and, observing a smile on all of them, gradually broke into a smile himself. The bargain was made. Mr. Bumble was at once instructed that Oliver Twist and his indentures were to be conveyed before the magistrate for signature and approval that very afternoon. In pursuance of this determination, little Oliver, to his excessive astonishment, was released from bondage and ordered to put himself into a clean shirt. He had hardly achieved this very unusual gymnastic performance when Mr. Bumble brought him, with his own hands, a basin of gruel and the holiday allowance of two ounces and a quarter of bread. At this tremendous sight, Oliver began to cry very piteously, thinking, not unnaturally, that the board must have determined to kill him for some useful purpose, or they never would have begun to fatten him up in that way. "'Don't make your eyes red, Oliver, but eat your food and be thankful,' said Mr. Bumble, in a tone of impressive pomposity. "'You're a-going to be made apprentice of, Oliver.' "'Apprentice, sir?' said the child, trembling. "'Yes, Oliver,' said Mr. Bumble. "'The kind and blessed gentleman, which is so many parents to you, Oliver, when you have none of your own, or I go to apprentice you, and to set you up in life, and make a man of you, although the expense to the parish is three pound ten. Three pound ten, Oliver! Seventy shillings! One hundred and forty sixpences! and all for a naughty orphan, which nobody can't love." As Mr. Bumble paused to take breath, after delivering this address in an awful voice, the tears rolled down the poor child's face, and he sobbed bitterly. "'Come,' said Mr. Bumble, somewhat less pompously, for it was gratifying to his feelings to observe the effect his eloquence had produced. "'Come, Oliver, wipe your eyes with the cuffs of your jacket, and don't cry into your gruel. That's a very foolish action, Oliver. It certainly was, for there was quite enough water in it already. On their way to the magistrate, Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver that all he would have to do would be to look very happy, and say, when the gentleman asked him if he wanted to be apprenticed, that he should like it very much indeed. Both of which injunctions Oliver promised to obey. The rather as Mr. Bumble threw in a gentle hint, that if he failed in either particular, there was no telling what would be done to him. When they arrived at the office, he was shut up in a little room by himself, and admonished by Mr. Bumble to stay there until he came back to fetch him. There the boy remained, with a palpitating heart, for half an hour, at the expiration of which time Mr. Bumble thrust in his head, unadorned with a cocked hat, and said aloud, "'Now, Oliver, my dear, come to the gentleman.' As Mr. Bumble said this, he put on a grim and threatening look, and added in a low voice, "'Mind what I told you, you young rascal!' Oliver stared innocently in Mr. Bumble's face at this somewhat contradictory style of address. But that gentleman prevented his offering any remark thereupon, by leading him at once into an adjoining room, the door of which was open. It was a large room, with a great window. Behind a desk sat two old gentlemen with powdered heads, one of whom was reading the newspaper, while the other was perusing, with the aid of a pair of tortoise-shell spectacles, a small piece of parchment which lay before him. Mr. Limpkins was standing in front of the desk on one side, and Mr. Gamfield, with a partially washed face, on the other, while two or three bluff-looking men in top-boots were lounging about. The old gentleman with the spectacles gradually dozed off over the little bit of parchment, and there was a short pause, after Oliver had been stationed by Mr. Bumble in front of the desk. "'This is the boy, your worship,' said Mr. Bumble. The old gentleman, who was reading the newspaper, raised his head for a moment, and pulled the other old gentleman by the sleeve, whereupon the last-mentioned old gentleman woke up. "'Oh! Is this the boy?' said the old gentleman. "'This is him, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Bow to the magistrate, my dear.' Oliver roused himself, and made his best obeisance. He had been wondering 
with his eyes fixed on the magistrate's powder, whether all boards were born with that white stuff on their heads, and were boards from thenceforth on that account. "'Well,' said the old gentleman, "'I suppose he's fond of chimney-sweeping?' "'He dotes on it, your worship,' replied Bumble, giving Oliver a sly pinch to intimate that he'd better not say he didn't. "'And he will be a sweep, will he?' inquired the old gentleman. "'If we was to bind him to any other trade to-morrow, he'd run away simultaneous, your worship,' replied Bumble. "'And this man that's to be his master, you, sir, you'll treat him well, and feed him, and do all that uh, sort of thing, will you?' said the old gentleman. "'When I says I will, I means I will,' replied Mr. Gamfield doggedly. "'You're a rough speaker, my friend, but uh, you look an honest, uh, open-hearted man,' said the old gentleman, turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate for Oliver's premium, whose villainous countenance was a regular stamped receipt for cruelty. But the magistrate was half blind, and half childish, so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did. "'I hope I am, sir,' said Mr. Camfield, with an ugly leer. "'I have no doubt you are, my friend,' replied the old gentleman, fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose, and looking about him for the inkstand. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was, he would have dipped his pen into it, and signed the indentures, and Oliver would have been straightway hurried off. But, as it chanced to be immediately under his nose, it followed, as a matter of course, that he looked all over his desk for it, without finding it, and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him, his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who, despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of Bumble, was regarding the repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear, too palpable to be mistaken, even by a half-blind magistrate. The old gentleman stopped, laid down his pen, and looked from Oliver to Mr. Limpkins, who attempted to take snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, "'you look pale and alarmed. What is the matter?' "'Stand a little away from him, Beadle,' said the other magistrate, laying aside the paper, and leaning forward with an expression of interest. "'Now, boy, tell us what's the matter. Don't be afraid.' Oliver fell on his knees and clasping his hands together, prayed that they would order him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. "'Well,' said Mr. Bumble, raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemnity, "'well, of all the artful and designing orphans that ever I see, Oliver, you are one of the most barefacedest. "'Hold your tongue, Beadle,' said the second old gentleman, when Mr. Bumble had given vent to this compound adjective. "'I beg your worship's pardon,' said Mr. Bumble, incredulous of having heard aright. "'Did your worship speak to me?' "'Yes. Hold your tongue.' Mr. Bumble was stupefied with astonishment. "'A Beadle ordered to hold his tongue? A moral revolution!' The old gentleman, in the tortoiseshell spectacles, looked at his companion. He nodded significantly. "'We refuse to sanction these indentures,' said the old gentleman, tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke. "'I hope,' stammered Mr. Limpkins, "'I hope that magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unsupported testimony of a child.' "'The magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion on the matter,' said the second old gentleman sharply. "'Take the boy back to the workhouse, and treat him kindly. He seems to want it.' 
That same evening, the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed, not only that Oliver would be hung, but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain. Mr. Bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery, and said he wished he might come to good, whereupon Mr. Gamfield replied that he wished he might come to him, which, although he agreed with the beadle in most matters, would seem to be a wish of a totally opposite description. The next morning the public were once more informed that Oliver Twist was again to let, and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him. End of chapter 3「Four of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Four. Oliver, being offered another place, makes his first entry into public life. In great families, when an advantageous place cannot be obtained, either in possession, reversion, remainder, or expectancy, for the young man who is growing up, it is a very general custom to send him to sea. The board, in imitation of so wise and salutary an example, took counsel together on the expediency of shipping off Oliver Twist, in some small trading vessel bound to a good unhealthy port. This suggested itself as the very best thing that could possibly be done with him the probability being that the skipper would flog him to death, in a playful mood, some day after dinner, or would knock his brains out with an iron bar, both pastimes being, as is pretty generally known, very favourite and common recreations among gentlemen of that class. The more the case presented itself to the board, in this point of view, the more manifold the advantages of the step appeared. So they came to the conclusion that the only way of providing for Oliver effectually were to send him to sea without delay. Mr. Bumble had been dispatched to make various preliminary inquiries, with the view of finding out some captain or other who wanted a cabin boy without any friends, and was returning to the workhouse to communicate the result of his mission, when he encountered at the gate no less a person than Mr. Sowerberry, the parochial undertaker. Mr. Sowerberry was a tall, gaunt, large-jointed man, attired in a suit of threadbare black, with darned cotton stockings of the same colour, and shoes to answer. His features were not naturally intended to wear a smiling aspect, but he was in general rather given to professional jocosity. His step was elastic, and his face betokened inward pleasantry, as he advanced to Mr. Bumble, and shook him cordially by the hand. "'I have taken the measure of the two women that died last night, Mr. Bumble.' said the undertaker. "'You make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry,' said the beadle, as he thrust his thumb and forefinger into the proffered snuff-box of the undertaker, which was an ingenious little model of a patent coffin. "'I say, you make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry,' repeated Mr. Bumble, tapping the undertaker on the shoulder in a friendly manner with his cane. "'Think so?' said the undertaker, in a tone which half admitted and half disputed the probability of the event. "'The price is allowed by the board are very small, Mr. Bumble.' "'So are the coffins,' replied the beadle, with precisely as near an approach to a laugh as a great official ought to indulge in. Mr. Sowerberry was much tickled at this, as of course he ought to be, and laughed a long time without cessation. "'Well, well, Mr. Bumble,' he said at length, "'there's no denying that since the new system of feeding has come in, the coffins are something narrower and more shallow than they used to be, but we must have some profit, Mr. Bumble. Well-seasoned timber is an expensive article, sir, and all the iron handles come by canal from Birmingham.' "'Well, well,' said Mr. Bumble. Every trade has its drawbacks. A fair profit is, of course, allowable. Of course, of course, replied the undertaker. And if I don't get a profit upon this or that particular article, why, I make it up in the long run. 
you see. <laughs> Just so, said Mr. Bumble. Though I must say, continued the undertaker, resuming the current of observations which the beadle had interrupted, though I must say, Mr. Bumble, that I have to contend against one very great disadvantage, which is that all the stout people go off the quickest. The people who have been better off, and have paid rates for many years, are the first to sink when they come into the house, and let me tell you, Mr. Bumble, that three or four inches over one's calculation makes a great hole in one's profits, especially when one has a family to provide for, sir." As Mr. Sowerbury said this, with the becoming indignation of an ill-used man, and as Mr. Bumble felt that it rather tended to convey a reflection on the honour of the parish, the latter gentleman thought it advisable to change the subject. Oliver Twist being uppermost in his mind, he made him his theme. "'By the by,' said Mr. Bumble, "'you don't know anybody who wants a boy, do you? A parochial prentice, who is at present a dead weight, a millstone, as I may say, round the parochial throat. Liberal terms, Mr. Sowerberry, liberal terms. As Mr. Bumble spoke, he raised his cane to the bill above him, and gave three distinct raps upon the words, Five Pounds, which were printed thereon in Roman capitals of gigantic size. Gods, oh! said the undertaker, taking Mr. Bumble by the gilt-edged lapel of his official coat, that's just the very thing I wanted to speak to you about. You know, dear me, what a very elegant button this is, Mr. Bumble. I never noticed it before. Yes, I think it rather pretty, said the beadle, glancing proudly downwards at the large brass buttons which embellished his coat. The die is the same as the parochial seal, a good Samaritan healing the sick and bruised man. The board presented it to me on New Year's morning, Mr. Sowerberry. I put it on, I remember, for the first time, to attend the inquest on that reduced tradesman who died in a doorway at midnight." "'I recollect,' said the undertaker, "'the jury brought it in, died from exposure to the cold and want of the common necessaries of life, didn't they?' Mr. Bumble nodded. "'And they made it a special verdict, I think,' said the undertaker, "'by adding some words to the effect that if the relieving officer had—' "'Tush! Foolery!' interposed the beadle. "'If the board attended to all the nonsense that ignorant jurymen talk, they'd have enough to do.' "'Very true,' said the undertaker. "'They would, indeed.' "'Juries,' said Mr. Bumble grasping his cane tightly, as was his wont when working into a passion. Juries! He's ineducated, vulgar, grovelling wretches!" "'So they are,' said the undertaker. "'They haven't no more philosophy nor political economy about them than that,' said the beadle, snapping his fingers contemptuously. "'No more they have,' acquiesced the undertaker. "'I despise them said the beadle, growing very red in the face. "'So do I,' rejoined the undertaker. "'And I only wish we'd a jury of the independent sort in the house for a week or two, said the beadle. "'The rules and regulations of the board would soon bring their spirit down for him. "'Let them alone for that,' replied the undertaker. So saying, he smiled approvingly, to calm the rising wrath of the indignant parish officer. Mr. Bumble lifted off his cocked hat, took a handkerchief from the inside of the crown, wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his rage had engendered, fixed the cocked hat on again, and, turning to the undertaker, said in a calmer voice, "'Well, what about the boy?' "'Oh,' replied the undertaker, "'why, you know, Mr. Bumble, I pay a good deal towards the poor's rates.' Ahem, <clears throat> said Mr. Bumble. Well? Well, replied the undertaker, I was thinking that if I pay so much towards him, I've a right to get as much out of him as I can, Mr. Bumble, and so I think I'll take the boy myself. 
Mr. Bumble grasped the undertaker by the arm, and led him into the building. Mr. Sowerberry was closeted with the board for five minutes, and it was arranged that Oliver should go to him that evening, upon liking, a phrase which means in the case of a parish apprentice, that if the master find, upon a short trial, that he can get enough work out of a boy without putting too much food into him, he shall have him for a term of years to do what he likes with. When little Oliver was taken before the gentleman that evening, and informed that he was to go that night as general house lad to a coffin maker's, and that if he complained of his situation, or ever came back to the parish again, he would be sent to sea, there to be drowned or knocked on the head, as the case might be. He evinced so little emotion that they by common consent pronounced him a hardened young rascal, and ordered Mr. Bumble to remove him forthwith. Now, although it was very natural that the board, of all people in the world, should feel in a great state of virtuous astonishment and horror at the smallest tokens of want of feeling on the part of anybody, they were rather out, in this particular instance. The simple fact was that Oliver, instead of possessing too little feeling, possessed rather too much and was in a fair way of being reduced for life to a state of brutal stupidity and sullenness by the ill-usage he had received. He heard the news of his destination in perfect silence, and having had his luggage put into his hand, which was not very difficult to carry, inasmuch as it was all comprised within the limits of a brown paper parcel, about half a foot square by three inches deep, he pulled his cap over his eyes, and once more attaching himself to Mr. Bumble's coat-cuff, was led away by that dignitary to a new scene of suffering. For some time Mr. Bumble drew Oliver along, without notice or remark, for the beadle carried his head very erect, as a beadle always should, and, it being a windy day, little Oliver was completely enshrouded by the skirts of Mr. Bumble's coat as they blew open, and disclosed to great advantage his flapped waistcoat and drab plush knee-breeches. As they drew near to their destination, however, Mr. Bumble thought it expedient to look down, and see that the boy was in good order for inspection by his new master, which he accordingly did, with a fit and becoming air of gracious patronage. "'Oliver,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, in a low, tremulous voice. "'Pull that cap off your eyes, and hold up your head, sir.' although Oliver did as he was desired at once, and passed the back of his unoccupied hand briskly across his eyes, he left a tear in them when they looked up at his conductor. As Mr. Bumble gazed sternly upon him, it rolled down his cheek. It was followed by another, and another. The child made a strong effort, but it was an unsuccessful one. Withdrawing his other hand from Mr. Bumble's, he covered his face with both, and wept until the tears sprung out from between his chin and bony fingers. "'Well!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, stopping short, and darting at his little charge a look of intense malignity. "'Well! Of all the ungratefulest and worst-disposed boys as ever I see, Oliver, you are the—' "'No, no, sir!' sobbed Oliver, clinging to the hand which held the well-known cane. "'No! "'No, sir. I will be good indeed. Indeed, indeed, I will, sir. I am a very little boy, sir, and it is so—so—' so. "'So what?' inquired Mr. Bumble in amazement. "'So lonely, sir. So very lonely,' cried the child. "'Everybody hates me. Oh, sir, don't—don't don't pray be cross to me." The child beat his hand upon his heart, and looked in his companion's face with tears of real agony. Mr. Bumble regarded Oliver's piteous and helpless look, with some astonishment, for a few seconds, hemmed three or four times in a husky manner, and after muttering something about that troublesome cough, bade Oliver dry his eyes and be a good boy, and once more, taking his hand, he walked on with him in silence. The undertaker, who had just put up the shutters of his shop, was making some entries in his day-book by the light of a most appropriate dismal candle, when Mr. Bumble entered. "'Ah-ha!' said the undertaker, looking up from the book, 
and pausing in the middle of a word. "'Is that you, Bumble?' "'No one else, Mr. Sowerberry,' replied the beadle. "'Here, I brought the boy.' Oliver made a bow. "'Oh, that's the boy, is it?' said the undertaker, raising the candle above his head to get a better view of Oliver. "'Mrs. Sowerberry, will you have the goodness to come here a moment, my dear?' Mrs. Sowerberry emerged from a little room behind the shop, and presented the form of a short, then squeezed-up woman, with vixenish countenance. "'My dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry, deferentially, "'this is the boy from the workhouse that I told you of.' Oliver bowed again. "'Dear me,' said the undertaker's wife, "'he's very small.' "'Why, he is uh, rather small.' replied Mr. Bumble, looking at Oliver, as if it were his fault that he was no bigger. "'He is small. There's no denying it. But he'll grow, Mrs. Arbery. He'll grow.' "'Ah! I dare say he will,' replied the lady pettishly, "'on our victuals and our drink. I see no saving in parish children, not I, for they always cost more to keep than they're worth. However, men always think they know best. There. Get downstairs, little bag of bones. With this, the undertaker's wife opened a side door, and pushed Oliver down a steep flight of stairs into a stone cell, damp and dark, forming the ante-room to the coal cellar, and denominated kitchen, wherein sat a slatternly girl, in shoes down at heel, and blue worsted stockings very much out of repair. "'Here, Charlotte,' said Mr. Sowerberry, who had followed Oliver down, "'Give this boy some of the cold bits that were put by for Trip. "'He hasn't come home since the morning, so he may go out without him. "'I dare say the boy isn't too dainty to eat him, are you, boy?' "'Oliver, whose eyes had glistened at the mention of meat, "'and who was trembling with eagerness to devour it, "'replied in the negative, "'and a plateful of coarse, broken victuals was set before him. "'I wish some well-fed philosopher whose meat and drink turn to gall within him, whose blood is ice, whose heart is iron, could have seen Oliver twist, clutching at the dainty viands that the dog had neglected. I wish he could have witnessed the horrible avidity with which Oliver tore the bits asunder with all the ferocity of famine. There is only one thing I should like better, and that would be to see the philosopher making the same sort of meal himself with the same relish. "'Well,' said the undertaker's wife, when Oliver had finished his supper, which she had regarded in silent horror, and with fearful auguries of his future appetite, "'Have you done?' There being nothing eatable within his reach, Oliver replied in the affirmative. "'Then come with me,' said Mrs. Sowerberry, taking up a dim and dirty lamp, and leading the way upstairs. "'Your bed's under the counter. You don't mind slipping among the coffins, I suppose?' "'but it doesn't much matter whether you do or don't, "'for you can't sleep anywhere else. "'Come, don't keep me here all night.' "'Oliver lingered no longer, "'but meekly followed his new mistress. "'End of chapter 4' "'Chapter 5 of Oliver Twist "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 5 Oliver mingles with new associates. Going to a funeral for the first time, he forms an unfavourable notion of his master's business. Oliver, being left to himself in the undertaker's shop, set the lamp down on a workman's bench, and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread, which many people a good deal older than he will be at no loss to understand an unfinished coffin on black trestles, which stood in the middle of the shop, looked so gloomy and death-like, that a cold tremble came over him, every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object, from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror. Against the wall were ranged, in regular array, a long row of elm boards cut in the same shape looking in the dim light like high-shouldered ghosts, with their hands in their breeches' pockets, 
coffin-plates, elm-chips, bright-headed nails, and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor, and the wall behind the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloths, on duty at a large private door, with a hearse drawn by four black steeds approaching in the distance. The shop was close and hot. The atmosphere seemed tainted with the smell of coffins. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. Nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed Oliver. He was alone in a strange place, and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation. The boy had no friends to care for, or to care for him. The regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind. The absence of no loved and well-remembered face sank heavily into his heart. But his heart was heavy notwithstanding, and he wished, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin, and that he could be lain in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground, with the tall grass waving gently above his head, and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep. Oliver was awakened in the morning by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door which, before he could huddle on his clothes, was repeated in an angry and impetuous manner about twenty-five times. When he began to undo the chain, the legs desisted, and a voice began. "'Open the door, will you?' cried the voice, which belonged to the legs which had kicked at the door. "'I will, directly, sir,' replied Oliver, undoing the chain and turning the key. "'I suppose you're the new boy, ain't you?' said the voice through the keyhole. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. "'How old are you?' inquired the voice. Ten, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Then I'll whop you when I get in,' said the voice. "'You just see if I don't. That's all my workers, brat.' And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable just recorded bears reference, to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge most honourably. He drew back the bolts with a trembling hand, and opened the door. For a second or two, Oliver glanced up the street, and down the street, and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown, who had addressed him through the keyhole, had walked a few paces off to warm himself, for nobody did he see but a big charity boy sitting on a post in front of the house eating a slice of bread and butter, which he cut into wedges the size of his mouth with a clasp knife, and then consumed with great dexterity. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Oliver at length, seeing that no other visitor made his appearance. "'Did you knock?' "'I kicked,' replied the charity boy. "'Did you want a coffin, sir?' inquired Oliver innocently. At this, the charity boy looked monstrous fierce, and said that Oliver would want one before long if he cut jokes with his superiors in that way. "'You don't know who I am, I suppose, workers,' said the charity boy, in continuation, descending from the top of the post, meanwhile, with edifying gravity. "'No, sir,' rejoined Oliver. "'I'm Mr. Noah Claypole,' said the charity boy, "'and you're under me. Take down the shutters, your idle young ruffian.' With this, Mr. Claypole administered a kick to Oliver, and entered the shop with a dignified air, which did him great credit. It is difficult for a large-headed, small-eyed youth of lumbering make and heavy countenance to look dignified under any circumstances, but it is more especially so when superadded to these personal attractions are a red nose and yellow smalls. Oliver, having taken down the shutters, and broken a pane of glass in his effort to stagger away beneath the weight of the first one, to a small court at the side of the house, in which they were kept during the day, was graciously assisted by Noah, who, having consoled him with the assurance that he'd catch it, condescended to help him. Mr. Sowerberry came down soon after. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Sowerberry appeared. Oliver, having caught it, in fulfilment of Noah's prediction, followed that young gentleman down the stairs to breakfast. "'Come near the fire, Noah,' said Charlotte. 
I saved a nice little bit of bacon for you from Master's breakfast. Oliver, shut that door at Mr. Noah's back, and take them bits that I put out on the cover of the bread-pan. Here's your tea. Take it away to that box, and drink it there, and make haste, for they want you to mind the shop. Do you hear? Dear workers, said Noah Claypole. Lor, Noah, said Charlotte, what a rum creature you are. Why don't you let the boy alone? Let him alone, said Noah. Why, everybody lets him alone enough for the matter of that. Neither his father nor his mother will ever interfere with him. All his relations let him have his own way pretty well, eh, Charlotte? <laughs> oh, you queer soul, said Charlotte, bursting into a hearty laugh in which she was joined by Noah, after which they both looked scornfully at poor Oliver Twist, as he sat shivering on the box in the coldest corner of the room, and ate the stale pieces which had been specially reserved for him. Noah was a charity boy, but not a workhouse orphan. No chance child was he, for he could trace his genealogy all the way back to his parents, who lived hard by. His mother being a washerwoman, and his father a drunken soldier, discharged with the wooden leg, and a diurnal pension of twopence halfpenny and an unstateable fraction. The shop-boys in the neighbourhood had long been in the habit of branding Noah in the public streets, with the ignominious epithets of leathers, charity, and the like, and Noah had borne them without reply. But, now that fortune had cast in his way a nameless orphan, at whom even the meanest could point the finger of scorn, he retorted on him with interest. This affords charming food for contemplation. It shows us what a beautiful thing human nature may be made to be, and how impartially the same amiable qualities are developed in the finest lord and the dirtiest charity boy. Oliver had been sojourning at the undertaker's some three weeks or a month. Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, the shop being shut up, were taking their supper in the little back parlour, when Mr. Sowerberry, after several deferential glances at his wife, said, "'My dear,' he was going to say more, but Mrs. Sowerberry, looking up with a peculiarly unpropitious aspect, he stopped short. "'Well?' said Mrs. Sowerberry sharply. "'Nothing, uh, my dear, nothing,' said Mr. Sowerberry. Oh, "'You brute!' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Not at all, my dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry humbly. "'I thought you didn't want to hear, my dear. I was only going to say—' "'Oh, don't tell me what you were going to say,' interposed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'I'm nobody. Don't consult me, pray. I don't want to intrude upon your secrets.' As Mrs. Sowerberry said this, she gave an hysterical laugh, which threatened violent consequences. "'But, my dear,' said Sowerberry, "'I want to ask your advice.' "'No, no! Oh, don't ask mine!' replied Mrs. Sowerberry in an affecting manner. "'Ask somebody else's!' Here there was another hysterical laugh, which frightened Mr. Sowerberry very much. This is a very common and much approved matrimonial course of treatment, which is often very effective. It at once reduced Mr. Sowerberry to begging, as a special favour, to be allowed to say what Mrs. Sowerberry was most curious to hear. After short duration, the permission was most graciously conceded. "'It's only about young Twist, my dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry. "'A very good-looking boy, that, my dear.' "'He need be, for he eats enough,' observed the lady. "'There's an expression of melancholy in his face, my dear,' resumed Mr. Sowerberry, "'which is very interesting. He would make a delightful mute, my love.' Mrs. Sowerberry, looked up with an expression of considerable wonderment. Mr. Sowerberry remarked it, and, without allowing time for any observation on the good lady's part, proceeded. "'I don't mean a regular mute to attend grown-up people, my dear, but only for children's practice. It would be very new to have a mute in proportion, my dear. You may depend upon it. It would have a superb effect.' Mrs. Sowerberry, who had a good deal of taste in the undertaking way, was much struck by the novelty of this idea, 
but as it would have been compromising her dignity to have said so, under existing circumstances, she merely inquired, with much sharpness, why such an obvious suggestion had not presented itself to her husband's mind before. Mr. Sowerberry rightly construed this as an acquiescence in his proposition. It was speedily determined, therefore, that Oliver should be at once initiated into the mysteries of the trade, and, with this view, that he should accompany his master on the very next occasion of his services being required. The occasion was not long in coming. Half an hour after breakfast next morning, Mr. Bumble entered the shop, and, supporting his cane against the counter, drew forth his large leathern pocket-book, from which he selected a small scrap of paper, which he handed over to Sowerberry. "'Aha!' said the undertaker, glancing over it with a lively countenance. "'An order for a coffin, eh?' "'For a coffin first, and a parochial funeral afterwards,' replied Mr. Bumble, fastening the strap of the leathern pocket-book, which, like himself, was very corpulent. "'Baton!' said the undertaker, looking from the scrap of paper to Mr. Bumble. "'I never heard the name before.' Bumble shook his head as he replied, "'Obstinate people, Mr. Sowerberry, very obstinate. Proud, too, I'm afraid, sir.' "'Proud, eh?' exclaimed Mr. Sowerberry, with a sneer. "'Come, that's too much.' "'Oh, it's sickening,' replied the beadle. "'Antimonial, Mr. Sowerberry.' "'So it is,' acquiesced the undertaker. "'We only heard of the family the night before last,' said the beadle, "'and we shouldn't have known anything about them. Then, only a woman who lodges in the same house made an application to the parochial committee for them to send the parochial surgeon to see a woman as was very bad. He had gone out to dinner, but his prentice, which is a very clever lad, sent them some medicine in a blacking-bottle, off-hand. "'Ah, oh, there's promptness,' said the undertaker. "'Promptness, indeed,' replied the beadle. "'But what's the consequence? What's the ungrateful behaviour of these rebels, sir? Why, the husband sends back word that the medicine won't suit his wife's complaint, and so she shan't take it. Says she shan't take it, sir. Good, strong, wholesome medicine, as was given with great success to two Irish labourers and a coal heaver, only a week before. Sent them for nothing, with a blackened bottle in, and he sent back word that she shan't take it, sir. As the atrocity presented itself to Mr. Bumble's mind in full force, he struck the counter sharply with his cane, and became flushed with indignation. "'Well,' said the undertaker, "'I never did.' "'Never did, sir,' ejaculated the beadle. "'No, nor nobody never did. But now she's dead. We've got a barrier, and that's the direction, and the sooner it's done, the better.' Thus saying, Mr. Bumble put on his cocked hat, wrong side first, in a fever of parochial excitement, and flounced out of the shop. "'Why, he was so angry, Oliver, that he forgot even to ask after you,' said Mr. Sowerberry, looking after the beadle as he strode down the street. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, who had carefully kept himself out of sight during the interview and who was shaking from head to foot at the mere recollection of the sound of Mr. Bumble's voice. He needn't have taken the trouble to shrink from Mr. Bumble's glance, however, for that functionary, on whom the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat had made a very strong impression, thought that now the undertaker had got Oliver upon trial, the subject was better avoided, until such time as he should be firmly bound for seven years, and all danger of his being returned upon the hands of the parish should be thus effectually and legally overcome. "'Well,' said Mr. Sowerberry, taking up his hat, "'the sooner this job is done, the better. Noah, look after the shop. Oliver, put on your cap and come with me.' Oliver obeyed, and followed his master on his professional mission. They walked on for some time, through the most crowded and densely inhabited part of the town, and then, striking down a narrow street more dirty and miserable than any they had passed through, paused to look for the house which was the object of their search. 
The houses on either side were high and large, but very old, and tenanted by people of the poorest class, as their neglected appearance would have sufficiently denoted, without the concurrent testimony afforded by the squalid looks of the few men and women, who, with folded arms and bodies half-doubled, occasionally skulked along. A great many of the tenements had shop-fronts, but these were fast closed, and mouldering away, only the upper rooms being inhabited. Some houses, which had become insecure from age and decay, were prevented from falling into the street by huge beams of wood reared against the walls, and firmly planted in the road. But even these crazy dens seemed to have been selected as the nightly haunts of some houseless wretches, for many of the rough boards which supplied the place of door and window were wrenched from their positions, to afford an aperture wide enough for the passage of a human body. The kennel was stagnant and filthy. The very rats, which here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness, were hideous with famine. There was neither knocker nor bell-handle at the open door, where Oliver and his master stopped. So, groping his way cautiously through the dark passage, and bidding Oliver keep close to him and not to be afraid, the undertaker mounted to the top of the first flight of stairs. Stumbling against a door on the landing, he rapped at it with his knuckles. It was opened by a young girl of thirteen or fourteen. The undertaker at once saw enough of what the room contained, to know it was the apartment to which he had been directed. He stepped in. Oliver followed him. There was no fire in the room, but a man was crouching mechanically over the empty stove. An old woman, too, had drawn a low stool to the cold hearth, and was sitting beside him. There were some ragged children in another corner, and in a small recess opposite the door there lay upon the ground something covered with an old blanket. Oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes toward the place, and crept involuntarily closer to his master, for though it was covered up, the boy felt that it was a corpse. The man's face was thin and very pale, his hair and beard were grisly, his eyes were bloodshot. The old woman's face was wrinkled, her two remaining teeth protruded over her underlip, and her eyes were bright and piercing. Oliver was afraid to look at either her or the man. They seemed so like the rats he had seen outside. "'Nobody shall go near her,' said the man, starting fiercely up, as the undertaker approached the recess. "'Keep back! Damn you! Keep back, if you've a life to lose!' "'Nonsense, my good man,' said the undertaker, who was pretty well used to misery in all its shapes. "'Nonsense! I tell you,' said the man, clenching his hands and stamping furiously on the floor, "'I tell you, I won't have her put into the ground. She couldn't rest there. The worms would worry her, and not eat her. She's so worn away.' The undertaker offered no reply to this raving, but producing a tape from his pocket, knelt down for a moment by the side of the body. "'Ah!' Oh, said the man, bursting into tears and sinking on his knees at the feet of the dead woman. "'Kneel down! Kneel down! Kneel round her, every one of you! And mark my words, I say she was starved to death! I never knew how bad she was, till the fever came upon her, and then her bones were starting through the skin. There was neither fire nor candle. She died in the dark, in the dark!' She couldn't even see her children's faces, though we heard her gasping out their names. I begged for her in the streets. They sent me to prison. When I came back, she was dying, and all the blood in my heart has dried up, for they starved her to death. I swear it before the God that saw it. They starved her. He twined his hands in his hair and, with a loud scream, rolled grovelling upon the floor, his eyes fixed, and the foam covering his lips. The terrified children cried bitterly. But the old woman, who had hitherto remained as quiet as if she had been wholly deaf to all that passed, menaced them into silence. Having unloosened the cravat of the man who still remained extended on the ground, she tottered towards the undertaker. "'She was my daughter,' said the old woman, nodding her head in the direction of the corpse, and speaking with an idiotic leer, more ghastly than even the presence of death in such a place. 
Lord, Lord, well, it is strange that I, who gave birth to her, and was a woman then, should be alive and merry now, <laughs> and she lying there, so cold and stiff. Lord, Lord, to think of it, it's as good as a play, as good as a play. As the wretched creature mumbled and chuckled in her hideous merriment, the undertaker turned to go away. Stop! Stop! said the old woman in a loud whisper. Will she be buried to-morrow, or next day, or to-night? I laid her out, and I must walk, you know. Send me a large cloak, a good warm one, for it is bitter cold. We should have cake and wine, too, before we go. Never mind. Send some bread, only a loaf of bread and a cup of water. Shall we have some bread, dear? She said eagerly, catching at the undertaker's coat as he once more moved towards the door. Yes, yes, said the undertaker. Of course. Anything you like. He disengaged himself from the old woman's grasp, and, drawing Oliver after him, hurried away. The next day, the family having been meanwhile relieved with a half-quartern loaf and a piece of cheese left with them by Mr. Bumble himself, Oliver and his master returned to the miserable abode, where Mr. Bumble had already arrived, accompanied by four men from the workhouse, who were to act as bearers. An old black cloak had been thrown over the rags of the old woman and the man and the bare coffin, having been screwed down, was hoisted on the shoulders of the bearers, and carried into the street. "'Now you must put your best leg foremost, old lady,' whispered Sowerberry in the old woman's ear. "'We're rather late, and it won't do to keep the clergyman waiting. Move on, my men, as quick as you like.' Thus directed, the bearers trotted on under their light burden and the two mourners kept as near them as they could. Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry walked at a good smart pace in front, and Oliver, whose legs were not so long as his master's, ran by the side. There was not so great a necessity for hurrying, as Mr. Sowerberry had anticipated, however, for when they reached the obscure corner of the churchyard in which the nettles grew, and where the parish graves were made, the clergyman had not arrived, and the clerk, who was sitting by the vestry-room fire, seemed to think it by no means improbable that it might be an hour or so before he came. So they put the beer on the brink of the grave, and the two mourners waited patiently in the damp clay, with the cold rain drizzling down, while the ragged boys whom the spectacle had attracted into the churchyard played a noisy game at hide-and-seek among the tombstones, or varied their amusements by jumping backwards and forwards over the coffin. Mr. Sowerberry and Mr. Bumble, being personal friends of the clerk, sat by the fire with him, and read the paper. At length, after a lapse of something more than an hour, Mr. Bumble, and Sowerberry, and the clerk were seen running towards the grave. Immediately afterwards, the clergyman appeared, putting on his surplice as he came along. Mr. Bumble then thrashed a boy or two, to keep up appearances, and the reverend gentleman, having read as much of the burial service as could be compressed into four minutes, gave a surplus to the clerk, and walked away again. "'Now, Bill,' said Sowerberry to the grave-digger, "'fill up.' It was no very difficult task, for the grave was so full that the uppermost coffin was within a few feet of the surface. The grave-digger shovelled in the earth, stamped it loosely down with his feet, shouldered his spade, and walked off, followed by the boys, who murmured very loud complaints at the fun being over so soon. "'Come, my good fellow,' said Bumble, tapping the man on the back. "'They want to shut up the yard.' The man, who had never once moved, since he had taken his station by the graveside, started, raised his head, stared at the person who had addressed him, walked forward for a few paces, and fell down in a swoon. The crazy old woman was too much occupied in bewailing the loss of her cloak, which the undertaker had taken off, to pay him any attention so they threw a can of cold water over him, 
and when he came to, saw him safely out of the churchyard, locked the gate, and departed on their different ways. "'Well, Oliver,' said Sowerberry, as they walked home, "'how do you like it?' "'Pretty well, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver, with considerable hesitation. "'Not very much, sir.' "'Ah, you'll get used to it in time, Oliver,' said Sowerberry. "'Nothing when you are used to it, my boy.' Oliver wondered, in his own mind, whether it had taken a very long time to get Mr. Sowerberry used to it, but he thought it better not to ask the question, and walked back to the shop, thinking over all he had seen and heard. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 6 Oliver, being goaded by the taunts of Noah, rouses into action, and rather astonishes him. The month's trial over, Oliver was formally apprenticed. It was a nice, sickly season, just at this time. In commercial phrase, coffins were looking up, and in the course of a few weeks Oliver acquired a great deal of experience. The success of Mr. Sowerberry's ingenious speculation exceeded even his most sanguine hopes. The oldest inhabitants recollect no period at which measles had been so prevalent, or so fatal to infant existence, and many were the mournful processions which little Oliver headed, in a hat-band reaching down to his knees, to the indescribable admiration and emotion of all the mothers in the town. As Oliver accompanied his master in most of his adult expeditions, too, in order that he might acquire that equanimity of demeanour, and full command of nerve, which was essential to a finished undertaker, he had many opportunities of observing the beautiful resignation and fortitude with which some strong-minded people bear their trials and losses. For instance, when Sowerberry had an order for the burial of some rich old lady or gentleman, who was surrounded by a great number of nephews and nieces, who had been perfectly inconsolable during the previous illness, and whose grief had been wholly irrepressible even on the most public occasions, they would be as happy among themselves as need be, quite cheerful and contented, conversing together with as much freedom and gaiety as if nothing whatever had happened to disturb them. Husbands, too, bore the loss of their wives with the most heroic calmness. Wives, again, put on weeds for their husbands, as if, so far from grieving in the garb of sorrow, they had made up their minds to render it as becoming and attractive as possible. It was observable, too, that ladies and gentlemen who were in passions of anguish during the ceremony of interment, recovered almost as soon as they reached home, and became quite composed before the tea-drinking was over. All this was very pleasant and improving to see, and Oliver beheld it with great admiration. That Oliver Twist was moved to resignation, by the example of these good people, I cannot, although I am his biographer, undertake to affirm with any degree of confidence, but I can most distinctly say that for many months he continued meekly to submit to the domination and ill-treatment of Noah Claypole, who used him far worse than before, now that his jealousy was roused by seeing the new boy promoted to the black stick and hat-band, while he, the old one, remained stationary in the muffin-cap and leathers. Charlotte treated him ill, because Noah did, and Mr. Sowerberry was his decided enemy, because Mr. Sowerberry was disposed to be his friend. So between these three on one side, and a glut of funerals on the other, Oliver was not altogether as comfortable as the hungry pig was, when he was shut up by mistake in the grain department of a brewery. And now, I come to a very important passage in Oliver's history, for I have to record an act, slight and unimportant perhaps in appearance, but which indirectly produced a material change in all his future prospects and proceedings. One day, Oliver and Noah had descended into the kitchen at the usual dinner-hour, to banquet upon a small joint of mutton, a pound and a half of the worst end of the neck. When Charlotte, being called out of the way, there ensued a brief interval of time, which Noah Claypole, being hungry and vicious, 
considered he could not possibly devote to a worthier purpose than aggravating and tantalizing young Oliver Twist. Intent upon this innocent amusement, Noah put his feet on the tablecloth, and pulled Oliver's hair, and twitched his ears, and expressed his opinion that he was a sneak, and furthermore announced his intention of coming to see him hanged, whenever that desirable event should take place, and entered upon various topics of petty annoyance, like a malicious and ill-conditioned charity boy as he was. But, making Oliver cry, Noah attempted to be more facetious still, and in his attempt did what many sometimes do to this day, when they want to be funny, he got rather personal. Workus, said Noah, how's your mother? She's dead, replied Oliver. Don't you say anything about her to me. Oliver's colour rose as he said this. He breathed quickly, and there was a curious working of the mouth and nostrils, which Mr. Claypole thought must be the immediate precursor of a violent fit of crying. Under this impression, he returned to the charge. "'What did she die of, workers?' said Noah. "'Of a broken heart. Some of our old nurses told me,' replied Oliver, more as if he were talking to himself than answering Noah. "'I think I know what it must be to die of that.' told ye roll o all right folary workers said noah as a tear rolled down oliver's cheek what set you a snivelling now not you replied oliver sharply there that's enough don't say anything more to me about her you better not better not exclaimed noah well better not workers don't be impudent your mother, too. She was a nice, and she was. Oh, law! And here Noah nodded his head expressively, and curled up as much of his small red nose as muscular action could collect together for the occasion. You know, workers, continued Noah, emboldened by Oliver's silence, and speaking in a jeering tone of affected pity, of all tones the most annoying. You know, workers. It can't be helped now, and of course you couldn't help it then, and I'm very sorry for it, and I'm sure we all are, and pity you very much. But you must know, workers, your mother was a regular right down bad un. What did you say? inquired Oliver, looking up very quickly. A regular right down bad un, workers, replied Noah coolly. "'And it's a great deal better, workers, as she died when she did, "'or else she'd have been hard labouring in Bridewell, or transported, or hung, "'which is more likely than either, isn't it?' "'Crimson with fury, Oliver started up, overthrew the chair and table, "'seized Noah by the throat, shook him in the violence of his rage, "'till his teeth chattered in his head, and collecting his whole force into one heavy blow, felled him to the ground. A minute ago, the boy had looked the quiet child, mild, dejected creature that harsh treatment had made him, but his spirit was roused at last. The cruel insult to his dead mother had set his blood on fire. His breast heaved, his attitude was erect, his eyes bright and vivid, his whole person changed, as he stood glaring over the cowardly tormentor who now lay crouching at his feet and defied him with an energy he had never known before. "'You murder me!' blubbered Noah. "'Charlotte! Mrs! Is the new boy a virgin of me? Help! Help! Oliver's gone bad! Charlotte!' Noah's shouts were responded to by a loud scream from Charlotte, and a louder one from Mrs. Sowerberry the former of whom rushed into the kitchen by a side door, while the latter paused on the staircase, till she was quite certain that it was consistent with the preservation of human life to come further down. "'Oh, you little wretch!' screamed Charlotte, seizing Oliver with her utmost force, which was about equal to that of a moderately strong man, in particularly good training. "'Oh, you little ungrateful, murderous, horrid villain!' And between every syllable, Charlotte gave Oliver a blow with all her might, accompanying it with a scream for the benefit of society. 
Charlotte's fist was by no means a light one, but, lest it should not be effectual in calming Oliver's wrath, Mrs. Sowerberry plunged into the kitchen, and assisted to hold him with one hand while she scratched his face with the other. In this favourable position of affairs, Noah rose from the ground and pommelled him behind. This was rather too violent exercise to last long. When they were all wearied out, and could tear and beat no longer, they dragged Oliver, struggling and shouting, but nothing daunted, into the dust-cellar, and there locked him up. This being done, Mrs. Sowerberry sunk into a chair, and burst into tears. "'Bless her! She's going off!' said Charlotte. "'A glass of water, Noah, dear. Make haste!' "'Oh, Charlotte!' said Mrs. Sowerberry, speaking as well as she could, through a deficiency of breath, and a sufficiency of cold water, which Noah had poured over her head and shoulders. "'Oh, Charlotte! What a mercy! We have not all been murdered in our beds!' "'Ah, oh, mercy indeed, ma'am,' was the reply. "'I only hope this will teach Master not to have any more of these dreadful creatures that are born to be murderers and robbers from their very cradle. Oh, poor Noah! He was all but killed, ma'am, when I came in. Oh, poor fellow!' said Mrs. Sowerberry, looking piteously on the charity boy. Noah, whose top waistcoat button might have been somewhere on a level with the crown of Oliver's head, rubbed his eyes with the inside of his wrists, while this commiseration was bestowed upon him, and performed some affecting tears and sniffs. "'What's to be done?' exclaimed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Your master's not at home. There's not a man in the house, and he'll kick that door down in ten minutes.' Oliver's vigorous plunges against the bit of timber in question rendered this occurrence highly probable. "'Dear, dear, I don't know, ma'am,' said Charlotte, "'unless we send for the police officers.' "'Oh, the milling, Terry,' suggested Mr. Claypole. "'No, no,' said Mrs. Sowerberry, bethinking herself of Oliver's old friend. "'Run to Mr. Bumble, Noah, and tell him to come here directly, not to lose a minute. Never mind your cap. Make haste. You can hold a knife to that black eye as you run along. It will keep the swelling down.' Noah stopped to make no reply, but started off at his fullest speed, and very much it astonished the people who were out walking to see a charity boy tearing through the streets pell-mell, with no cap on his head, and a clasp-knife at his eye. End of chapter 6《Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 7. Oliver Continues Refractory. Noah Claypole ran along the streets at his swiftest pace, and paused not once for breath until he reached the workhouse gate. Having rested here for a minute or so, to collect a good burst of sobs and an imposing show of tears and terror, he knocked loudly at the wicket and presented such a rueful face to the aged pauper who opened it, that even he, who saw nothing but rueful faces about him at the best of times, started back in astonishment. "'Why, what's the matter with the boy?' said the old pauper. "'Mr. Bumble! Mr. Bumble!' cried Noah, with well-affected dismay, and in tones so loud and agitated that they not only caught the ear of Mr. Bumble himself, who happened to be hard by, but alarmed him so much that he rushed into the yard without his cocked hat, which is a very curious and remarkable circumstance, as showing that even a beadle, acted upon a sudden and powerful impulse, may be afflicted with a momentary visitation of loss of self-possession and forgetfulness of personal dignity. "'Oh, Mr. Bumble, sir,' said Noah, "'Oliver, sir, o Oliver has—' "'What? What?' interposed Mr. Bumble, with a gleam of pleasure in his metallic eyes. "'Not run away. He hasn't run away, has he, Noah?' "'No, sir. No. Not run away, sir. He's turned wishes,' replied Noah. "'He tried to murder me, sir. And then he tried to murder Charlotte. And then Mrs. Oh, what dreadful pain it is! Such agony! Please, sir!' And here Noah writhed and twisted his body into an extensive variety of eel-like positions, thereby giving Mr. Bumble to understand that, from the violent and sanguinary onset of Oliver Twist, he had sustained severe internal injury and damage, from which he was at that moment 
suffering the acutest torture. When Noah saw that the intelligence he communicated perfectly paralysed Mr. Bumble, he imparted additional effect thereunto by bewailing his dreadful wounds ten times louder than before, and when he observed a gentleman in a white waistcoat crossing the yard, he was more tragic in his lamentations than ever, rightly conceiving it highly expedient to attract the notice and rouse the indignation of the gentleman aforesaid. The gentleman's notice was very soon attracted, for he had not walked three paces when he turned angrily round and inquired what that young cur was howling for, and why Mr. Bumble did not favour him with something which would render the series of vocular exclamations so designated an involuntary process. "'It's a poor boy from the free school, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble, "'who has been nearly murdered, all but murdered, sir, by young Twist.' "'My Jove!' exclaimed the gentleman in the white waistcoat, stopping short. Oh, "'I knew it.' I felt a strange presentiment from the very first that that audacious young savage would come to be hung. He has likewise attempted, sir, to murder the female servant," said Mr. Bumble, with a face of ashy paleness. "'And his missus,' interposed Mr. Claypole. "'And his master, too, I think you said, Noah,' added Mr. Bumble. "'Oh, no! He's out! Or, or he would have murdered him,' replied Noah. "'He, he said he wanted to.' Ah. "'Said he wanted to, did he, my boy?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Yes, sir,' replied Noah. "'And please, sir, Mrs. wants to know whether Mr. Bumble can spare time to step up there directly and flog him, cause master's out.' "'Certainly, my boy, certainly,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, smiling benignly and patting Noah's head, which was about three inches higher than his own. "'You're a good boy, a very good boy.' Here's a penny for you. Bumble, just step up to Sowerberry's with your cane, and see what's best to be done. Don't spare him, Bumble." "'No, I will not, sir,' replied the beadle. And the cocked hat and cane, having been by this time adjusted to their owner's satisfaction, Mr. Bumble and Noah Claypole betook themselves with all speed to the undertaker's shop. Here the position of affairs had not at all improved. Sowerberry had not yet returned and Oliver continued to kick with undiminished vigour at the cellar-door. The accounts of his ferocity, as related by Mrs. Sowerberry and Charlotte, were of so startling a nature that Mr. Bumble judged it prudent to parley before opening the door. With this view, he gave a kick at the outside, by way of prelude, and, then applying his mouth to the keyhole, said, in a deep and impressive tone, "'Oliver!' "'Come! You let me out!' replied Oliver from the inside. "'Do you know this here voice, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble. "'Yes,' replied Oliver. "'Ain't you afraid of it, sir? Ain't you a-trembling while I speak, sir?' said Mr. Bumble. "'No,' replied Oliver boldly. An answer, so different from the one he had expected to elicit, and was in the habit of receiving, staggered Mr. Bumble not a little. He stepped back from the keyhole, drew himself up to his full height, and looked from one to another of the three bystanders, in mute astonishment. "'Oh, you know, Mr. Bumble, he must be mad,' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'No boy in half his senses would venture to speak so to you.' "'It's not madness, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble, after a few moments of deep meditation. "'It's meat.' "'What?' exclaimed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Meat, ma'am, meat.' replied Bumble, with stern emphasis. "'You've overfed him, ma'am. You've raised an artificial soul and spirit in him, ma'am, unbecoming a person of his condition. As the board, Mrs. Sowerberry, who are practical philosophers, will tell you, what have paupers to do with soul or spirit? It's quite enough that we let them have live bodies. If you had kept the boy on gruel, ma'am, this would never have happened.' "'Dear, dear!' ejaculated Mrs. Sowerberry, piously raising her eyes to the kitchen ceiling. "'This comes of being liberal!' The liberality of Mrs. Sowerberry, to Oliver, had consisted of a profuse bestowal upon him of all the dirty odds and ends which nobody else would eat. So there was a great deal of meekness and self-devotion in her voluntarily remaining under Mr. Bumble's heavy accusation. Of which, to do her justice, 
she was wholly innocent, in thought, word, or deed. "'Ah!' Oh, said Mr. Bumble, when the lady brought her eyes down to earth again. "'The only thing that can be done now, that I know of, is to leave him in the cellar for a day or so, till he's a little starved down, and then to take him out, and keep him on gruel all through the apprenticeship. He comes of a bad family. Excitable natures, Mrs. Sowberry. Both the nurse and doctor said that that mother of his made her way here, against difficulties and pain, and would have killed any well-disposed woman weeks before." At this point of Mr. Bumble's discourse, Oliver, just hearing enough to know that some allusion was being made to his mother, recommenced kicking, with a violence that rendered every other sound inaudible. Sowerberry returned at this juncture, Oliver's offence having been explained to him, with such exaggerations as the ladies thought best calculated to rouse his ire, he unlocked the cellar door in a twinkling, and dragged his rebellious apprentice out by the collar. Oliver's clothes had been torn in the beating he had received, his face was bruised and scratched, and his hair scattered over his forehead. The angry flush had not disappeared, however, and when he was pulled out of his prison, he scowled boldly on Noah, and looked quite undismayed. "'Now, you're a nice young fellow, ain't you?' said Sowerberry, giving Oliver a shake and a box on the ear. "'He called my mother names,' replied Oliver. "'Well, and what have you did, you little ungrateful wretch?' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'She deserved what he said, and worse.' "'She didn't,' said Oliver. "'She did,' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'It's a lie,' said Oliver. Mrs. Sowerberry burst into a flood of tears. This flood of tears left Mr. Sowerberry no alternative. If he had hesitated for one instant to punish Oliver most severely, it must be quite clear to every experienced reader that he would have been, according to all precedents in disputes of matrimony, established, a brute, an unnatural husband, an insulting creature, a base imitation of a man, and various other agreeable characters, too numerous for recital within the limits of this chapter. To do him justice, he was, as far as his power went, it was not very extensive, kindly disposed towards the boy, perhaps because it was his interest to be so perhaps because his wife disliked him. The flood of tears, however, left him no resource, so he at once gave him a drubbing which satisfied even Mrs. Sowerberry herself, and rendered Mr. Bumble's subsequent application of the parochial cane rather unnecessary. For the rest of the day he was shut up in the back kitchen, in company with a pump and a slice of bread, and at night Mrs. Sowerberry, after making various remarks outside the door, by no means complimentary to the memory of his mother, looked into the room, and amidst the jeers and pointings of Noah and Charlotte, ordered him upstairs to his dismal bed. It was not until he was left alone in the silence and stillness of the gloomy workshop of the undertaker, that Oliver gave way to the feelings which the day's treatment may be supposed likely to have awakened in a mere child. He had listened to their taunts, with a look of contempt. He had borne the lash without a cry, for he felt the pride, swelling in his heart, which would have kept down a shriek to the last, though they had roasted him alive. But now, when there were none to see or hear him, he fell upon his knees on the floor, and, hiding his face in his hands, wept such tears as, God send for the credit of our nature, few so young may ever have cause to pour out before him. For a long time Oliver remained motionless in this attitude. The candle was burning low in the socket when he rose to his feet. Having gazed cautiously round him, and listened intently, he gently undid the fastenings of the door, and looked abroad. It was a cold, dark night. The stars seemed, to the boy's eyes, farther from the earth than he had ever seen them before. There was no wind, and the sombre shadows thrown by the trees upon the ground looked sepulchral and death-like from being so still. He softly reclosed the door. Having availed himself of the expiring light of the candle to tie up in a handkerchief the few articles of wearing apparel he had, sat himself down upon a bench to wait for morning. With the first ray of light that struggled through the crevices in the shutters, Oliver rose and again unbarred the door. One timid look around, one moment's pause of hesitation, he had closed it behind him and was in the open street. 
he looked to the right and to the left, uncertain whither to fly. He remembered to have seen the wagons, as they went out, toiling up the hill. He took the same route, and arriving at a footpath across the fields, which he knew, after some distance, led out again into the road, struck into it, and walked quickly on. Along this same footpath, Oliver well remembered he had trotted beside Mr. Bumble, when he first carried him to the workhouse from the farm. His way lay directly in front of the cottage. His heart beat quickly when he bethought himself of this, and he half resolved to turn back. He had come a long way, though, and should lose a great deal of time by doing so. Besides, it was so early that there was very little fear of his being seen, so he walked on. He reached the house. There was no appearance of its inmates stirring at that early hour. Oliver stopped and peeped into the garden. A child was weeding one of the little beds. As he stopped, he raised his pale face, and disclosed the features of one of his former companions. Oliver felt glad to see him before he went, for though younger than himself he had been his little friend and playmate, they had been beaten and starved and shut up together many and many a time. "'Hush, Dick!' said Oliver, as the boy ran to the gate, and thrust his thin arm between the rails to greet him. "'Is any one up?' "'Nobody but me,' replied the child. "'You mustn't say you saw me, Dick,' said Oliver. "'I'm running away. They beat and ill-use me, Dick, and I'm going to seek my fortune some long way off. I don't know where. How pale you are!' "'I—' "'Heard the doctor tell them I was dying,' replied the child with a faint smile. "'I'm very glad to see you, my dear. But don't stop. Don't stop. Yes, yes, I will, to say good-bye to you,' replied Oliver. "'I shall see you again, Dick. I know I shall. You will be well and happy.' "'I hope so,' replied the child. "'After—' I am dead, but not before. I know the doctor must be right, Oliver, because I dream so much of heaven and angels and kind faces that I never see when I am awake. Kiss me," said the child, climbing up the low gate and flinging his little arms around Oliver's neck. Goodbye, dear. God bless you. The blessing was from a young child's lips, but it was the first that Oliver had ever heard invoked upon his head. And through the struggles and sufferings and troubles and changes of his afterlife, he never once forgot it. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 8. Oliver walks to London. He encounters on the road a strange sort of young gentleman. Oliver reached the stile at which the bypath terminated, and once more gained the high road. It was eight o'clock now. Though he was nearly five miles away from the town, he ran and hid behind the hedges by turns till noon fearing that he might be pursued and overtaken. Then he sat down to rest by the side of the milestone, and began to think, for the first time, where he had better go and try to live. The stone by which he was seated bore in large characters an intimation that it was just seventy miles from that spot to London. The name awakened a new train of ideas in the boy's mind. London! That great place! Nobody, not even Mr. Bumble, could ever find him there. He had often heard the old men in the workhouse, too, say that no lad of spirit need want in London, and that there were ways of living in that vast city which those who had been bred up in country parts had no idea of. It was the very place for a homeless boy who must die in the streets unless someone helped him. As these things passed through his thoughts, he jumped upon his feet and again walked forward. He had diminished the distance between himself and London by full four miles more before he recollected how much he must undergo ere he could hope to reach his place of destination. As this consideration forced itself upon him, 
he slackened his pace a little, and meditated upon his means of getting there. He had a crust of bread, a coarse shirt, and two pairs of stockings in his bundle. He had a penny, too, a gift of sourberries, after some funeral in which he had acquitted himself more than ordinarily well, in his pocket. A clean shirt, thought Oliver, is a very comfortable thing, and so are two pairs of darn stockings, and so is a penny, but they are small helps to a sixty-five miles walk in winter-time. But Oliver's thoughts, like those of most other people, although they were extremely ready and active to point out his difficulties, were wholly at a loss to suggest any feasible mode of surmounting them. So, after a good deal of thinking to no particular purpose, he changed his little bundle over to the other shoulder, and trudged on. Oliver walked twenty miles that day, and all that time tasted nothing but the crust of dry bread, and a few draughts of water which he begged at the cottage doors by the roadside. When the night came, he turned into a meadow, and, creeping close under a hayrick, determined to lie there till morning. He felt frightened at first, for the wind moaned dismally over the empty fields, and he was cold and hungry, and more alone than he had ever felt before. Being very tired with his walk, however, he soon fell asleep, and forgot his troubles. He felt cold and stiff when he got up next morning, and so hungry that he was obliged to exchange the penny for a small loaf in the very first village through which he passed. He had walked no more than twelve miles, when the night closed in again. His feet were sore, and his legs so weak that they trembled beneath him. Another night passed in the bleak damp air, made him worse. When he set forward on his journey next morning, he could hardly crawl along. He waited at the bottom of a steep hill till a stage-coach came up, and then begged of the outside passengers but there were very few who took any notice of him, and even those told him to wait till they got to the top of the hill, and then let them see how far he could run for a halfpenny. Poor Oliver tried to keep up with the coach a little way, but was unable to do it, by reason of his fatigue and sore feet. When the outsides saw this, they put their halfpence back into their pockets again, declaring that he was an idle young dog, and didn't deserve anything, and the coach rattled away and left only a cloud of dust behind. In some villages, large painted boards were fixed up, warning all persons who begged within the district that they would be sent to jail. This frightened Oliver very much, and made him glad to get out of those villages with all possible expedition. In others, he would stand about the inn-yards, and look mournfully at every one who passed a proceeding which generally terminated in the landlady's ordering one of the post-boys, who were lounging about, to drive that strange boy out of the place, for she was sure he had come to steal something. If he begged at a farmer's house, ten to one but they threatened to set the dog on him, and when he showed his nose in a shop they talked about the beadle, which brought Oliver's heart into his mouth, very often the only thing he had there for many hours together. In fact, if it had not been for a good-hearted turnpike man, and a benevolent old lady, Oliver's troubles would have been shortened by the very same process which had put an end to his mother's. In other words, he would most assuredly have fallen dead upon the king's highway. But the turnpike man gave him a meal of bread and cheese, and the old lady, who had a shipwrecked grandson, wandering barefoot in some distant part of the earth, took pity upon the poor orphan, and gave him what little she could afford, and more with such kind and gentle words, and such tears of sympathy and compassion, that they sank deeper into Oliver's soul than all the sufferings he had ever undergone. Early on the seventh morning, after he had left his native place, Oliver limped slowly into the little town of Barnet. The window-shutters were closed, the street was empty, not a soul had awakened to the business of the day. The sun was rising in all its splendid beauty, but the light only served to show the boy his own lonesomeness and desolation, as he sat, with bleeding feet, and covered with dust, upon a doorstep. By degrees the shutters were opened, the window-blinds were drawn up, and people began passing to and fro. Some few stopped to gaze at Oliver for a moment or two, or turned round to stare at him as they hurried by, but none relieved him, or troubled themselves to inquire how he came there. He had no heart to beg, and there he sat. He had been crouching on the step for some time, wondering at the great number of public-houses. Every other house in Barnet was a tavern, 
large or small, gazing listlessly at the coaches as they passed through, and thinking how strange it seemed that they could do, with ease, in a few hours, what it had taken him a whole week of courage and determination beyond his years to accomplish, when he was roused by observing that a boy, who had passed him carelessly some minutes before, had returned, and was now surveying him most earnestly from the opposite side of the way. He took little heed of this at first, but the boy remained in the same attitude of close observation so long, that Oliver raised his head, and returned his steady look. Upon this, the boy crossed over, and walking close up to Oliver, said, "'Hello, my covey! What's the row?' The boy who addressed this inquiry to the young wayfarer was about his own age, but one of the queerest-looking boys that Oliver had ever seen. He was a snub-nosed, flat-browed, common-faced boy enough, and as dirty a juvenile as one would wish to see, but he had about him all the airs and manners of a man. He was short of his age, with rather bow legs, and little sharp ugly eyes. His hat was stuck on the top of his head so lightly, that it threatened to fall off every moment, and would have done so very often, if the wearer had not had a knack of every now and then giving his head a sudden twitch, which brought it back to its old place again. He wore a man's coat, which reached nearly to his heels. He had turned the cuffs back, halfway up his arm, to get his hands out of the sleeves, apparently with the ultimate view of thrusting them into the pockets of his corduroy trousers, for there he kept them. He was, altogether, as roistering and swaggering a young gentleman as ever stood four feet six, or something less, in the Blucher's. "'Hello, my covey! What's the row?' said this strange young gentleman to Oliver. "'I'm very hungry and tired,' replied Oliver, the tears standing in his eyes as he spoke. "'I have walked a long way. I've been walking these seven days.' "'Walking for seven days?' said the young gentleman. "'Oh, I see. Beak's order, eh? But,' he added, noticing Oliver's look of surprise, "'I suppose you don't know what a beak is, my flash companion.' Oliver mildly replied that he had always heard a bird's mouth described by the term in question. "'My eyes! How green!' exclaimed the young gentleman. "'Why, a beak's a magistrate. And when you walk by a beak's order, it's not straight forward, but always a-going up, and never a-coming down again. Was you never on the mill?" "'What mill?' inquired Oliver. "'What mill? Why, the mill! The mill, as takes up so little room that it'll work inside a stone jug, and always goes better when the wind's low with people than when it's high. Of course, then, they can't get workmen. But come," said the young gentleman, "'you want grub, and you shall have it. I'm at low water mark myself, only one bob and a magpie, but, as far as it goes, I'll fork out and stump. Up with the on your pins. There. Now then, Maurice." Assisting Oliver to rise, the young gentleman took him to an adjacent chandler's shop, where he purchased a sufficiency of ready-dressed ham, and a half-quartern loaf, or, as he himself expressed it, a fourpenny bran, the ham being kept clean and preserved from dust by the ingenious expedient of making a hole in the loaf by pulling out a portion of the crumb and stuffing it therein. Taking the bread under his arm, the young gentleman turned into a small public-house and led the way to a tap-room in the rear of the premises. Here a pot of beer was brought in, by direction of the mysterious youth, and Oliver, falling to at his new friend's bidding, made a long and hearty meal, during the progress of which the strange boy eyed him from time to time with great attention. "'Going to London?' said the strange boy, when Oliver had at length concluded. "'Yes. Got any lodgings?' "'No. Money? No." The strange boy whistled, and put his arms into his pockets, as far as the big coat-sleeves would let them go. "'Do you live in London?' inquired Oliver. "'Yes, I do, when I'm at home,' replied the boy. "'I suppose you want some place to sleep in to-night, don't you?' "'I do, indeed,' 
answered Oliver. "'I've not slept under a roof since I left the country.' "'Don't fret your eyelids on that score,' said the young gentleman. "'I've got to be in London to-night, and I know a spectable old gentleman as lives there, what'll give you lodgings for nothing, and never ask for the change. That is, if any gentleman he knows introduces you. And don't he know me? Oh, no, not in the least, by no means, certainly not.' The young gentleman smiled, as if to intimate that the latter fragments of discourse were playfully ironical, and finished the beer as he did so. This unexpected offer of shelter was too tempting to be resisted, especially as it was immediately followed up by the assurance that the old gentleman referred to would doubtless provide Oliver with a comfortable place, without loss of time. This led to a more friendly and confidential dialogue from which Oliver discovered that his friend's name was Jack Dawkins, and that he was a peculiar pet and protégé of the elderly gentleman before mentioned. Mr. Dawkins's appearance did not say a vast deal in favour of the comforts which his patron's interest obtained for those whom he took under his protection, but, as he had a rather flightly and dissolute mode of conversing, and furthermore avowed that among his intimate friends he was better known by the sobriquet of the Artful Dodger, Oliver concluded that, being of a dissipated and careless turn, the moral precepts of his benefactor had hitherto been thrown away upon him. Under this impression, he secretly resolved to cultivate the good opinion of the old gentleman as quickly as possible. And if he found the Dodger incorrigible, as he more than half suspected he should, to decline the honour of his father acquaintance. As Jack Dawkins objected to their entering London before nightfall, it was nearly eleven o'clock when they reached the turnpike at Islington. They crossed from the Angel into St. John's Road, struck down the small street which terminates at Sadler's Wells Theatre, through Exmouth Street and Coppice Row, down the little court by the side of the workhouse, across the classic ground which once bore the name of Hockley in the Hole, thence into Little Saffron Hill, and so into Saffron Hill the Great, along which the Dodger scudded at a rapid pace directing Oliver to follow close at his heels. Although Oliver had enough to occupy his attention in keeping sight of his leader, he could not help bestowing a few hasty glances on either side of the way as he passed along. A dirtier or more wretched place he had never seen. The street was very narrow and muddy, and the air was impregnated with filthy odours. There were a good many small shops, but the only stock in trade appeared to be heaps of children, who, even at that time of night, were crawling in and out at the doors, or screaming from the inside. The sole places that seemed to prosper amid the general blight of the place were the public houses, and in them the lowest orders of Irish were wrangling with might and main. Covered ways and yards, which here and there diverged from the main street, disclosed little knots of houses, where drunken men and women were positively wallowing in filth. And from several of the doorways, great, ill-looking fellows were cautiously emerging, bound to all appearance, on no very well-disposed or harmless errands. Oliver was just considering whether he hadn't better run away, when they reached the bottom of the hill. His conductor, catching him by the arm, pushed open the door of a house near Field Lane, and drawing him into the passage, closed it behind them. "'Now, then!' cried a voice from below, in reply to a whistle from the Dodger. "'Plummy and slam!' was the reply. This seemed to be some watchword or signal that all was right, for the light of a feeble candle gleamed on the wall at the remote end of the passage, and a man's face peeped out from where a balustrade of the old kitchen staircase had been broken away. "'There's two on you,' said the man, thrusting the candle farther out, and shielding his eyes with his hand. "'Who's the t'other one?' "'A new pal.' replied Jack Dawkins, pulling Oliver forward. "'Where'd he come from?' "'Greenland. He's faking upstairs.' "'Yes. He's a-sortin' the wipes. Up with you.' The candle was drawn back, and the face disappeared. Oliver, groping his way with one hand, and having the other firmly grasped by his companion, ascended with much difficulty the dark and broken stairs, which his conductor mounted with an ease and expedition that showed he was well acquainted with them. He threw open the door of a back room, and drew Oliver in after him. The walls and ceiling of the room 
were perfectly black with age and dirt. There was a deal table before the fire, upon which were a candle stuck in a ginger beer bottle, two or three pewter pots, a loaf and butter, and a plate. In a frying pan which was on the fire, and which was secured to the mantel shelf by a string, some sausages were cooking, and standing over them, with a toasting fork in his hand, was a very old shrivelled Jew, whose villainous looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. He was dressed in a greasy flannel gown, with his throat bare, and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying pan and the clothes horse, over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging. Several rough beds, made of old sacks, were huddled side by side on the floor. Seated round the table were four or five boys, none older than the Dodger, smoking long clay pipes, and drinking spirits with the air of middle-aged men. These all crowded about their associate as he whispered a few words to the Jew, and then turned round and grinned at Oliver. So did the Jew himself, toasting fork in hand. "'This is him, Fagin,' said Jack Dawkins. "'My friend, Oliver Twist.' The Jew grinned, and, making a low obeisance to Oliver, took him by the hand, and hoped he should have the honour of his intimate acquaintance. Upon this, the young gentleman with the pipes came round him, and shook both his hands very hard, especially the one in which he held his little bundle. One young gentleman was very anxious to hang up his cap for him, and another was so obliging as to put his hands in his pockets, in order that, as he was very tired, he might not have the trouble of emptying them himself when he went to bed. These civilities would probably be extended much further, but for a liberal exercise of the Jew's toasting fork on the heads and shoulders of the affectionate youths who offered them. "'We are very glad to see you, Oliver, very,' said the Jew. "'Dodger, take off the sausages, and draw a tub near the fire for Oliver. Ah, you're a-staring at the pocket handkerchiefs, eh, my dear? There are a good many of them, ain't there? We've just looked him out, ready for the wash. That's all, Oliver. That's all. <laughs> the latter part of his speech was hailed by a boisterous shout from all the hopeful pupils of the merry old gentleman, in the midst of which they went to supper. Oliver ate his share, and the Jew then mixed him a glass of hot gin and water, telling him he must drink it off directly, because another gentleman wanted the tumbler. Oliver did as he was desired. Immediately afterwards, he felt himself gently lifted onto one of the sacks, and then he sunk into a deep sleep. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Nine. Containing further particulars concerning the pleasant old gentleman and his hopeful pupils. It was late next morning when Oliver awoke from a sound, long sleep. There was no other person in the room but the old Jew who was boiling some coffee in a saucepan for breakfast, and whistling softly to himself as he stirred it round and round with an iron spoon. He would stop every now and then to listen, when there was the least noise below, and when he had satisfied himself, he would go on whistling and stirring again as before. Although Oliver had roused himself from sleep, he was not thoroughly awake. There is a drowsy state, between sleeping and waking, when you dream more in five minutes with your eyes half open, and yourself half conscious of everything that is passing around you, than you would in five nights with your eyes fast closed, and your senses wrapped in perfect unconsciousness. At such time, a mortal knows just enough of what his mind is doing, to form some glimmering conception of its mighty powers, its bounding from earth and spurning time and space, when freed from the restraint of its corporeal associate. Oliver was precisely in this condition. He saw the Jew with his half-closed eyes, heard his low whistling, and recognised the sound of the spoon grating against the saucepan's sides, and yet the self-same senses were mentally engaged at the same time in busy action with almost everybody he had ever known. 
When the coffee was done, the Jew drew the saucepan to the hob. Standing then in an irresolute attitude for a few minutes, as if he did not well know how to employ himself, he turned round and looked at Oliver, and called him by his name. He did not answer, and was to all appearances asleep. After satisfying himself upon this head, the Jew stepped gently to the door, which he fastened. He then drew forth, as it seemed to Oliver, from some trap in the floor, a small box which he placed carefully on the table. His eyes glistened as he raised the lid and looked in. Dragging an old chair to the table, he sat down, and took from it a magnificent gold watch, sparkling with jewels. Aha! said the Jew, shrugging up his shoulders and distorting every feature with a hideous grin. Clever dogs! Clever dogs! Staunch to the last! Never told the old parson where they were, never poached upon old Fagin, and why should they? It wouldn't have loosened the knot, or kept the drop up a minute longer. No, 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 fine fellows, fine fellows. With these, and other muttered reflections of the like nature, the Jew once more deposited the watch in its place of safety. At least half a dozen more were severally drawn forth from the same box, and surveyed with equal pleasure. Besides rings, brooches, bracelets, and other articles of jewellery, of such magnificent materials and costly workmanship, that Oliver had no idea even of their names. Having replaced these trinkets, the Jew took out another, so small that it lay in the palm of his hand. There seemed to be some very minute inscription on it, for the Jew laid it flat upon the table, and shading it with his hand, pored over it, long and earnestly. At length he put it down, as if despairing of success, and, leaning back in his chair, muttered, "'What a fine thing capital punishment is! Dead men never repent! Dead men never bring awkward stories to light! Ah! It's a fine thing for the trade! Five of them strung up in a row, and none left to play booty, or turn white-livered!' As the Jew uttered these words, his bright dark eyes, which had been staring vacantly before him, fell on Oliver's face. The boy's eyes were fixed on his, in mute curiosity. And although the recognition was only for an instant, for the briefest space of time that can possibly be conceived, it was enough to show the old man that he had been observed. He closed the lid of the box with a loud crash, and, laying his hand on a bread-knife which was on the table, started furiously up. He trembled very much, though for even in his terror Oliver could see that the knife quivered in the air. "'What's that?' said the Jew. "'What do you watch me for? Why are you awake? What have you seen? Speak out, boy, quick, quick, for your life!' "'I wasn't able to sleep any longer, sir,' replied Oliver meekly. "'I'm very sorry if I have disturbed you, sir.' "'You were not awake an hour ago,' said the Jew, scowling fiercely on the boy. "'No, no, indeed,' replied Oliver. "'Are you sure?' cried the Jew, with a still fiercer look than before, and a threatening attitude. "'Upon my words, I was not, sir,' replied Oliver earnestly. "'I was not, indeed, sir.' "'Tush, tush, my dear,' said the Jew, abruptly resuming his old manner, and playing with the knife a little, before he laid it down as if to induce the belief that he had caught it up in mere sport. "'Of course I know that, my dear. I only tried to frighten you. You're a brave boy. <laughs> You're a brave boy, Oliver.' The Jew rubbed his hands with a chuckle, but glanced uneasily at the box notwithstanding. "'Did you see any of these pretty things, my dear?' said the Jew, laying his hand upon it after a short pause. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Ah,' said the Jew, turning rather pale. "'They—they're mine, Oliver. My little property. All I have to live upon in my old age. The folks call me a miser, my dear. Only a miser, that's all.' 
Oliver thought the old gentleman must be a decided miser, to live in such a dirty place with so many watches, but thinking that perhaps his fondness for the Dodger and the other boys cost him a good deal of money, he only cast a deferential look at the Jew, and asked if he might get up. "'Certainly, my dear, certainly,' replied the old gentleman. "'Stay. There's a pitcher of water in the corner by the door. Bring it here, and I'll give you a basin to wash in, my dear.' Oliver got up, walked across the room, and stooped for an instant to raise the pitcher. When he turned his head, the box was gone. He had scarcely washed himself, and made everything tidy, by emptying the basin out of the window, agreeably to the Jew's directions, when the Dodger returned, accompanied by a very sprightly young friend, whom Oliver had seen smoking on the previous night, and who was now formally introduced to him as Charlie Bates. The four sat down to breakfast on the coffee, and some hot rolls, and ham, which the Dodger had brought home in the crown of his hat. "'Well,' said the Jew, glancing slyly at Oliver, and addressing himself to the Dodger, "'I hope you've been at work this morning, my dears.' "'Odd,' replied the Dodger. "'As nails,' added Charlie Bates. "'Good boys, good boys,' said the Jew. "'What have you got, Dodger?' "'A couple of pocket-books,' replied that young gentleman. "'Lined?' inquired the Jew, with eagerness. "'Pretty well,' replied the Dodger, producing two pocket-books one green, and the other red. "'Not so heavy as they might be,' said the Jew, after looking at the insides carefully. "'But very neat and nicely made. Ingenious workman, ain't he, Oliver?' "'Very indeed, sir,' said Oliver, at which Mr. Charles Bates laughed uproariously, very much to the amazement of Oliver, who saw nothing to laugh at in anything that had passed. "'And what have you got, my dear?' said Fagin to Charlie Bates. "'Wipes,' replied Master Bates, at the same time producing four pocket-handkerchiefs. "'Well,' said the Jew, inspecting them closely, "'they're very good ones, very. You haven't marked them well, though, Charlie. So the marks shall be picked out with a needle, and we'll teach Oliver how to do it.' "'Shall us, Oliver, eh?' <laughs> "'If you please, sir,' said Oliver. "'You'd like to be able to make pocket-handkerchiefs as easy as Charlie Bates, wouldn't you, my dear?' said the Jew. "'Very much indeed, if you'll teach me, sir,' replied Oliver. Master Bates saw something so exquisitely ludicrous in this reply, that he burst into another laugh. Which laugh? meeting the coffee he was drinking, and carrying it down some wrong channel, very nearly terminated in his premature suffocation. "'He's <laughs> so jolly green,' said Charlie, when he recovered, as an apology to the company for his unpolite behaviour. The Dodger said nothing, but he smoothed Oliver's hair over his eyes, and said he'd know better by and by, upon which the old gentleman, observing Oliver's colour mounting, changed the subject by asking whether there had been much of a crowd at the execution that morning. This made him wonder more and more, for it was plain from the replies of the two boys that they had both been there, and Oliver naturally wondered how they could possibly have found time to be so very industrious. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman placed a snuff-box in one pocket of his trousers, a note-case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket, with a guard-chain around his neck, and sticking a mock-diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tightly round him, and putting a spectacle-case and handkerchief in his pockets, trotted up and down the room with a stick, in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets any hour in that day. Sometimes he stopped at the fireplace, and sometimes at the door making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop-windows. At such times he would look constantly round him, for fear of thieves, and would keep slapping all his pockets in turn, to see that he hadn't lost anything, in such a very funny and natural manner, that Oliver laughed till the tears ran down his face. All this time the two boys followed him closely about, 
getting out of his sight so nimbly every time he turned round, that it was impossible to follow their motions. At last the dodger trod upon his toes, or ran upon his boot accidentally, while Charlie Bates stumbled up against him behind, and in that one moment they took from him, with the most extraordinary rapidity, snuff-box, note-case, watch-guard, chain, shirt-pin, pocket-handkerchief, even the spectacle-case. If the old gentleman felt a hand in any one of his pockets, he cried out where it was, and then the game began all over again. When this game had been played a great many times, a couple of young ladies called to see the young gentleman, one of whom was named Bet, and the other Nancy. They wore a good deal of hair, not very neatly turned up behind, and were rather untidy about the shoes and stockings. They were not exactly pretty, perhaps, but they had a great deal of colour in their faces, and looked quite stout and hearty. Being remarkably free and agreeable in their manners, Oliver thought them very nice girls indeed, as there is no doubt they were. The visitors stopped a long time. Spirits were produced, in consequence of one of the young ladies complaining of a coldness in her inside, and the conversation took a very convivial and improving turn. At length Charlie Bates expressed his opinion that it was time to pad the hoof. This, it occurred to Oliver, must be French for going out, for directly afterwards the Dodger and Charlie and the two young ladies went away together, having been kindly furnished by the amiable old Jew with money to spend. "'There, my dear,' said Fagin, "'that's a pleasant life, isn't it? They've gone out for the day.' "'Have they done work, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'Yes.' said the Jew. That is, unless they should unexpectedly come across any when they are out. And they won't neglect it if they do, my dear, depend upon it. Make em your models, my dear. Make em your models. Tapping the fire-shovel on the hearth to add force to his words. Do everything they bid you, and take their advice in all matters, especially the dodgers, my dear. He'll be a great man himself, and will make you one, too, if you take pattern by him. Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear? said the Jew, stopping short. Yes, sir, said Oliver. See if you can take it out without my feeling it, as you saw them do when we were at play this morning. Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand, as he had seen the dodger hold it, and drew the handkerchief lightly out of it with the other. "'Is it gone?' cried the Jew. "'Here it is, sir,' said Oliver, showing it in his hand. "'You're a clever boy, my dear,' said the playful old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head approvingly. "'I never saw a sharper lad. Here's a shilling for you. If you go on in this way, you be the greatest man of the time. And now, come here, and I'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs." Oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man. But, thinking that the Jew, being so much his senior, must know best, he followed him quietly to the table, and was soon deeply involved in his new study. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Ten. Oliver becomes better acquainted with the characters of his new associates, and purchases experience at a high price, being a short but very important chapter in this history. For many days, Oliver remained in the Jew's room picking the marks out of the pocket-handkerchief, of which a great number were brought home, and sometimes taking part in the game already described, which the two boys and the Jew played regularly every morning. At length he began to languish for fresh air, and took many occasions of earnestly entreating the old gentleman to allow him to go out to work with his two companions. Oliver was rendered the more anxious to be actively employed by what he had seen of the stern morality of the old gentleman's character. Whenever the Dodger or Charlie Bates came home at night, 
empty-handed, he would expatiate with great vehemence on the misery of idle and lazy habits, and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed. On one occasion, indeed, he even went so far as to knock them both down a flight of stairs, but this was carrying out his virtuous precepts to an unusual extent. At length, one morning, Oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought. There had been no handkerchiefs to work upon for two or three days, and the dinners had been rather meagre. Perhaps these were reasons for the old gentleman's giving his assent. But, whether they were or no, he told Oliver he might go, and placed him under the joint guardianship of Charlie Bates and his friend the Dodger. The three boys sallied out, the Dodger with his coat-sleeves tucked up, and his hat cocked as usual, Master Bates sauntering along with his hands in his pockets, and Oliver between them, wondering where they were going, and what branch of manufacture he would be instructed in first. The pace at which they went was such a very lazy, ill-looking saunter, that Oliver soon began to think his companions were going to deceive the old gentleman by not going to work at all. The Dodger had a vicious propensity, too, of pulling the caps from the heads of small boys, and tossing them down areas, while Charlie Bates exhibited some very loose notions concerning the rights of property, by pilfering diverse apples and onions from the stalls at the kennel sides, and thrusting them into pockets which were so surprisingly capacious that they seemed to undermine his whole suit of clothes in every direction. These things looked so bad that Oliver was on the point of declaring his intention of seeking his way back, in the best way he could, when his thoughts were suddenly directed into another channel, by a very mysterious change of behaviour on the part of the Dodger. They were just emerging from a narrow court not far from the open square in Clerkenwell, which is yet called, by some strange perversion of terms, the Green, when the Dodger made a sudden stop, and, laying his finger on his lip, drew his companions back again, with the greatest caution and circumspection. "'What's the matter?' demanded Oliver. "'Hush!' replied the Dodger. "'You see that old cove at the bookstall?' "'The old gentleman over the way,' said Oliver. "'Yes, I see him.' "'He'll do,' said the Dodger. "'A prime plant,' observed Master Charlie Bates. Oliver looked from one to the other, with the greatest surprise, but he was not permitted to make any inquiries, for the two boys walked stealthily across the road, and slunk close behind the old gentleman towards whom his attention had been directed. Oliver walked a few paces after them, and, not knowing whether to advance or retire, stood looking on in silent amazement. The old gentleman was a very respectable-looking personage, with a powdered head and gold spectacles. He was dressed in a bottle-green coat, with a black velvet collar, wore white trousers, and carried a smart bamboo cane under his arm. He had taken up a book from the stall, and there he stood, reading away, as hard as if he were in his elbow-chair in his own study. It is very possible that he fancied himself there indeed, for it was plain from his abstraction that he saw not the book-stall, nor the street, nor the boys, nor, in short, anything but the book itself, which he was reading straight through, turning over the leaf when he got to the bottom of the page, beginning at the top line of the next one, and going regularly on with the greatest interest and eagerness. What was Oliver's horror and alarm, as he stood a few paces off, looking on with his eyelids as wide open as they would possibly go, to see the Dodger plunge his hand into the old gentleman's pocket, and draw from thence a handkerchief, to see him hand the same to Charlie Bates, and finally to behold them both running away round the corner at full speed. In an instant, the whole mystery of the handkerchiefs, and the watches, and the jewels, and the Jew, rushed upon the boy's mind. He stood, for a moment, with the blood so tingling through all his veins from terror, that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. Then, confused and frightened, he took to his heels, and, not knowing what he did, made off as fast as he could lay his feet to the ground. This was all done in a minute's space. In the very instant when Oliver began to run, the old gentleman, putting his hand to his pocket, and missing his handkerchief, turned sharply round. Seeing the boy scudding away at such a rapid pace, he very naturally concluded him to be the depredator, and shouting, STOP THIEF! with all his might, made off after him, book in hand. 
But the old gentleman was not the only person who raised the hue and cry. The Dodger and Master Bates, unwilling to attract public attention by running down the open street, had merely retired into the very first doorway round the corner. They no sooner heard the cry, and saw Oliver running, than, guessing exactly how the matter stood, they issued forth with great promptitude, and shouting, "'Stop, thief!' too, joined in the pursuit like good citizens. Although Oliver had been brought up by philosophers, he was not theoretically acquainted with the beautiful axiom that self-preservation is the first law of nature. If he had been, perhaps he would have been prepared for this. Not being prepared, however, it alarmed him the more. So away he went like the wind, with the old gentleman and the two boys roaring and shouting behind him. "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' There is a magic in the sound. The tradesman leaves his counter, and the carman his wagon, the butcher throws down his tray, the baker his basket, the milkman his pail, the errand-boy his parcels, the schoolboy his marbles, the pavior his pickaxe, the child his battledore. Away they run, pell-mell, helter-skelter, slap-dash, tearing, yelling, screaming, knocking down the passengers as they turn the corners, rousing up the dogs, and astonishing the fowls, and streets, squares, and courts re-echo with the sound. "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' The cry is taken up by a hundred voices, and the crowd accumulate at every turning. Away they fly, splashing through the mud and rattling along the pavements. Up go the windows, out run the people, onward bear the mob, a whole audience desert punch in the very thickest of the plot, and, joining the rushing throng, swell the shout, and lend fresh vigour to the cry, "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' There is a passion for hunting, something deeply implanted in the human breast. One wretched, breathless child, panting with exhaustion, terror in his looks, agony in his eyes, large drops of perspiration streaming down his face, strains every nerve to make head upon his pursuers, and as they follow on his track, and gain upon him every instant, they hail his decreasing strength with joy. Stop, thief! Aye, stop him for God's sake, were it only in mercy. Stopped at last, a clever blow. He is down upon the pavement, and the crowd eagerly gather round him, each newcomer jostling and struggling with the others to catch a glimpse. Stand aside! Give him a little air! Nonsense! He don't deserve it! Where's the gentleman? Here he is, coming down the street. Make room there for the gentleman. Is this the boy, sir? Yes. Oliver lay covered with mud and dust, and bleeding from the mouth, looking wildly round upon the heap of faces that surrounded him, when the old gentleman was officiously dragged and pushed into the circle by the foremost of the pursuers. Yes, said the gentleman, I'm afraid it is the boy. Afraid? murmured the crowd. That's a good un. Poor fellow, said the gentleman, he has hurt himself. "'I did that, sir,' said a great lubberly fellow, stepping forward, "'and preciously I cut my knuckle in his mouth. I stopped him, sir.' The fellow touched his hat with a grin, expecting something for his pains. But the old gentleman, eyeing him with an expression of dislike, looked anxiously round, as if he contemplated running away himself, which it is very possible he might have attempted to do, and thus have afforded another chase, had not a police officer— who is generally the last person to arrive in such cases, at that moment made his way through the crowd, and seized Oliver by the collar. "'Come, get up!' said the man roughly. "'It, it wasn't me, indeed, sir. Indeed, indeed. It, it was two other boys,' said Oliver, clasping his hands passionately and looking round. "'They are, they are here somewhere.' "'Oh, no, they ain't,' said the officer. He meant this to be ironical, but it was true besides, for the Dodger and Charlie Bates had filed off down the first convenient court they came to. "'Come, get up!' "'Don't hurt him,' said the old gentleman compassionately. "'Oh, no, I won't hurt him,' replied the officer, tearing his jacket half off his back in proof thereof. "'Come, I know you. It won't do. Will you stand upon your legs, you young devil?' Oliver, who could hardly stand, made a shift to raise himself on his feet, 
and was at once lugged along the streets by the jacket collar at a rapid pace. The gentleman walked on with them by the officer's side, and as many of the crowd as could achieve the feat got a little ahead and stared back at Oliver from time to time. The boys shouted in triumph, and on they went. End of chapter 10《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー and indeed in the immediate neighbourhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets, and down a place called Mutton Hill, when he was led beneath a low archway, and up a dirty court, into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard, into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face, and a bunch of keys in his hand. "'What's the matter now?' said the man carelessly. "'A young fogel hunter replied the man who had Oliver in charge. "'Are you the party that's been robbed, sir?' inquired the man with the keys. "'Yes, I am,' replied the old gentleman. "'But I'm not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. I—I I would rather not press the case.' "'Must go before the magistrate now, sir,' replied the man. "'His worship will be disengaged in half a minute. "'Now, young gallows!' This was an invitation for Oliver to enter through a door which he unlocked as he spoke, and which led into a stone cell. Here he was searched, and nothing being found upon him, locked up. This cell was in shape and size something like an area cellar, only not so light. It was most intolerably dirty, for it was Monday morning, and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since Saturday night. But this is little. In our station houses, men and women are every night confined on the most trivial charges. The word is worth noting. In dungeons, compared with which those in Newgate, occupied by the most atrocious felons, tried, found guilty, and under sentence of death, are palaces. Let any one who doubts this compare the two. The old gentleman looked almost as rueful as Oliver when the key grated in the lock. He turned with a sigh to the book, which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance. "'There is something in that boy's face,' said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away, tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner. "'Something that touches and interests me. Can he be innocent? He, he looked like, by the by," exclaimed the old gentleman, halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky. "'Bless my soul! Where have I seen something like that look before?' After musing for some minutes, the old gentleman walked, with the same meditative face, into a back ante-room opening from the yard and there retiring into a corner, called up before his mind's eye a vast amphitheatre of faces, over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years. "'No,' said the old gentleman, shaking his head, "'it must be imagination.' He wandered over them again. He had called them into view, and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them. There were the faces of friends and foes, and of many that had been almost strangers, peering intrusively from the crowd. There were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women. There were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon, but which the mind, superior to its power, still dressed in their old freshness and beauty, calling back the lustre of the eyes, the brightness of the smile, the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay, and whispering of beauty beyond the tomb, changed but to be heightened, and taken from earth only to be set up as a light, to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven.
but the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which Oliver's features bore a trace. So he heaved a sigh over the recollections he awakened, and being, happily for himself, an absent old gentleman, buried them again in the pages of the musty book. He was roused by a touch on the shoulder, and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office. He closed his book hastily, and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned Mr. Fang. The office was a front parlour, with a panelled wall. Mr. Fang sat behind a bar at the upper end, and on one side the door was a sort of wooden pen, in which poor little Oliver was already deposited, trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene. Mr. Fang was a lean, long-backed, stiff-necked, middle-sized man, with no great quantity of hair, and what he had, growing on the back and sides of his head. His face was stern and much flushed. If he were really not in the habit of drinking, rather more than was exactly good for him, he might have brought action against his countenance for libel, and have recovered heavy damages. The old gentleman bowed respectfully, and advancing to the magistrate's desk, said, suiting the action to the word, "'That is my name and address, sir.' He then withdrew a pace or two, and, with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of the head, waited to be questioned. Now it so happened that Mr. Fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in a newspaper of the morning, adverting to some recent decision of his, and commending him, for the three hundred and fiftieth time, to the special and particular notice of the Secretary of State for the Home Department. He was out of temper, and he looked up with an angry scowl. "'Who are you?' said Mr. Fang. The old gentleman pointed, with some surprise, to his card. "'Officer,' said Mr. Fang, tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper, "'who is this fellow?' "'My name, sir,' said the old gentleman, speaking like a gentleman. "'My name, sir, is Brownlow. Permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to a respectable person under the protection of the bench." Saying this, Mr. Brownell looked around the office, as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information. "'Officer,' said Mr. Fang, throwing the paper on one side, "'what's this fellow charged with?' "'He's not charged at all, Your Worship.' replied the officer. He appears against this boy, your worship." His worship knew this perfectly well, but it was a good annoyance, and a safe one. "'Appears against the boy, does he?' said Mr. Fang, surveying Mr. Brownlow contemptuously from head to foot. "'Swear him. Before I am sworn, I must beg to say one word,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'and that is, that I really never, without actual experience, could have believed— "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang peremptorily. "'I will not, sir,' replied the old gentleman. "'Hold your tongue this instant, or I'll have you turned out of the office,' said Mr. Fang. "'You're an insolent, impertinent fellow. How dare you bully a magistrate!' "'What?' exclaimed the old gentleman, reddening. "'Swear this person,' said Fang to the clerk. "'I'll not hear another word. Swear him.' Mr. Brownlow's indignation was greatly roused, but reflecting, perhaps, that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it, he suppressed his feelings, and submitted to be sworn at once. "'Now,' said Fang, "'what's the charge against this boy? What have you got to say, sir?' "'I was standing at a bookstall,' Mr. Brownlow began. "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang. "'Policeman? Where's the policeman? Yeah, swear this policeman. Now, policeman, what is this?' The policeman, with becoming humility, related how he had taken the charge, how he had searched Oliver, and found nothing on his person, and how that was all he knew about it. "'Are there any witnesses?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'None, Your Worship,' replied the policeman. Mr. Fang sat silent for some minutes, and then, turning round to the prosecutor, said in a towering passion, 
Do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is, man, or do you not? You have been sworn. Now, if you stand there, refusing to give evidence, I'll punish you for disrespect to the bench. I will by— By what, or by whom, nobody knows. For the clerk and jailer coughed very loud, just at the right moment, and the former dropped a heavy book upon the floor, thus preventing the word from being heard, accidentally, of course. With many interruptions and repeated insults, Mr. Brownlow contrived to state his case, observing that, in the surprise of the moment, he had run after the boy, because he saw him running away, and expressing his hope that, if the magistrate should believe him, although not actually the thief, to be connected with the thieves, he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow. "'He has been hurt already,' said the old gentleman in conclusion, "'and I fear,' he added with great energy, looking towards the bar, "'I really fear that he is ill.' "'Oh, yes, I dare say,' said Mr. Fang with a sneer. "'Come, none of your tricks here, you young vagabond. They won't do. What's your name?' Oliver tried to reply, but his tongue failed him. He was deadly pale and the whole place seemed turning round and round. "'What's your name, you hardened scoundrel?' demanded Mr. Fang. "'Officer, what's his name?' This was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat, who was standing by the bar. He bent over Oliver, and repeated the inquiry, but finding him really incapable of understanding the question, and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more, and add to the severity of his sentence, he hazarded a guess. "'He says his name's Tom White, your worship,' said the kind-hearted thief-taker. "'No. Oh, he won't speak out, won't he?' said Fang. "'Very well. Very well. Where does he live?' "'Where he can, your worship,' replied the officer, again pretending to receive Oliver's answer. "'Has he any parents?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'He says they died in his infancy, your worship,' replied the officer, hazarding the usual reply. At this point of the inquiry, Oliver raised his head, and, looking round with imploring eyes, murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water. "'Stuff and nonsense!' said Mr. Fang. "'Don't try to make a fool of me!' "'I think he really is ill, your worship,' remonstrated the officer. "'I know better!' said Mr. Fang. "'Take care of him, officer,' said the old gentleman, raising his hands instinctively. "'He'll fall down.' "'Stand away, officer,' cried Fang. "'Let him, if he likes.' Oliver availed himself of the kind permission, and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. The men in the office looked at each other, but no one dared to stir. "'I knew he was shamming,' said Fang as if this were incontestable proof of the fact. Let him lie there. He'll soon be tired of that. "'How do you propose to deal with the case, sir?' inquired the clerk in a low voice. "'Summarily,' replied Mr. Fang. "'He stands committed for three months. Hard labour, of course. Clear the office.' The door was open for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry the insensible boy to his cell when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office, and advanced towards the bench. Oh, "'Stop! Stop! Don't take him away! For heaven's sake, stop a moment!' cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. Although the presiding genii in such an office as this exercise a summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives, of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poorer class. And although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press. Footnote, or were virtually then. Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. What is this? "'Who is this? Turn this man out! Clear the office!' cried Mr. Fang. "'I will speak!' 
cried the man. "'I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I keep the bookstall. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir.' The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. "'Swear the man!' growled Mr. Fang, with a very ill grace. "'Now, man, what have you got to say?' "'This,' said the man. "'I saw three boys, two others, and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way, when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done, and I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it. Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall keeper proceeded to relate, in a more coherent manner, the exact circumstances of the robbery. "'Why didn't you come here before?' said Fang, after a pause. "'I hadn't a soul to mind the shop,' replied the man. "'Everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit. I could get nobody till five minutes ago, and I've run here all the way.' "'The prosecutor was reading, was he?' inquired Fang, after another pause. "'Yes,' replied the man. "'The very book he has in his hand.' "'Oh, that book, eh?' said Fang. "'Is it paid for?' "'No, it is not,' replied the man, with a smile. "'Dear me, I forgot all about it,' exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently. "'A nice person to prefer a charge against a poor boy,' said Fang, with a comical effort to look humane. "'I consider, sir, that you have obtained possession of that book, under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances, and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute. Let this be a lesson to you, my man, or the law will overtake you yet. The boy is discharged. Clear the office.' "'Dear me!' cried the old gentleman, bursting out with the rage he had kept down so long. "'Dear me! I'll—' "'Clear the office,' said the magistrate. "'Officers, do you hear? Clear the office.' The mandate was obeyed, and the indignant Mr. Brownlow was conveyed out, with the book in one hand, and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment— Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned, and his temples bathed with water, his face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' said Mr. Brownlow, bending over him. "'Call a coach, somebody, pray, directly!' A coach was obtained, and Oliver, having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in, and sat himself on the other. "'May I accompany you?' said the bookstall-keeper, looking in. "'Bless me, yes, my dear sir,' said Mr. Brownlow, quickly. "'I forgot you. Dear, dear, I have this unhappy book still. <laughs> Jump in. Poor fellow, there's no time to lose.' The bookstall-keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Twelve, in which Oliver is taken better care of than he ever was before, and in which the narrative reverts to the merry old gentleman and his youthful friends. The coach rattled away over nearly the same ground as that which Oliver had traversed when he first entered London, in company with the Dodger, and, turning a different way when it reached the Angel at Islington, stopped at length before a neat house in a quiet shady street near Pentonville. Here a bed was prepared, without loss of time, in which Mr. Brownlow saw his young charge carefully and comfortably deposited, and here he was tended with a kindness and solicitude that knew no bounds. But for many days, Oliver remained insensible to all the goodness of his new friends. The sun rose and sank, and rose and sank again, and many times after that. 
and still the boy lay stretched on his uneasy bed, dwindling away beneath the dry and wasting heat of fever. The worm does not work more surely on the dead body, than does this slow creeping fire upon the living frame. Weak and thin and pallid, he awoke at last from what seemed to have been a long and troubled dream. Feebly raising himself in the bed, with his head resting on his trembling arm, he looked anxiously around. "'What room is this? Where have I been brought to?' said Oliver. "'This is not the place I went to sleep in.' He uttered these words in a feeble voice, being very faint and weak, but they were overheard at once. The curtain at the bed's head was hastily drawn back, and a motherly old lady, very neatly and precisely dressed, rose as she undrew it from an armchair close by, in which she had been sitting at needlework. "'Hush, my dear,' said the old lady softly. "'You must be very quiet, or you'll be ill again, and you've been very bad, as bad as bad could be, pretty nigh. Lie down again, there's a dear.' With those words, the old lady very gently placed Oliver's head upon the pillow, and, smoothing back his hair from his forehead, looked so kindly and loving in his face, that he could not help placing his little withered hand in hers, and drawing it round his neck. "'Save us!' said the old lady, with tears in her eyes. "'What a grateful little dear it is! Pretty creature! What would his mother feel if she had sat by him as I have, and could see him now?' "'Perhaps she does see me,' whispered Oliver, folding his hands together. "'Perhaps she has sat by me. I almost feel as if she had.' "'That was the fever, my dear,' said the old lady mildly. "'I suppose it was,' replied Oliver, "'because heaven is a long way off.' and they are too happy there to come down to the bedside of a poor boy. But if she knew I was ill, she must have pitied me even there, for she was very ill herself before she died. She can't know anything about me, though," added Oliver, after a moment's silence, if she had seen me hurt, it would have made her sorrowful and her face has always looked sweet and happy when I have dreamed of her." The old lady made no reply to this, but wiping her eyes first, and her spectacles, which lay on the counterpane afterwards, as if they were part and parcel of those features, brought some cool stuff for Oliver to drink, and then, patting him on the cheek, told him he must lie very quiet, or he would be ill again. So. Oliver kept very still, partly because he was anxious to obey the kind old lady in all things, and partly, to tell the truth, because he was completely exhausted with what he had already said. He soon fell into a gentle doze, from which he was awakened by the light of a candle, which, being brought near the bed, showed him a gentleman with a very large and loud ticking gold watch in his hand, who felt his pulse, and said he was a great deal better. "'You are her a great deal better, are you not, my dear?' said the gentleman. "'Yes, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Yes, I know you are,' said the gentleman. "'You're hungry, too, aren't you?' "'No, sir,' answered Oliver. <clears throat> said the gentleman. "'No, I know you're not. He is not hungry, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the gentleman, looking very wise. The old lady made a respectful inclination of the head which seemed to say that she thought the doctor was a very clever man. The doctor appeared much of the same opinion himself. Uh, "'You feel sleepy, don't you, my dear?' said the doctor. "'No, sir,' replied Oliver. "'No,' said the doctor, with a very shrewd and satisfied look. "'You're not sleepy, <laughs> nor thirsty, are you?' "'Oh, yes, sir. Rather thirsty,' answered Oliver. "'Just as I expected, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the doctor. It's very natural that he should be thirsty. You may give him a little tea, ma'am, and some dry toast without any butter. Don't keep him too warm, ma'am, but be careful that you don't let him be too cold. Will you have the goodness?" The old lady dropped a curtsey. 
The doctor, after tasting the cool stuff, and expressing a qualified approval of it, hurried away, his boots creaking in a very important and wealthy manner as he went downstairs. Oliver dozed off again soon after this. When he awoke, it was nearly twelve o'clock. The old lady tenderly bade him good-night shortly afterwards, and left him in charge of a fat old woman who had just come, bringing with her, in a little bundle, a small prayer-book and a large nightcap. Putting the latter on her head, and the former on the table, the old woman, after telling Oliver that she had come to sit up with him, drew her chair close to the fire, and went off into a series of short naps, chequered at frequent intervals with sundry tumblings forward, and diverse moans and chokings. These, however, had no worse effect than causing her to rub her nose very hard, and then fall asleep again. And thus the night crept slowly on. Oliver lay awake for some time, counting the little circles of light which the reflection of the rush-light shade threw upon the ceiling, or tracing with his languid eyes the intricate pattern of the paper on the wall. The darkness and the deep stillness of the room were very solemn, as they brought into the boy's mind the thought that death had been hovering there for many days and nights, and might yet fill it with the gloom and dread of his awful presence. He turned his face upon the pillow, and fervently prayed to heaven. Gradually he fell into that deep, tranquil sleep, which ease from recent suffering alone imparts, that calm and peaceful rest which it is pain to wake from. Who, if this were death, would be roused again to all the struggles and turmoils of life, to all its cares for the present, its anxieties for the future, more than all, its weary recollections of the past. It had been bright day for hours when Oliver opened his eyes. He felt cheerful and happy. The crisis of the disease was safely past. He belonged to the world again. In three days' time he was able to sit in an easy chair, well propped up with pillows, and, as he was still too weak to walk, Mrs. Bedwin had him carried downstairs into the little housekeeper's room, which belonged to her. Having him set here by the fireside, the good old lady sat herself down too, and, being in a state of considerable delight at seeing him so much better, forthwith began to cry most violently. "'Oh, never mind me, my dear,' said the old lady. "'I'm only having a, a regular good cry. There. It's, uh, it's all over now, and I'm quite comfortable.' "'You're very, very kind to me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'Well, never you mind that, my dear.' said the old lady. That's got nothing to do with your broth, and it's full time you had it, for the doctor says Mr. Brownlow may come in to see you this morning, and we must get up our best looks, because the better we look, the more he'll be pleased." And with this the old lady applied herself to warming up, in a little saucepan, a basin full of broth, strong enough, Oliver thought, to furnish an ample dinner, when reduced to the regulation strength for three hundred and fifty paupers at the lowest computation. "'Are you fond of pictures, dear?' inquired the old lady, seeing that Oliver had fixed his eyes most intently on a portrait which hung against the wall, just opposite his chair. "'I don't quite know, ma'am,' said Oliver, without taking his eyes from the canvas. "'I have seen so few that I hardly know. What a beautiful, mild face that lady's is!' "'Ah!' said the old lady. Painters always make ladies out prettier than they are, or they wouldn't get any custom, child. The man that invented the machine for taking likenesses might have known that would never succeed. It's a deal too honest. A deal," said the old lady, laughing very heartily at her own acuteness. "'Is that a likeness, ma'am?' said Oliver. "'Yes,' said the old lady, looking up for a moment from the broth. "'That's a portrait.' "'Whose, ma'am?' asked Oliver. "'Why, really, my dear, I don't know,' answered the old lady in a good-humoured manner. "'It's not a likeness of anybody that you or I know, I expect. It seems to strike your fancy, dear.' "'It is so pretty,' replied Oliver. "'Why, sure you're not afraid of it,' said the old lady, observing in great surprise the look of awe with which the child regarded the painting. "'Oh, no, no!' returned Oliver quickly. But the eyes look so sorrowful, and where I sit, 
they seem fixed upon me. It makes my heart beat, added Oliver, in a low voice, as if it was alive, and wanted to speak to me, but couldn't. Lord save us! exclaimed the old lady, starting. Don't talk in that way, child. You're weak and nervous after your illness. Let me wheel your chair round to the other side, and then you won't see it. There, said the old lady, suiting the action to the word. You don't see it now at all events. Oliver did see it in his mind's eye, as distinctly as if he had not altered his position. But he thought it better not to worry the kind old lady. So he smiled gently when she looked at him, and Mrs. Bedwin, satisfied that he felt more comfortable, salted and broke bits of toasted bread into the broth, with all the bustle befitting so solemn a preparation. Oliver got through it with extraordinary expedition. He had scarcely swallowed the last spoonful, when there came a soft rap at the door. "'Come in,' said the old lady, and in walked Mr. Brownlow. Now the old gentleman came in as brisk as need be, but he had no sooner raised his spectacles on his forehead, and thrust his hands behind the skirts of his dressing-gown to take a good long look at Oliver, than his countenance underwent a very great variety of odd contortions. Oliver looked very worn and shadowy from sickness, and made an ineffectual attempt to stand up, out of respect to his benefactor, which terminated in his sinking back into the chair again. And the fact is, if the truth must be told, that Mr. Brownlow's heart, being large enough for any six ordinary old gentlemen of humane disposition, forced a supply of tears into his eyes by some hydraulic process which we are not sufficiently philosophical to be in a condition to explain. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' <coughs> said Mr. Brownlow, clearing his throat. "'I'm rather hoarse this morning, Mrs. Bedwin. I'm afraid I've caught a cold.' "'I hope not, sir,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Everything you have had has been well aired, sir.' "'I don't know, Bedwin. I don't know.' said Mr. Brownlow. I rather think I had a damp napkin at dinner-time yesterday. But never mind that. How do you feel, my dear?" "'Very happy, sir,' replied Oliver. "'And very grateful indeed, sir, for your goodness to me.' "'Good boy,' said Mr. Brownlow stoutly. "'Have you given him any nourishment, Bedwin? Any slops, eh?' "'He has just had a basin of beautiful strong broth, sir,' replied Mrs. Bedwin drawing herself up slightly, and laying strong emphasis on the last word, to intimate that between slops and broth well compounded, there existed no affinity or connection whatsoever. "'Ugh!' said Mr. Brownlow, with a slight shudder. "'A couple of glasses of port wine would have done him a great deal more good, wouldn't they, Tom White, eh?' "'My name is Oliver, sir,' replied the little invalid, with a look of great astonishment. Oliver? said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver what? Oliver White, eh? No, sir. Twist. Oliver Twist. Queer name, said the old gentleman. What made you tell the magistrate your name was White? I never told him so, sir, returned Oliver in amazement. This sounded so like a falsehood that the old gentleman looked somewhat sternly in Oliver's face. It was impossible to doubt him. There was truth in every one of its thin and sharpened lineaments. "'Some mistake,' said Mr. Brownlow. But although his motive for looking steadily at Oliver no longer existed, the old idea of the resemblance between his features and some familiar face came upon him so strongly that he could not withdraw his gaze. "'I hope you are not angry with me, sir,' said Oliver, raising his eyes beseechingly. "'No, no,' replied the old gentleman. "'Why, what's this? Bedwin, look there!' As he spoke, he pointed hastily to the picture over Oliver's head, and then to the boy's face. There was its living copy. The eyes, the head, the mouth, every feature was the same. The expression was, for the instant, so precisely alike that the minutest line seemed copied with startling accuracy. Oliver knew not the cause of this sudden exclamation, for, not being strong enough to bear the start it gave him, 
he fainted away. A weakness on his part, which affords the narrative an opportunity of relieving the reader from suspense, in behalf of the two young pupils of the merry old gentleman, and of recording, that when the Dodger and his accomplished friend Master Bates joined in the hue and cry which was raised at Oliver's heels, in consequence of their executing an illegal conveyance of Mr. Brownlow's personal property, as has been already described, they were actuated by a very laudable and becoming regard for themselves, and forasmuch as the freedom of the subject, and the liberty of the individual, are among the first and proudest boasts of a true-hearted Englishman, so, I need hardly beg the reader to observe, that this action should tend to exalt them, in the opinion of all public and patriotic men, in almost as great a degree, as this strong proof of their anxiety for their own preservation and safety goes to corroborate and confirm the little code of laws which certain profound and sound judging philosophers have laid down as the mainsprings of all nature's deeds and actions. The said philosophers very wisely reducing the good lady's proceedings to matters of maxim and theory, and, by a very neat and pretty compliment to her exalted wisdom and understanding, putting entirely out of sight any considerations of heart, or generous impulse and feeling. For, these are matters totally beneath a female, who is acknowledged by universal admission to be far above the numerous little foibles and weaknesses of her sex. If I wanted any further proof of the strictly philosophical nature of the conduct of these young gentlemen in their very delicate predicament, I should at once find it in the fact, also recorded in a foregoing part of this narrative, of their quitting the pursuit when the general attention was fixed upon Oliver, and making immediately for their home by the shortest possible cut. Although I do not mean to assert that it is usually the practice of renowned and learned sages to shorten the road to any great conclusion, their course indeed being rather to lengthen the distance by various circumlocutions, and discursive staggerings, like unto those in which drunken men, under the pressure of a too mighty flow of ideas, are prone to indulge. Still, I do mean to say, and do say distinctly, that it is the invariable practice of many mighty philosophers, in carrying out their theories, to evince great wisdom and foresight in providing against every possible contingency which can be supposed at all likely to affect themselves. Thus, to do a great right, you may do a little wrong, and you may take any means which the end to be attained will justify. The amount of the right, or the amount of the wrong, or indeed the distinction between the two, being left entirely to the philosopher concerned, to be settled and determined by his clear, comprehensive, and impartial view of his own particular case. It was not until the two boys had scoured, with great rapidity, through a most intricate maze of narrow streets and courts, that they ventured to halt beneath a low and dark archway. Having remained silent here, just long enough to recover breath to speak, Master Bates uttered an exclamation of amusement and delight, and, bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter, flung himself upon a doorstep, and rolled thereon in a transport of mirth. "'What's the matter?' inquired the Dodger. <laughs> roared Charlie Bates. "'How's your noise?' remonstrated the Dodger, looking cautiously around. "'Do you want to be grabbed, stupid?' <laughs> "'I can't help it,' said Charlie. Oh, "'I can't help it to see him splitting away at that pace, and getting round the corners, and knocking, knocking up again the post, and starting on again as if he was made of iron as well as <laughs> and me, with a wipe in me pocket, singing out after him, oh, my eye. The vivid imagination of Master Bates presented the scene before him in two strong colours. As he arrived at this apostrophe, he again rolled upon the doorstep, and laughed louder than before. "'What'll Fagin say?' inquired the Dodger, taking advantage of the next interval of breathlessness on the part of his friend to propound the question— "'What?' repeated Charlie Bates. "'Ah, oh, what?' said the Dodger. "'Why, what should he say?' inquired Charlie, stopping rather suddenly in his merriment, for the Dodger's manner was impressive. "'What should he say?' Mr. Dawkins whistled for a couple of minutes, then, taking off his hat, 
scratched his head and nodded thrice. "'What do you mean?' said Charlie. "'To Raloo, Raloo, gammon and spinach, the frog he wouldn't, and I cockalorum,' said the Dodger, with a light sneer on his intellectual countenance. This was explanatory, but not satisfactory. Master Bates felt it so, and again said, "'What do you mean?' The Dodger made no reply, but putting his hat on again, and gathering the skirts of his long-tailed coat under his arm, thrust his tongue into his cheek, slapped the bridge of his nose some half-dozen times in a familiar but expressive manner, and turning on his heel, slunk down the court. Master Bates followed, with a thoughtful countenance. The noise of footsteps on the creaking stairs, a few minutes after the occurrence of this conversation, roused the merry old gentleman, as he sat over the fire with a saveloy and a small loaf in his hand, a pocket-knife in his right, and a pewter-pot on the trivet. There was a rascally smile on his white face as he turned round, and, looking sharply out from under his thick red eyebrows, bent his ear towards the door and listened. "'Why, how's this?' muttered the Jew, changing countenance. "'Only two of them. Where's the third? They can't have got into trouble. Hark!' The footsteps approached nearer. They reached the landing. The door was slowly opened and the Dodger and Charlie Bates entered, closing it behind them. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens – Chapter 13 Some new acquaintances are introduced to the intelligent reader connected with whom various pleasant matters are related, appertaining to this history. "'Where's Oliver?' said the Jew, rising with a menacing look. "'Where's the boy?' The young thieves eyed their preceptor, as if they were alarmed at his violence, and looked uneasily at each other, but they made no reply. "'What's become of the boy?' said the Jew, seizing the Dodger tightly by the collar and threatening him with horrid imprecations. "'Speak out, or I'll throttle you!' Mr. Fagin looked so very much in earnest, that Charlie Bates, who deemed it prudent in all cases to be on the safe side, and who conceived it by no means improbable that it might be his turn to be throttled second, dropped upon his knees, and raised a loud, well-sustained and continuous roar, something between a mad bull and a speaking-trumpet. "'Will you speak?' thundered the Jew, shaking the Dodger so much that his keeping in the big coat at all seemed perfectly miraculous. "'Why, the traps have got him, and that's all about it,' said the Dodger sullenly. "'Come, let go of me, will you?' And swinging himself at one jerk, clean out of the big coat which he left in the Jew's hands, the Dodger snatched up the toasting-fork and made a pass at the merry old gentleman's waistcoat, which, if it had taken effect, would have let a little more merriment out, and could have been easily replaced. The Jew stepped back in this emergency, with more agility than could have been anticipated in a man of his apparent decrepitude, and, seizing up the pot, prepared to hurl it at his assailant's head. But Charlie Bates, at this moment, calling his attention by a perfectly terrific howl, he suddenly altered its destination, and flung it full at that young gentleman. "'Why, what the blazes is in the wind now?' growled a deep voice. "'Who pitched that ear at me? It's well it's beer, and not the pot as it me, or I'd have settled somebody. I might have knowed, as nobody but an infernal rich plundering, thundering old Jew, could afford to throw away any drink but water, and not that, unless he'd done the river company every quarter. What's it all about, Fagin? Damn me if my neck handkerchief ain't lined with beer. Come in, you sneaking warmint. What are you stopping outside for, as if you was ashamed of your master? Come in." The man who growled out these words, was a stoutly built fellow of about five-and-thirty, in a black velveteen coat, very soiled drab breeches, 
lace-up half-boots, and grey cotton stockings, which enclosed a bulky pair of legs, with large swelling calves. The kind of legs which in such costume always look in an unfinished and incomplete state, without a set of fetters to garnish them. He had a brown hat on his head, and a dirty belcher handkerchief round his neck, with the long frayed ends of which he smeared the beer from his face as he spoke. He disclosed, when he had done so, a broad, heavy countenance with a beard of three days' growth, and two scowling eyes, one of which displayed various party-coloured symptoms of having been recently damaged by a blow. "'Come in, dear here,' growled this engaging ruffian. A white shaggy dog, with his face scratched and torn in twenty different places, skulked into the room. "'Why didn't you come in afore?' said the man. "'You're getting too proud to own me afore company, are you? Lie down!' This command was accompanied with a kick, which sent the animal to the other end of the room. He appeared well used to it, however, for he coiled himself up in a corner very quietly, without uttering a sound, and winking his very ill-looking eyes twenty times in a minute, appeared to occupy himself in taking a survey of the apartment. "'What are you up to? Ill-treating the boys, you covetous, avaricious, insatiable old fence,' said the man, seating himself deliberately. "'I wonder they don't murder you. I would, if I was them. If I'd been your prentice, I'd have done it long ago. And, no, I couldn't have sold you afterwards, for you're fit for nothing but keeping as a curiosity of ugliness in a glass bottle. And I suppose they don't blow glass bottles large enough.' "'Hush, hush, Mr. Sykes,' said the Jew, trembling. "'Don't speak so loud.' "'None of your mistering,' replied the ruffian. "'You always mean mischief when you come that. "'You know my name. Out with it. "'I shan't disgrace it when the time comes.' "'Well, well, then, Bill Sykes,' said the Jew, with abject humility, "'you seem out of humour, Bill.' "'Perhaps I am,' replied Sykes. I should think you was rather out of sorts, too, unless you mean as little arm when you throw pewter pots about as you do when you blab and— Are you mad? said the Jew, catching the man by the sleeve and pointing towards the boys. Mr. Sykes contented himself with tying an imaginary knot under his left ear, and jerking his head over on the right shoulder, a piece of dumb show which the Jew appeared to understand perfectly. He then— in cant terms, with which his whole conversation was plentifully besprinkled, but which would be quite unintelligible if they were recorded here, demanded a glass of liquor. "'And mind you don't poison it,' said Mr. Sykes, laying his hat upon the table. This was said in jest, but if the speaker could have seen the evil leer with which the Jew bit his pale lip as he turned round to the cupboard, he might have thought the caution not wholly unnecessary or the wish, at all events, to improve upon the distiller's ingenuity, not very far from the old gentleman's merry heart. After swallowing two or three glasses of spirits, Mr. Sykes condescended to take some notice of the young gentleman, which gracious act led to a conversation, in which the cause and manner of Oliver's capture were circumstantially detailed, with such alterations and improvements on the truth as to the dodger appeared most advisable under the circumstances. "'I'm afraid,' said the Jew, "'that he may say something which will get us into trouble.' "'That's very likely,' returned Sykes with a malicious grin. "'You're blowed upon, Fagin.' "'And I'm afraid, you see,' added the Jew, speaking as if he had not noticed the interruption and regarding the other closely as he did so. "'I'm afraid that, if the game was up with us, it might be up with a good many more, and that it would come out rather worse for you than it would for me, my dear.' The man started, and turned round upon the Jew, but the old gentleman's shoulders were shrugged up to his ears, and his eyes were vacantly staring on the opposite wall. There was a long pause. Every member of the respectable coterie 
appeared plunged in his own reflections, not excepting the dog, who by a certain malicious licking of his lips seemed to be meditating an attack upon the legs of the first gentleman or lady he might encounter in the streets when he went out. "'Somebody must find out what's been done in the office,' said Mr. Sykes, in a much lower tone than he had taken since he came in. The Jew nodded assent. "'If he hasn't peached, and is committed, it's no fear till he comes out again,' said Mr. Sykes. "'And then he must be taken care on. You must get hold of him somehow.' Again the Jew nodded. The prudence of this line of action, indeed, was obvious, but unfortunately there was one very strong objection to its being adopted. This was that the Dodger and Charlie Bates, and Fagin and Mr. William Sykes, happened, one and all, to entertain a violent and deeply rooted antipathy to going near a police office on any ground or pretext whatever. How long they might have sat and looked at each other in a state of uncertainty, not the most pleasant of its kind, it is difficult to guess. It is not necessary to make any guesses on the subject, however, for the sudden entrance of the two young ladies, whom Oliver had seen on a former occasion, caused the conversation to flow afresh. "'The very thing,' said the Jew. "'Bet will go, won't you, my dear?' "'Where's?' inquired the young lady. "'Only just up to the office, my dear.' said the Jew, coaxingly. It is due to the young lady to say that she did not positively affirm that she would not, but that she merely expressed an emphatic and earnest desire to be blessed if she would, a polite and delicate evasion of the request, which shows the young lady to have been possessed of that natural good breeding which cannot bear to inflict upon a fellow-creature the pain of a direct and pointed refusal. The Jew's countenance fell. He turned from this young lady, who was gaily, not to say gorgeously, attired, in a red gown, green boots, and yellow curl-papers, to the other female. "'Nancy, my dear,' said the Jew, in a soothing manner, "'what do you say?' "'That it won't do, so it's no use of trying it on, Fagin,' replied Nancy. "'What do you mean by that?' said Mr. Sykes looking up in a surly manner. "'What I say, Bill,' replied the lady collectedly. "'Why, you're just a very person for it,' reasoned Mr. Sykes. "'Nobody about here knows anything of you.' "'And as I don't want him to, neither,' replied Nancy, in the same composed manner, "'it's rather more no than yes with me, Bill.' "'She'll go, Fagin,' said Sykes. "'No, she won't, Fagin,' said Nancy. "'Yes.' "'She will, Fagin,' said Sykes. And Mr. Sykes was right. By dint of alternate threats, promises, and bribes, the lady in question was ultimately prevailed upon to undertake the commission. She was not, indeed, withheld by the same considerations as her agreeable friend, for, having recently removed into the neighbourhood of Field Lane, from the remote but genteel suburb of Ratcliffe, she was not under the same apprehension of being recognised by any of her numerous acquaintances. Accordingly, with a clean white apron tied over her gown, and her curl-papers tucked up under a straw bonnet, both articles of dress being provided from the Jew's inexhaustible stock, Miss Nancy prepared to issue forth on her errand. "'Stop a minute, my dear,' said the Jew, producing a little covered basket. "'Carry that in one hand.' It looks more respectable, my dear. Give her a door key to carry in her t'other one, Fagin, said Sykes. It looks real and genuine like. Yes, yes, my dear, so it does, said the Jew, hanging a large street door key on the forefinger of the young lady's right hand. There, very good, very good indeed, my dear, said the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'Oh, my brother! My poor dear, sweet, innocent little brother!' exclaimed Nancy, bursting into tears and wringing the little basket and the street-door key in an agony of distress. "'What has become of him? 
where have they taken him to? Oh, do have pity, and tell me what's been done with the dear boy, gentlemen. Do, gentlemen, if you please, gentlemen. Ah! Having uttered those words in a most lamentable and heartbroken tone, to the immeasurable delight of her hearers, Miss Nancy paused, winked to the company, nodded smilingly round, and disappeared. Ah, she's a clever girl, my dears, said the Jew, turning round to his young friends, and shaking his head gravely, as if in mute admonition to them to follow the bright example they had just beheld. She's a honour to her sex, said Mr. Sykes, filling his glass and smiting the table with his enormous fist. Here is her health, and wishing they was all like her. While these, and many other encomiums, were being passed on the accomplished Nancy, that young lady made the best of her way to the police office, whither, notwithstanding a little natural timidity consequent upon walking through the streets alone and unprotected, she arrived in perfect safety shortly afterwards. Entering by the back way, she tapped softly with the key at one of the cell doors and listened. There was no sound within, so she coughed and listened again. Still there was no reply, so she spoke. "'Nolly, dear,' murmured Nancy in a gentle voice. "'Nolly!' There was nobody inside but a miserable, shoeless criminal, who had been taken up for playing the flute, and who, the offence against society having been clearly proved, had been very properly committed by Mr. Fang to the House of Correction for one month, with the appropriate and amusing remark that since he had so much breath to spare, it would be more wholesomely expended on the treadmill than in a musical instrument. He made no answer, being occupied mentally bewailing the loss of the flute, which had been confiscated for the use of the county. So Nancy passed on to the next cell, and knocked there. "'Well,' cried a faint and feeble voice, "'is there a little boy here?' inquired Nancy, with a preliminary sob. "'No,' replied the voice. "'God forbid!' This was a vagrant of sixty-five, who was going to prison for not playing the flute, or, in other words, for begging in the streets, and doing nothing for his livelihood. In the next cell was another man, who was going to the same prison for hawking tin saucepans without license, thereby doing something for his living, in defiance of the stamp office. But as neither of these criminals answered to the name of Oliver, or knew anything about him, Nancy made straight up to the bluff officer in the striped waistcoat, and with the most piteous wailings and lamentations, rendered more piteously by a prompt and efficient use of the street-door key, and the little basket, demanded her own dear brother. "'I haven't got him, my dear,' said the old man. "'Where is he?' screamed Nancy in a distracted manner. "'Why, the gentleman's got him,' replied the officer. "'What gentleman?' "'Oh, gracious heavens! What gentleman!' exclaimed Nancy. In reply to this incoherent questioning, the old man informed the deeply affected sister that Oliver had been taken ill in the office, and discharged in consequence of a witness having proved the robbery to have been committed by another boy, not in custody, and that the prosecutor had carried him away, in an insensible condition, to his own residence, of and concerning which all the informant knew was that it was somewhere in Pentonville, he having heard that word mentioned in the directions to the coachman. In a dreadful state of doubt and uncertainty, the agonised young woman staggered to the gate, and then, exchanging her faltering walk for a swift run, returned by the most devious and complicated route she could think of, to the domicile of the Jew. Mr. Bill Sykes no sooner heard the account of the expedition delivered, than he very hastily called up the white dog, and, putting on his hat, expeditiously departed, without devoting any time to the formality of wishing the company good morning. "'We must know where he is, my dears. He must be found,' said the Jew, greatly excited. "'Charlie, do nothing but skulk about, till you bring home some news of him. Nancy, my dear, I must have him found. I trust to you, my dear.' to you and the artful for everything. Stay, stay," added the Jew, unlocking a drawer with a shaking hand. 
There's money, my dears. I shall shut up this shop to-night. You'll know where to find me. Don't stop here a minute, not an instant, my dears. With these words, he pushed them from the room, and carefully double-locking and barring the door behind them, drew from its place of concealment the box which he had unintentionally disclosed to Oliver. Then he hastily proceeded to dispose the watches and jewellery beneath his clothing. A rap at the door startled him in this occupation. "'Who's there?' he cried in a shrill tone. "'Me,' replied the voice of the Dodger through the keyhole. "'What now?' cried the Jew impatiently. "'Is he to be kidnapped to the other ken, Nancy says?' inquired the Dodger. "'Yes,' replied the Jew. "'Wherever she lays hands on him, find him, find him out, that's all. I shall know what to do next. Never fear.' The boy murmured a reply of intelligence, and hurried downstairs after his companions. "'He has not peached so far,' said the Jew, as he pursued his occupation. "'If he means to blab us among his new friends, we may stop his mouth yet.' End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter fourteen. Comprising further particulars of Oliver's stay at Mr. Brownlow's, with the remarkable prediction which one Mr. Grimwig uttered concerning him when he went out on an errand. Oliver soon recovering from the fainting fit into which Mr. Brownlow's abrupt exclamation had thrown him, the subject of the picture was carefully avoided, both by the old gentleman and Mrs. Bedwin, in the conversation that ensued, which indeed bore no reference to Oliver's history or prospects, but was confined to such topics as might amuse without exciting him. He was still too weak to get up to breakfast, but when he came down into the housekeeper's room next day, his first act was to cast an eager glance at the wall, in the hope of again looking on the face of the beautiful lady. His expectations were disappointed, however, for the picture had been removed. "'Ah!' said the housekeeper, watching the direction of Oliver's eyes. "'It is gone, you see.' "'I see it is, ma'am,' replied Oliver. "'Why have they taken it away?' "'It has been taken down, child, because Mr. Brownlow said that as it seemed to worry you, Perhaps it might prevent your getting well, you know," rejoined the old lady. "'Oh, no, indeed. It didn't worry me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'I liked to see it. I quite loved it.' "'Well, well,' said the old lady, good-humouredly, "'you get well as fast as ever you can, dear, and it shall be hung up again. There, I promise you that. Now let us talk about something else.' This was all the information Oliver could obtain about the picture at that time. As the old lady had been so kind to him in his illness, he endeavoured to think no more of the subject just then. So he listened attentively to a great many stories she told him, about an amiable and handsome daughter of hers, who was married to an amiable and handsome man, and lived in the country, and about a son, who was a clerk to a merchant in the West Indies, and who was also such a good young man and wrote such dutiful letters home four times a year, that it brought the tears into her eyes to talk about them. When the old lady had expatiated a long time, on the excellences of her children, and the merits of her kind good husband besides, who had been dead and gone, poor dear soul, just six and twenty years, it was time to have tea. After tea she began to teach Oliver cribbage, which he learned as quickly as she could teach and at which game they played with great interest and gravity, until it was time for the invalid to have some warm wine and water, with a slice of dry toast, and then to go cosily to bed. They were happy days, those of Oliver's recovery. Everything was so quiet and neat and orderly, everybody so kind and gentle, that after the noise and turbulence in the midst of which he had always lived, it seemed like heaven itself. He was no sooner strong enough to put his clothes on properly, and Mr. Brownlow caused a complete new suit, and a new cap, 
and a new pair of shoes to be provided for him. As Oliver was told that he might do what he liked with the old clothes, he gave them to a servant, who had been very kind to him, and asked her to sell them to a Jew, and keep the money for herself. This she very readily did, and as Oliver looked out of the parlour window, and saw the Jew roll them up in his bag and walk away, he felt quite delighted to think that they were safely gone, and that there was now no possible danger of his ever being able to wear them again. They were sad rags, to tell the truth, and Oliver had never had a new suit before. One evening, about a week after the affair of the picture, as he was sitting talking to Mrs. Bedwin, there came a message down from Mr. Brownlow, that if Oliver Twist felt pretty well, he should like to see him in his study, and talk to him a little while. "'Bless us, and save us! Wash your hands, and let me part your hair nicely for you, child,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Dear heart alive! If we had known he would have asked for you, we would have put you a clean collar on, and made you as smart as sixpence.' Oliver did as the old lady bade him, and although she lamented grievously, meanwhile, that there was not even time to crimp the little frill that bordered his shirt-collar, he looked so delicate and handsome, despite that important personal advantage, that she went so far as to say, looking at him with great complacency from head to foot, that she really didn't think it would have been possible, on the longest notice, to have made much difference in him for the better. Thus encouraged, Oliver tapped at the study door. On Mr. Brownlow calling to him to come in, he found himself in a little back room, quite full of books, with a window looking into some pleasant little gardens. There was a table drawn up before the window, at which Mr. Brownlow was seated reading. When he saw Oliver, he pushed the book away from him, and told him to come near the table and sit down. Oliver complied, marvelling where the people could be found to read such a great number of books as seemed to be written to make the world wiser, which is still a marvel to more experienced people than Oliver Twist, every day of their lives. "'There are a good many books, are there not, my boy?' said Mr. Brownlow, observing the curiosity with which Oliver surveyed the shelves that reached from the floor to the ceiling. "'A great number, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I never saw so many.' "'You shall read them if you behave well,' said the old gentleman kindly, "'and you will like that, better than looking at the outsides, that is, some cases.' "'because there are books of which the backs and covers are by far the best parts.' "'I suppose they are those heavy ones, sir,' said Oliver, pointing to some large quartos, with a good deal of gilding about the binding. "'Not always those,' said the old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head, and smiling as he did so. "'There are other equally heavy ones, though of a much smaller size.' How should you like to grow up a clever man, and write books, eh?" "'I think I would rather read them, sir,' replied Oliver. "'What? Wouldn't you like to be a book-writer?' said the old gentleman. Oliver considered a little while, and at last said he should think it would be a much better thing to be a bookseller, upon which the old gentleman laughed heartily, and declared he had said a very good thing which Oliver felt glad to have done, though he by no means knew what it was. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman, composing his features, "'don't be afraid. We won't make an author of you, while there's an honest trade to be learnt, or brick-making to turn to.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Oliver. At the earnest manner of his reply, the old gentleman laughed again, and said something about a curious instinct which Oliver, not understanding, paid no very great attention to. "'Now,' said Mr. Brownlow, speaking if possible in a kinder, but at the same time in a much more serious manner than Oliver had ever known him assume yet, "'I want you to pay great attention, my boy, to what I am going to say. I shall talk to you without any reserve, because I am sure you are well able to understand me, as many older persons would be.' "'Oh, don't tell you are going to send me away, sir, pray!' exclaimed Oliver, alarmed at the serious tone of the old gentleman's commencement. "'Don't turn me out of doors to wander in the streets again. Let me stay here and be a servant. Don't send me back to the wretched place I came from, 
have mercy upon a poor boy, sir.' "'My dear child,' said the old gentleman, moved by the warmth of Oliver's sudden appeal, "'you need not be afraid of my deserting you, unless you give me cause.' "'I never, never will, sir,' interposed Oliver. "'I hope not,' rejoined the old gentleman. "'I do not think you ever will. I have been deceived before in the objects whom I have endeavoured to benefit, but I feel strongly disposed to trust you, nevertheless, and I am more interested in your behalf than I can well account for, even to myself. The persons on whom I have bestowed my dearest love lie deep in their graves, but although the happiness and delight of my life lie buried there too, I have not made a coffin of my heart, and sealed it up for ever on my best affections. Deep affliction has but strengthened and refined them." As the old gentleman said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companion, and as he remained silent for a short time afterwards, Oliver sat quite still. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman at length, in a more cheerful tone, "'I only say this because you have a young heart, and knowing that I have suffered great pain and sorrow, you will be more careful, perhaps, not to wound me again. You say you are an orphan, without a friend in the world. All the inquiries I have been able to make confirm the statement. Let me hear your story, where you come from, who brought you up, and how you got into the company in which I found you. Speak the truth, and you shall not be friendless while I live." Oliver's sobs checked his utterance for some minutes, when he was on the point of beginning to relate how he had been brought up at the farm, and carried to the workhouse by Mr. Bumble, a peculiarly impatient little double-knock was heard at the street door, and the servant, running upstairs, announced Mr. Grimwig. "'Is he coming up?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. He asked if there were any muffins in the house, and when I told him yes, he said he had come to tea." Mr. Brownlow smiled, and turning to Oliver, said that Mr. Grimwig was an old friend of his, and he must not mind his being a little rough in his manners, for he was a worthy creature at bottom, as he had reason to know. "'Shall I go downstairs, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'No,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather you remained here.' At this moment, there walked into the room, supporting himself by a thick stick, a stout old gentleman, rather lame in one leg, who was dressed in a blue coat, striped waistcoat, nankeen breeches, and gaiters, and a broad-brimmed white hat with the sides turned up with green. A very small plaited shirt-frill stuck out from his waistcoat, and a very long steel watch-chain, with nothing but a key at the end, dangled loosely below it. The ends of his white neckerchief were twisted into a ball, about the size of an orange. The variety of shapes into which his countenance was twisted defy description. He had a manner of screwing his head on one side when he spoke, and of looking out of the corners of his eyes at the same time, which irresistibly reminded the beholder of a parrot. In this attitude he fixed himself the moment he made his appearance, and, holding out a small piece of orange peel at arm's length, exclaimed in a growling, discontented voice, "'Look here! Do you see this? Isn't it a most wonderful and extraordinary thing that I can't call at a man's house, but I find a piece of this poor surgeon's friend on the staircase? I've been lamed with orange peel once, and I know orange peel will be my death, or I'll be content to eat my own head, sir.' This was the handsome offer with which Mr. Grimwig backed and confirmed nearly every assertion he made and it was the more singular in his case, because even admitting for the sake of argument, the possibility of scientific improvements being brought to that pass which will enable a gentleman to eat his own head, in the event of his being so disposed, Mr. Grimwig's head was such a particularly large one, that the most sanguine man alive could hardly entertain a hope of being able to get through it at a sitting, to put entirely out of the question a very thick coating of powder. "'I'll eat my head, sir,' repeated Mr. Grimwig, striking his stick upon the ground. "'Hello! What's that?' Looking at Oliver, and retreating a pace or two. "'This is young Oliver Twist, whom we were speaking about,' 
said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver bowed. "'You don't mean to say that's the boy who had the fever, I hope?' said Mr. Grimwig, recalling a little more. "'Wait a minute. Don't speak. Stop!' continued Mr. Grimwig, abruptly losing all dread of the fever in his triumph at the discovery. "'That's the boy who had the orange. If that's not the boy, sir, who had the orange, and threw this bit of peel upon the staircase, I'll eat my head and his too.' "'No, no, he has not had one,' said Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'Come, put down your hat and speak to my young friend.' "'I feel strongly on this subject, sir,' said the irritable old gentleman, drawing off his gloves. "'There's always, more or less, orange peel on the pavement in our street, and I know it's put there by the surgeon's boy at the corner. A young woman, stumbled over a bit last night, and fell against my garden railings. Directly she got up, I saw her look towards his infernal red lamp with the pantomime light. "'Don't go to him!' I called out of the window. "'He's an assassin! A man-trap!' "'So he is. If he is not—' Here the irascible old gentleman gave a great knock on the ground with his stick, which was always understood by his friends to imply the customary offer whenever it was not expressed in words. Then, still keeping his stick in his hand, he sat down, and opening a double eyeglass, which he wore attached to a broad black riband, took a view of Oliver, who, seeing that he was the object of inspection, coloured and bowed again. "'That's the boy, is it?' said Mr. Grimwig at length. "'That's the boy,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'How are you, boy?' said Mr. Grimwig. "'A great deal better, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. Mr. Brownlow, seeming to apprehend that his singular friend was about to say something disagreeable, asked Oliver to step downstairs and tell Mrs. Bedwin they were ready for tea, which, as he did not half like the visitor's manner, he was very happy to do. "'He is a nice-looking boy, is he not?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'I don't know,' replied Mr. Grimwig pettishly. "'Don't know? No, I don't know.' I never see any difference in boys. I only knew two sort of boys—mealy boys and beef-faced boys." "'And which is Oliver?' "'Mealy. I know a friend who was a beef-faced boy—a fine boy, they call him, with a round head, and red cheeks, and glaring eyes. A horrid boy, with a body and limbs that appear to be swelling out of the seams of his blue clothes, with the voice of a pilot and the appetite of a wolf. I know him, the wretch. "'Come,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'these are not the characteristics of young Oliver Twist, so he needn't excite your wrath.' "'They are not,' replied Mr. Grimwig. "'He may have worse.' Here Mr. Brownlow coughed impatiently, which appeared to afford Mr. Grimwig the most exquisite delight. "'He may have worse, I say,' repeated Mr. Grimwig. "'Where does he come from? Who is he? What is he? He has had a fever.' What of that? Fevers are not peculiar to good people, are they? Bad people have fevers sometimes, haven't they, eh? I knew a man who was hung in Jamaica for murdering his master. He had had a fever six times. He wasn't recommended to mercy on that account. Pooh! Nonsense!" Now, the fact was, that in the inmost recesses of his own heart, Mr. Grimwig was strongly disposed to admit that Oliver's appearance and manner were unusually prepossessing. But he had a strong appetite for contradiction, sharpened on this occasion by the finding of the orange peel, and inwardly determining that no man should dictate to him whether a boy was well-looking or not, he had resolved from the first to oppose his friend. When Mr. Brownlow admitted that on no one point of inquiry could he yet return a satisfactory answer, and that he had postponed any investigation into Oliver's previous history until he thought the boy was strong enough to hear it, Mr. Grimwig chuckled maliciously, and he demanded, with a sneer, whether the housekeeper was in the habit of counting the plate at night, because if she didn't find a tablespoon or two missing some sunshiny morning, why, he would be content to—and so forth. All this Mr. Brownlow, although himself somewhat of an impetuous gentleman, knowing his friend's peculiarities, bore with great good humour as Mr. Grimwig, at tea, was graciously pleased to express his entire approval of the muffins. Matters went on very smoothly. 
and Oliver, who made one of the party, began to feel more at his ease than he had yet done in the fierce old gentleman's presence. "'And when are you going to hear a full, true, and particular account of the life and adventures of Oliver Twist?' asked Mr. Grimwig of Mr. Brownlow, at the conclusion of the meal, looking sideways at Oliver as he resumed his subject. "'Tomorrow morning,' replied Mr. Brownlow, "'I would rather he was alone with me at the time. Come up to me tomorrow morning at ten o'clock, my dear.' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. He answered with some hesitation, because he was confused by Mr. Grimwig's looking so hard at him. "'I'll tell you what,' whispered that gentleman to Mr. Brownlow, "'he won't come up to you to-morrow morning. I saw him hesitate. He is deceiving you, my good friend.' "'I'll swear he is not,' replied Mr. Brownlow warmly. "'If he is not,' said Mr. Grimwig, "'I'll—' and down went the stick. "'I'll answer for that boy's truth with my life,' said Mr. Brownlow, knocking the table. "'And I, for his falsehood with my head,' rejoined Mr. Grimwig, knocking the table also. "'We shall see,' said Mr. Brownlow, checking his rising anger. "'We will,' replied Mr. Grimwig, with a provoking smile. "'We will.' As fate would have it, Mrs. Bedwin chanced to bring in, at this moment, a small parcel of books, which Mr. Brownlow had that morning purchased of the identical bookstall-keeper, who has already figured in this history. Having laid them on the table, she prepared to leave the room. "'Stop the boy, Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'There is something to go back.' "'He is gone, sir,' replied Mrs. Bedwin. "'Call after him,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'It's particular.' He is a poor man, and they are not paid for. There are some books to be taken back, too." The street door was opened. Oliver ran one way, and the girl ran another. And Mrs. Bedwin stood on the step, and screamed for the boy. But there was no boy in sight. Oliver and the girl returned, in a breathless state, to report that there were no tidings of him. "'Dear me! I am very sorry for that.' exclaimed Mr. Brownlow. I particularly wish those books to be returned to-night. "'Send Oliver with them,' said Mr. Grimwig, with an ironical smile. "'He'll be sure to deliver them safely, you know.' "'Yes. Do let me take them, if you please, sir,' said Oliver. "'I'll run all the way, sir.' The old gentleman was just going to say that Oliver should not go out on any account, when a most malicious cough from Mr. Grimwig determined him that he should, and that, by his prompt discharge of the commission, he should prove to him the injustice of his suspicions, on this head at least, at once. "'You shall go, my dear,' said the old gentleman. "'The books are on a chair by my table. Fetch them down.' Oliver, delighted to be of use, brought down the books under his arm in a great bustle, and waited, cap in hand, to hear what message he was to take. "'You are to say,' said Mr. Brownlow, glancing steadily at Grimwig, "'you are to say that you have brought those books back, and that you have come to pay the four-pound ten I owe him. This is a five-pound note, so you will have to bring me back ten shillings change.' "'I won't be ten minutes, sir,' said Oliver eagerly, having buttoned up the bank-note in his jacket-pocket, and placed the books carefully under his arm. He made a respectful bow, and left the room. Mrs. Bedwin followed him to the street door, giving him many directions about the nearest way, and the name of the bookseller, and the name of the street, all of which Oliver said he clearly understood. Having superadded many injunctions to be sure and not take cold, the old lady at length permitted him to depart. "'Bless his sweet face!' said the old lady, looking after him. I can't bear, somehow, to let him go out of my sight." At this moment Oliver looked gaily round, and nodded before he turned the corner. The old lady smilingly returned his salutation, and, closing the door, went back to her own room. "'Let me see. He'll be back in twenty minutes at the longest,' said Mr. Brownlow, pulling out his watch, and placing it on the table. "'It will be dark by that time.' "'Oh! <laughs> you really expect him to come back, do you?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. 
"'Don't you?' asked Mr. Brownlow, smiling. The spirit of contradiction was strong in Mr. Grimwig's breast at the moment, and it was rendered stronger by his friend's confident smile. "'No,' he said, smiting the table with his fist. "'I do not. The boy is a new suit of clothes on his back, a set of valuable books under his arm, and a five-pound note in his pocket. He'll join his old friends, the thieves, and laugh at you. If ever that boy returns to this house, sir, I'll eat my head.' With these words, he drew his chair closer to the table, and there the two friends sat, in silent expectation, with the watch between them. It is worthy of remark, as illustrating the importance we attach to our own judgments, and the pride with which we put forth our most rash and hasty conclusions, that although Mr. Grimwig was not by any means a bad-hearted man, and though he would have been unfeignedly sorry to see his respected friend duped and deceived, he really did most earnestly and strongly hope, at that moment, that Oliver Twist might not come back. It grew so dark, that the figures on the dial-plate were scarcely discernible. But there the two old gentlemen continued to sit in silence, with the watch between them. End of chapter 14《》Chapter 15 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 15. Showing how very fond of Oliver Twist the merry old Jew and Miss Nancy were. In the obscure parlour of a low public house, in the filthiest part of Little Saffron Hill, a dark and gloomy den, where a flaring gaslight burnt all day in the winter time, and where no ray of sun ever shone in the summer, there sat, brooding over a little pewter measure, and a small glass, strongly impregnated with the smell of liquor, a man in a velveteen coat, drab shorts, half-boots and stockings, whom even by that dim light no experienced agent of the police would have hesitated to recognise as Mr. William Sykes. At his feet, sat a white-coated, red-eyed dog, who occupied himself alternately in winking at his master with both eyes at the same time, and in licking a large, fresh cut on one side of his mouth, which appeared to be the result of some recent conflict. "'Keep quiet, you warmint! Keep quiet!' said Mr. Sykes, suddenly breaking silence. Whether his meditations were so intense as to be disturbed by the dog's winking, or whether his feelings were so wrought upon by his reflections, that they required all the relief derivable from kicking an unoffending animal, to allay them, is matter for argument and consideration. Whatever was the cause, the effect was a kick and a curse bestowed upon the dog simultaneously. Dogs are not generally apt to revenge injuries inflicted upon them by their masters, but Mr. Sykes's dog, having faults of temper in common with his owner, and labouring perhaps at this moment under a powerful sense of injury, made no more ado, but at once fixed his teeth in one of the half-boots. Having given it a hearty shake, he retired, growling under a form, just escaping the pewter measure which Mr. Sykes levelled at his head. "'You would, would you?' said Sykes, seizing the poker in one hand, and deliberately opening with the other a large clasp-knife, which he drew from his pocket, "'Come here, you born devil! Come here! Do you hear?' The dog no doubt heard, because Mr. Sykes spoke in the very harshest key of a very harsh voice, but appearing to entertain some unaccountable objection to having his throat cut, he remained where he was, and growled more fiercely than before, at the same time grasping the end of the poker between his teeth and biting at it like a wild beast. This resistance only infuriated Mr. Sykes the more who, dropping on his knees, began to assail the animal most furiously. The dog jumped from right to left, and from left to right, snapping, growling, and barking. The man thrust, and swore, and struck, and blasphemed, and the struggle was reaching a most critical point for one or other, when, the door suddenly opening, the dog darted out, leaving Bill Sykes with the poker and the clasp-knife in his hands. "'There must always be two parties to a quarrel,' says the old adage. 
Mr. Sykes, being disappointed of the dog's participation, at once transferred his share in the quarrel to the newcomer. "'What the devil do you come in between me and my dog for?' said Sykes, with a fierce gesture. "'I didn't know, my dear. I didn't know,' replied Fagin humbly, for the Jew was the newcomer. "'Didn't know, you white-livered thief!' growled Sykes. "'Couldn't you hear the noise?' "'Not a sound of it, as I'm a living man, Bill,' replied the Jew. "'Oh, no! You hear nothing, you don't,' retorted Sykes with a fierce sneer. "'Sneaking in and out, so as nobody hears how you come or go. I wish you had been the dog, Fagin, half a minute ago.' "'Why?' inquired the Jew with a forced smile. "'Course the government—' as cares for the lives of such men as you, as having half the pluck of curs, lets a man kill a dog how he likes," replied Sykes, shutting up the knife with a very expressive look. "'That's why!' The Jew rubbed his hands, and sitting down at the table, affected to laugh at the pleasantry of his friend. He was obviously very ill at ease, however. "'Grin away!' said Sykes, replacing the poker and surveying him with savage contempt. "'Grin away! You'll never have the laugh at me, though, unless it's behind a nightcap. I've got the upper hand over you, Fagin, and damn me, I'll keep it. There! If I go, you go. So take care of me.' "'Well, well, my dear.' said the Jew. I know all that. We, we have a mutual interest, Bill. A mutual interest. <laughs> said Sykes, as if he thought the interest lay rather more on the Jew's side than on his. Well, what have you got to say to me? It's all passed safe through the melting pot, replied Fagin, and this is your share. It's rather more than it ought to be, my dear, but as I know you'll do me a good turn another time, and— "'Stow that gammon!' interposed the robber impatiently. "'Where is it? Hand it over!' "'Yes, yes, Bill. Give me time. Give me time,' replied the Jew soothingly. "'Here it is. All safe.' As he spoke, he drew forth an old cotton handkerchief from his breast, and untying a large knot in one corner, produced a small brown paper packet. Sykes, snatching it from him, hastily opened it, and proceeded to count the sovereigns it contained. "'This is all, is it?' inquired Sykes. "'All,' replied the Jew. "'You haven't opened the parcel and swallowed one or two as you come along, have you?' inquired Sykes suspiciously. Don't put on an injured look at that question. You've done it many a time. Jerk the tinkler." These words, in plain English, conveyed an injunction to ring the bell. It was answered by another Jew, younger than Fagin, but nearly as vile and repulsive in appearance. Bill Sykes merely pointed to the empty measure. The Jew, perfectly understanding the hint, retired to fill it. Previously exchanging a remarkable look with Fagin, who raised his eyes for an instant, as if in expectation of it, and shook his head in reply. So slightly, that the action would have been almost imperceptible to an observant third person. It was lost upon Sykes, who was stooping at the moment to tie the bootlace which the dog had torn. Possibly, if he had observed the brief interchange of signals, he might have thought that it boded no good to him. "'Is anybody here, Barney?' inquired Fagin, speaking now that Sykes was looking on, without raising his eyes from the ground. "'Dot the soul,' replied Barney, whose words, whether they came from the heart or not, made their way through his nose. "'Nobody?' inquired Fagin, in a tone of surprise, which perhaps might mean that Barney was at liberty to tell the truth. "'Dobody but Miss Daisy,' replied Barney. "'Nancy!' exclaimed Sykes. "'Where? Strike me blind if I don't honour that ear girl for her native talents!' 
She's bid avid a plate of boiled beef in the bar, replied Barney. Send her here, said Sykes, pouring out a glass of liquor. Send her here. Barney looked timidly at Fagin, as if for permission. The Jew remaining silent, and not lifting his eyes from the ground, he retired, and presently returned, ushering in Nancy, who was decorated with the bonnet, apron, basket, and street-door key complete. "'You are on the scent, aren't you, Nancy?' inquired Sykes, proffering the glass. "'Yes, I am, Bill,' replied the young lady, disposing of its contents, "'and tired enough of it I am, too. The young brat's been ill and confined to the crib, and—' "'Ah, Nancy, dear,' said Fagin, looking up. Now, whether a peculiar contraction of the Jew's red eyebrows, and a half-closing of his deeply set eyes, warned Miss Nancy that she was disposed to be too communicative, is not a matter of much importance. The fact is all we need care for here, and the fact is that she suddenly checked herself, and with several gracious smiles upon Mr. Sykes, turned the conversation to other matters. In about ten minutes' time, Mr. Fagin was seized with a fit of coughing, upon which Nancy pulled her shawl over her shoulders, and declared it was time to go. Mr. Sykes, finding that he was walking a short part of her way himself, expressed his intention of accompanying her. They went away together, followed at a little distance by the dog, who slunk out of a backyard as soon as his master was out of sight. The Jew thrust his head out of the room door when Sykes had left it looked after him as he walked up the dark passage, shook his clenched fist, muttered a deep curse, and then, with a horrible grin, reseated himself at the table, where he was soon deeply absorbed in the interesting pages of the hue and cry. Meanwhile, Oliver Twist, little dreaming that he was within so very short a distance of the merry old gentleman, was on his way to the bookstall. When he got into Clerkenwell, he accidentally turned down a by-street, which was not exactly in his way, but not discovering his mistake until he had got halfway down it, and knowing it must lead in the right direction, he did not think it worth while to turn back, and so marched on as quickly as he could with the books under his arm. He was walking along, thinking how happy and contented he ought to feel, and how much he would give for only one look at poor little Dick, who, starved and beaten, might be weeping bitterly at that very moment, when he was startled by a young woman screaming out very loud, "'Oh, my dear brother!' And he had hardly looked up to see what the matter was, when he was stopped by having a pair of arms thrown tight round his neck. "'Don't!' cried Oliver, struggling. "'Let go of me! Who is it? What are you stopping me for?' The only reply to this was a great number of loud lamentations from the young woman who had embraced him and who had a little basket and a street door-key in her hand. "'Oh, my gracious!' said the young woman. "'I have found him! Oh, Oliver! Oliver! Oh, you naughty boy! To make me suffer such distress on your account! Come home, dear, come! Oh, I've found him! Thank gracious goodness heavens, I've found him!' With these incoherent exclamations, the young woman burst into another fit of crying, and got so dreadfully hysterical, that a couple of women who came up at the moment asked a butcher's boy with a shiny head of hair, anointed with suet, who was also looking on, whether he didn't think he had better run for the doctor, to which the butcher's boy, who appeared of a lounging, not to say indolent, disposition, replied that he thought not. "'Oh, no, 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 never mind,' said the young woman, grasping Oliver's hand. "'I'm better now.' "'Come home directly, you cruel boy! Come!' "'Oh, ma'am,' replied the young woman, "'he ran away, near a month ago, from his parents, "'who were hard-working and respectable people, "'and went and joined a set of thieves and bad characters, "'and almost broke his mother's heart.' "'Young wretch,' said one woman, "'go home, do you, little brute,' said the other. "'I'm not!' replied Oliver, greatly alarmed. "'I don't know her. I haven't any sister or father or mother either. I'm an orphan. I live at Pentonville.' "'Only hear him! How he braves it out!' cried the young woman. "'Why, it's Nancy!' exclaimed Oliver, who now saw her face for the first time, 
and started back in irrepressible astonishment. "'You see, he knows me,' cried Nancy, appealing to the bystanders. "'He can't help himself. I'll make him come home. There's good people, or he'll kill his dear mother and father and break my heart.' "'What the devil's this?' said a man, bursting out of a beer-shop, with a white dog at his heels. "'Young Oliver, come home to your poor mother, you young dog. Come home directly.' "'I, I don't belong to them. I don't know them. Help! Help!' cried Oliver, struggling in the man's powerful grasp. "'Help!' repeated the man. "'Yes, I'll help you, you young rascal. What books are these?' You've been a-stealing him, haven't you? Give him here." With these words, the man tore the volumes from his grasp, and struck him on the head. "'That's right,' cried a looker-on from a garret window. "'That's the only way of bringing him to his senses.' "'To be sure,' cried a sleepy-faced carpenter, casting an approving look at the garret window. "'It'll do him good,' said the two women. "'And he shall have it, too.' rejoined the man, administering another blow, and seizing Oliver by the collar. "'Come on, you young villain! Here, bull's-eye! Mind him, boy! Mind him!' Weak with recent illness, stupefied by the blows and the suddenness of the attack, terrified by the fierce growling of the dog and the brutality of the man, overpowered by the conviction of the bystanders that he really was the hardened little wretch he was described to be, what could one poor child do? Darkness had set in. It was a low neighbourhood. No help was near. Resistance was useless. In another moment he was dragged into a labyrinth of dark, narrow courts, and was forced along them at a pace which rendered the few cries he dared to give utterance to unintelligible. It was of little moment, indeed, whether they were intelligible or no, for there was nobody to care for them, had they been ever so plain. The gas-lamps were lighted. Mrs. Bedwin was waiting anxiously at the open door. The servant had run up the street twenty times to see if there were any traces of Oliver, and still the two old gentlemen sat, perseveringly, in the dark parlour, with the watch between them. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Oliver Twist – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 16. Relates what became of Oliver Twist after he had been claimed by Nancy. The narrow streets and courts at length terminated in a large open space, scattered about which were pens for beasts and other indications of a cattle market. Sykes slackened his pace when they reached this spot the girl being quite unable to support any longer the rapid rate at which they had hitherto walked. Turning to Oliver, he roughly commanded him to take hold of Nancy's hand. "'Do you hear?' growled Sykes, as Oliver hesitated and looked round. They were in a dark corner, quite out of the track of passengers. Oliver saw, but too plainly, that resistance would be of no avail. He held out his hand, which Nancy clasped tight in hers. "'Give me the other.' said Sykes, seizing Oliver's unoccupied hand. "'Here, bull's-eye!' The dog looked up and growled. "'See here, boy,' said Sykes, putting his other hand to Oliver's throat. "'If he speaks ever so soft a word, hold him. Do you mind?' The dog growled again, and, licking his lips, eyed Oliver as if he were anxious to attach himself to his windpipe without delay. "'He's as willing as a Christian. Strike me blind if he isn't,' said Sykes, regarding the animal with a kind of grim and ferocious approval. "'Now, you know what you've got to expect, master. So crawl away as quick as you like. The dog will soon stop that game. Get on, young un. Bullseye wagged his tail in acknowledgment of this unusually endearing form of speech, and, giving vent to another admonitory growl for the benefit of Oliver, led the way onward. It was Smithfield that they were crossing, although it might have been Grosvenor Square, for anything Oliver knew to the contrary. The night was dark and foggy, 
the lights in the shops could scarcely struggle through the heavy mist, which thickened every moment, and shrouded the streets and houses in gloom, rendering the strange place still stranger in Oliver's eyes, and making his uncertainty the more dismal and depressing. They had hurried on a few paces, when a deep church bell struck the hour. With its first stroke, his two conductors stopped, and turned their heads in the direction whence the sound proceeded. Eight o'clock, Bill,' said Nancy, when the bell ceased. "'What's the good of telling me that? I can hear it, can't I?' replied Sykes. "'I wonder whether they can hear it,' said Nancy. "'Of course they can,' replied Sykes. "'It was bottle me time, when I was shopped, and there wa'n't a penny chump in the affair, as I couldn't hear the squeaking on. After I was locked up for the night, the row and din outside made the thundering old jail so silent that I could almost have beat my brains out against the iron plates of the door. "'Poor fellow,' said Nancy, who still had her face turned towards the quarter in which the bell had sounded. "'Oh, Bill, such fine young chaps as them!' "'Yes, that's all you women think of,' answered Sykes. "'Fine young chaps. Well, they're as good as dead.' so it don't much matter." With this consolation, Mr. Sykes appeared to repress a rising tendency to jealousy, and, clasping Oliver's wrist more firmly, told him to step out again. "'Wait a minute,' said the girl. "'I wouldn't hurry by. If it was you that was coming out to be hung, the next time eight o'clock struck, Bill, I'd walk round and round the place till I dropped if the snow was on the ground and I hadn't a short to cover me. "'And what good would that do?' inquired the unsentimental Mr. Sykes. "'Unless you could pitch over a file, and twenty yards of good stout rope, you might as well be walking fifty mile off, or not walking at all, for all the good it would do me. Come on, and don't stand preaching there.' The girl burst into a laugh, drew her shawl more closely round her, and they walked away. But Oliver felt her hand tremble, and— looking up in her face as they passed a gas-lamp, saw that it had turned a deadly white. They walked on, by little frequented and dirty ways, for a full half-hour, meeting very few people, and those appearing from their looks to hold much the same position in society as Mr. Sykes himself. At length they turned into a very filthy narrow street, nearly full of old clothes-shops, the dog running forward, as if conscious that there was no further occasion for his keeping on guard, stopped before the door of a shop that was closed, and apparently untenanted. The house was in a ruinous condition, and on the door was nailed a board, intimating that it was to let, which looked as if it had hung there for many years. "'All right,' cried Sykes, glancing cautiously about. Nancy stooped below the shutters, and Oliver heard the sound of a bell. They crossed to the opposite side of the street, and stood for a few moments under a lamp. A noise, as if a sash window were gently raised, was heard, and soon afterwards the door softly opened. Mr. Sykes then seized the terrified boy by the collar with very little ceremony, and all three were quickly inside the house. The passage was perfectly dark. They waited, while the person who had let them in chained and barred the door. "'Anybody here?' inquired Sykes. "'No,' replied a voice which Oliver thought he had heard before. "'Is he old and here?' asked the robber. "'Yes,' replied the voice. "'And precious down in the mouth he has been. Won't he be glad to see you? <laughs> oh, no!' The style of this reply, as well as the voice which delivered it, seemed familiar to Oliver's ears, but it was impossible to distinguish even the form of the speaker in the darkness. "'Let's have a glim,' said Sykes, "'or we shall go breaking our necks or treading on the dog. Look after your legs if you do.' "'Stand still a moment, and I'll get you one,' replied the voice. The receding footsteps of the speaker were heard, and, in another minute, the form of Mr. John Dawkins, otherwise the artful dodger, appeared. He bore in his right hand a tallow candle stuck in the end of a cleft stick. The young gentleman did not stop to bestow any other remark of recognition upon Oliver than a humorous grin, but, turning away, beckoned the visitors to follow him down a flight of stairs. 
they crossed an empty kitchen, and, opening the door of a low, earthy-smelling room, which seemed to have been built in a small backyard, were received with a shout of laughter. <laughs> oh, my wig! My wig! cried Master Charles Bates, from whose lungs the laughter had proceeded. Here he is! Oh, cry, here he is! Oh, Fagin, look at him! <laughs> Fagin, do look at him! I can't bear it! He's such a jolly game! I can't bear it! Hold me, somebody, while I laugh it out! With this irrepressible ebullition of mirth, Master Bates laid himself flat on the floor, and kicked convulsively for five minutes in an ecstasy of facetious joy. Then, jumping to his feet, he snatched the cleft stick from the dodger, and, advancing to Oliver, viewed him round and round, while the Jew, taking off his nightcap, made a great number of low bows to the bewildered boy. The artful, meantime, who was of a rather saturnine disposition, and seldom gave way to merriment when it interfered with business, rifled Oliver's pockets with steady assiduity. "'Look at his togs, Fagin,' said Charlie putting the light so close to his new jacket as nearly to set him on fire. Look at his togs! Superfine cloth, and a heavy swell cut. Oh, my eye, what a game! And his books, too! Nothing but a gentleman, Fagin. Delighted to see you looking so well, my dear, said the Jew, bowing with mock humility. The artful shall give you another suit, my dear for fear you should spoil that Sunday one. Why didn't you write, my dear, and say you were coming? We'd have got something warm for supper." At this, Master Bates roared again, so loud that Fagin himself relaxed, and even the Dodger smiled. But as the artful drew forth the five-pound note at that instant, it is doubtful whether the sally of the discovery awakened his merriment. Hello. "'What's that?' inquired Sykes, stepping forward as the Jew seized the note. "'That's mine, Fagin.' "'No, no, my dear,' said the Jew. "'Mine, Bill, mine. You shall have the books.' "'If that ain't mine,' said Bill Sykes, putting on his hat with a determined air. "'Mine and Nancy's, that is. I'll take the boy back again.' The Jew started. Oliver started, too, though from a very different cause, for he hoped that the dispute might really end in his being taken back. "'Come, and over, will you?' said Sykes. "'This is hardly fair, Bill. Hardly fair, is it, Nancy?' inquired the Jew. "'Fair or not fair,' retorted Sykes, "'and over, I tell you.' Do you think Nancy and me's got nothing else to do with our precious time but to spend it in scouting arter and kidnapping every young boy as gets grabbed through you? Give it here, you avaricious old skeleton. Give it here. With this gentle remonstrance, Mr. Sykes plucked the note from between the Jew's finger and thumb, and looking the old man coolly in the face, folded it up small and tied it in his neckerchief. That's for our share of the trouble said Sykes, and not half enough neither. You may keep the books, if you're fond of reading. If you ain't, sell em. "'They're very pretty,' said Charlie Bates, who, with sundry grimaces, had been affecting to read one of the volumes in question. "'Beautiful writing, isn't it, Oliver?' At sight of the dismayed look with which Oliver regarded his tormentors, Master Bates, who was blessed with the lively sense of the ludicrous, fell into another ecstasy more boisterous than the first. "'They belong to the old gentleman,' said Oliver, wringing his hands, "'to the good, kind old gentleman, who took me into his house, and had me nursed when I was near dying of the fever. Oh, pray, send them back. Send him back the books and money. Keep me here all my life long, but pray, pray, send them back. He'll think I stole them. The old lady—' All of them who were so kind to me will think I stole them. Oh, do have mercy upon me, and send them back." With these words, which were uttered with all the energy of passionate grief, Oliver fell upon his knees at the Jew's feet, and beat his hands together in perfect desperation. 
"'The boy's right,' remarked Fagin, looking covertly round, and knitting his shaggy eyebrows into a hard knot. "'You're right, Oliver. You're right. They will think you have stolen them. <laughs> chuckled the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'It couldn't have happened better if we had chosen our time.' "'Of course it couldn't,' replied Sykes. "'I knowed that. Directly I see him coming through Clerkenwell with the books under his arm. It's all right enough. They're soft-hearted psalm-singers, or they wouldn't have taken him in at all, and they'll ask no questions after him, fear they should be obliged to prosecute, and so get him lagged. He's safe enough.' Oliver had looked from one to the other, while these words were being spoken, as if he were bewildered, and could scarcely understand what passed. But when Bill Sykes concluded, he jumped suddenly to his feet, and tore wildly from the room, uttering shrieks for help, which made the bare old house echo to the roof. "'Keep, keep back the dog, Bill!' cried Nancy, springing before the door, and closing it, as the Jew and his two pupils darted out in pursuit. "'Keep back the dog!' "'He'll tear the boy to pieces.' "'Serve him right,' cried Sykes, struggling to disengage himself from the girl's grasp. "'Stand off from me, or I'll split your head against the wall.' "'I don't care for that, Bill. I, I don't care for that,' screamed the girl, struggling violently with the man. "'The child shan't be torn down by the dog, unless you kill me first. "'Shan't he?' said Sykes, setting his teeth. "'I'll soon do that if you don't keep off.' The housebreaker flung the girl from him to the farther end of the room, just as the Jew and the two boys returned, dragging Oliver among them. "'What's the matter here?' said Fagin, looking round. "'The girl's gone mad, I think,' replied Sykes savagely. "'No, she hasn't,' said Nancy pale and breathless from the scuffle. "'No, she hasn't, Fagin. Don't think it—' "'Then keep quiet, will you?' said the Jew, with a threatening look. "'No, I won't do that, neither,' replied Nancy, speaking very loud. "'Come, what do you think of that?' Mr. Fagin was sufficiently well acquainted with the manners and customs of that particular species of humanity to which Nancy belonged to feel tolerably certain that it would be rather unsafe to prolong any conversation with her at present. With the view of diverting the attention of the company, he turned to Oliver. "'So, you wanted to get away, my dear, did you?' said the Jew, taking up a jagged and knotted club which lay in a corner of the fireplace. "'Eh?' Oliver made no reply, but he watched the Jew's motions, and breathed quickly. "'Wanted to get assistance. Called for the police, did you?' sneered the Jew, catching the boy by the arm. "'We'll cure you of that, my young master.' The Jew inflicted a smart blow on Oliver's shoulders with the club, and was raising it for a second, when the girl, rushing forward, wrested it from his hand. She flung it into the fire with a force that brought some of the glowing coals whirling out into the room. "'I won't stand by and see it done, Fagin,' cried the girl. "'You've got the boy, and what more would you have? Let him be! Let him be! Or I shall put that mark on some of you that will bring me to the gallows before my time!' The girl stamped her foot violently on the floor as she vented this threat, and with her lips compressed and her hands clenched, looked alternately at the Jew and the other robber her face quite colourless from the passion of rage into which she had gradually worked herself. "'Why, Nancy,' said the Jew, in a soothing tone, after a pause during which he and Mr. Sykes had stared at one another in a disconcerted manner, "'You, you're more clever than ever to-night. <laughs> My dear, you are acting beautifully.' "'Am I?' said the girl. "'Take care I don't overdo it. You'll be the worse for it, Fagin, if I do. And so I'll tell you in good time to keep clear of me.' There is something about a roused woman, especially if she add to all of her other strong passions the fierce impulses of recklessness and despair which few men like to provoke. 
the Jew saw that it would be hopeless to effect any further mistake regarding the reality of Miss Nancy's rage, and, shrinking involuntarily back a few paces, cast a glance, half imploring and half cowardly, at Sykes, as if to hint that he was the fittest person to pursue the dialogue. Mr. Sykes, thus mutely appealed to, and possibly feeling his personal pride and influence, interested in the immediate reduction of Miss Nancy to reason, gave utterance to about a couple of score of curses and threats, the rapid production of which reflected great credit on the fertility of his invention. As they produced no visible effect on the object against whom they were discharged, however, he resorted to more tangible arguments. "'What do you mean by this?' said Sykes, backing the inquiry with a very common imprecation concerning the most beautiful of human features, which, if it were heard above, only once out of every fifty thousand times that it is uttered below, would render blindness as common a disorder as measles. "'What do you mean by it? Burn my body! Do you know who you are, and what you are?' "'Oh, yes! I know all about it!' replied the girl, laughing hysterically, and shaking her head from side to side with a poor assumption of indifference. "'Well, then, keep quiet!' rejoined Sykes, with a growl like that he was accustomed to use when addressing his dog, or I'll quiet you for a good long time to come." The girl laughed again, even less composedly than before, and, darting a hasty look at Sykes, turned her face aside, and bit her lip till the blood came. "'You're a nice one,' added Sykes, as he surveyed her with a contemptuous air to take up the humane and genteel side. A pretty subject for the child, as you call him, to make a friend of. God Almighty, help me, I am, cried the girl passionately, and I wish I'd been struck dead in the street, or had changed places with them we pass so near to-night, before I'd lent a hand in bringing him here. He's a thief, a liar, a devil, all that's bad from this night forth. Isn't that enough for the old wretch without blows?' "'Come, come, Sykes,' said the Jew, appealing to him in a remonstratory tone, and motioning towards the boys who were eagerly attentive to all that passed. "'We must have civil words. Civil words, Bill.' "'Civil words!' cried the girl, whose passion was frightful to see. "'Civil words! You villain!' "'Yes, you deserve him from me. I thieved for you when I was a child, not half as old as this,' pointing to Oliver. "'I've been in the same trade, and in the same service for twelve years since. Don't you know it? Speak out. Don't you know it?' "'Well, well,' replied the Jew, with an attempt at pacification. "'And if you have, it's your living.' "'Aye, it is.' returned the girl, not speaking, but pouring out the words in one continuous and vehement scream. "'It is my living, and the cold, wet, dirty streets are my home, and you're the wretch that drove me to them long ago, and that'll keep me there day and night, day and night, till I die.' "'I shall do you a mischief,' interposed the Jew, goaded by these reproaches. "'A mischief worse than that, if you say much more.' The girl said nothing more but tearing her hair and dress in a transport of passion, made such a rush at the Jew, as would probably have left signal marks of her revenge upon him, had not her wrists been seized by sights at the right moment, upon which she made a few ineffectual struggles, and fainted. "'She's all right now,' said Sykes, laying her down in a corner. "'She's uncommon strong in the arms when she's up in this way.' The Jew wiped his forehead, and smiled, as if it were a relief to have the disturbance over. But neither he, nor Sykes, nor the dog, nor the boys, seemed to consider it in any other light than a common occurrence incidental to business. "'It's the worst of having to do with women,' said the Jew, replacing his club. "'But they're clever, and we can't get on in our line without him. Charlie, show Oliver to bed.' "'I suppose he'd better not wear his best clothes to-morrow, Fagin, had he?' inquired Charlie Bates. 
"'Certainly not,' replied the Jew, reciprocating the grin with which Charlie put the question. Master Bates, apparently much delighted with his commission, took the cleft stick, and led Oliver into an adjacent kitchen, where there were two or three of the beds on which he had slept before, and here, with many uncontrollable bursts of laughter, he produced the identical old suit of clothes which Oliver had so much congratulated himself upon leaving off at Mr. Brownlow's, and the accidental display of which, to Fagin, by the Jew who purchased them, had been the very first clue received of his whereabout. "'Put off the smart ones,' said Charlie, "'and I'll give them to Fagin to take care of. <laughs> what fun it is!' Poor Oliver unwillingly complied. Master Bates, rolling up the new clothes under his arm, departed from the room, leaving Oliver in the dark, and locking the door behind him. The noise of Charlie's laughter, and the voice of Miss Betsy, who opportunely arrived to throw water over her friend, and perform other feminine offices for the promotion of her recovery, might have kept many people awake under more happy circumstances than those in which Oliver was placed. But he was sick and weary, and he soon fell sound asleep. End of chapter 16Chapter Seventeen of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Seventeen. Oliver's destiny, continuing unpropitious, brings a great man to London to injure his reputation. It is the custom on the stage, in all good murderous melodramas, to present the tragic and the comic scenes in as regular alternation as the layers of red and white in a side of streaky bacon. The hero sinks upon his straw bed, weighed down by fetters and misfortunes. In the next scene, his faithful but unconscious squire regales the audience with a comic song. We behold, with throbbing bosoms, the heroine in the grasp of a proud and ruthless baron, her virtue and her life alike in danger, drawing forth her dagger to preserve the one at the cost of the other. And just as our expectations are wrought up to the highest pitch, a whistle is heard, and we are straightway transported to the great hall of the castle, where a grey-headed seneschal sings a funny chorus with a funnier body of vassals, who are free of all sorts of places, from church vaults to palaces, and roam about in company, carolling perpetually. Such changes appear absurd but they are not so unnatural as they would seem at first sight. The transitions in real life, from well-spread boards to death-beds, and from morning weeds to holiday garments, are not a whit less startling. Only there we are busy actors instead of passive lookers-on, which makes a vast difference. The actors in the mimic life of the theatre are blind to violent transitions and abrupt impulses of passion or feeling, which, presented before the eyes of mere spectators, are at once condemned as outrageous and preposterous. As sudden shiftings of the scene, and rapid changes of time and place, are not only sanctioned in books by long usage, but are by many considered as the great art of authorship, an author's skill in his craft being, by such critics, chiefly estimated with relation to the dilemmas in which he leaves his characters at the end of every chapter. This brief introduction to the present one may perhaps be deemed unnecessary. If so, let it be considered a delicate intimation on the part of the historian that he is going back to the town in which Oliver Twist was born, the reader taking it for granted that there are good and substantial reasons for making the journey, or he would not be invited to proceed upon such an expedition. Mr. Bumble emerged at early morning from the workhouse gate, and walked, with portly carriage and commanding steps, up the high street. He was in the full bloom and pride of beadlehood. His cocked hat and coat were dazzling in the morning sun. He clutched his cane with the vigorous tenacity of health and power. Mr. Bumble always carried his head high, but this morning it was higher than usual. There was an abstraction in his eye, an elevation in his air, which might have warned an observant stranger that thoughts were passing in the beadle's mind too great for utterance. Mr. Bumble stopped not to converse with the small shopkeepers and others who spoke to him deferentially as he passed along. 
he merely returned their salutations with a wave of his hand, and relaxed not in his dignified pace, until he reached the farm where Mrs. Mann tended the infant paupers with parochial care. "'Drat that beadle!' said Mrs. Mann, hearing the well-known shaking at the garden gate, "'if it isn't him at this time in the morning!' "'Look, Mr. Bumble, only think of its being you. <laughs> well, dear me, it is a pleasure, this is. Come into the parlour, sir, please.' The first sentence was addressed to Susan, and the exclamations of delight were uttered to Mr. Bumble, as the good lady unlocked the garden gate, and showed him, with great attention and respect, into the house. "'Mrs. Mann,' said Mr. Bumble, not sitting upon, or dropping himself into a seat, as any common jackanapes would, but letting himself gradually and slowly down into a chair. "'Mrs. Mann, ma'am, good morning.' "'Well, <laughs> and good morning to you, sir,' replied Mrs. Mann, with many smiles, "'and hoping you find yourself well, sir.' "'So, so, Mrs. Mann,' replied the beadle, "'a parochial life is not a bed of roses, Mrs. Mann.' "'Ah! Oh, that it isn't indeed, Mr. Bumble,' rejoined the lady, and all the infant paupers might have chorused the rejoinder with great propriety, if they had heard it. "'A parochial life, ma'am,' continued Mr. Bumble, striking the table with his cane, "'is a life of worrit, and vexation, and hardihood. But all public characters, as I may say, must suffer prosecution.' Mrs. Mann, not very well knowing what the beadle meant, raised her hands with a look of sympathy, and sighed. "'Ah, you may well sigh, Mrs. Mann,' said the beadle. Finding she had done right, Mrs. Mann sighed again, evidently to the satisfaction of the public character, who, repressing a complacent smile by looking sternly at his cocked hat, said, "'Mrs. Mann, I am going to London.' "'Look, Mr. Bumble!' cried Mrs. Mann, starting back. "'To London, ma'am,' resumed the inflexible beadle, "'by coach. I and two paupers, Mrs. Mann. A legal action is a-coming on about a settlement, and the board has appointed me—me, me, Mrs. Mann—to dispose to the matter before the quarter sessions at Clarkinwell. "'And I very much question,' added Mr. Bumble, drawing himself up, whether the Clarkinwell sessions will not find themselves in the wrong box before they have done with me. Oh, you mustn't be too hard upon them, sir, said Mrs. Mann coaxingly. The Clarkinwell sessions have brought it upon themselves, ma'am, replied Mr. Bumble, and if the Clarkinwell sessions find that they come off rather worse than they expected, the Clarkinwell sessions have only themselves to thank." There was so much determination and depth of purpose about the menacing manner in which Mr. Bumble delivered himself of these words, that Mrs. Mann appeared quite awed by them. At length she said, "'You're going by coach, sir? I thought it was always usual to send them paupers in carts.' "'That's when they're ill, Mrs. Mann,' said the beadle. "'We put the sick paupers into open carts in the rainy weather, to prevent their taking cold." "'Oh!' said Mrs. Mann. "'The opposition coach contracts for these two, and takes them cheap,' said Mr. Bumble. "'They are both in a very low state, and we find it would come two pound cheaper to move them at the bury em. That is, if we can throw em upon another parish, which I think we shall be able to do, if they don't die upon the road to spite us." <laughs> when Mr. Bumble had laughed a little while, his eyes again encountered the cocked hat, and he became grave. "'We are forgetting business, ma'am,' said the beadle. "'Here is your parochial stipend for the month.' Mr. Bumble produced some silver money, rolled up in paper, from his pocket-book, and requested a receipt, which Mrs. Mann wrote. "'It's very much blotted, sir.' said the farmer of infants, but it's formal enough, I dare say. Thank you, Mr. Bumble, sir. I'm very much obliged to you, I'm sure." Mr. Bumble nodded, blandly, 
in acknowledgment of Mrs. Mann's curtsy, and inquired how the children were. "'Bless their dear little hearts,' said Mrs. Mann, with emotion. "'They're as well as can be, the dears. Of course, except the two that died last week, and little Dick.' "'Isn't that boy no better?' inquired Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Mann shook her head. "'He's a ill-conditioned, wicious, bad-disposed parochial child, that,' said Mr. Bumble angrily. "'Where is he?' "'I'll bring him to you in one minute, sir,' replied Mrs. Mann. "'Here! You! Dick!' After some calling, Dick was discovered. Having had his face put under the pump, and dried upon Mrs. Mann's gown, he was led into the awful presence of Mr. Bumble, the beadle. The child was pale and thin, his cheeks were sunken, and his eyes large and bright. The scanty parish dress, the livery of his misery, hung loosely on his feeble body, and his young limbs had wasted away like those of an old man. Such was the little being who stood trembling beneath Mr. Bumble's glance, not daring to lift his eyes from the floor, and dreading even to hear the beadle's voice. "'Can't you look at the gentleman, you obstinate boy?' said Mrs. Mann. The child meekly raised his eyes, and encountered those of Mr. Bumble. "'What's the matter with you, parochial Dick?' inquired Mr. Bumble, with well-timed jocularity. "'Nothing, sir,' replied the child faintly. "'I should think not.' said Mrs. Mann, who had, of course, laughed very much at Mr. Bumble's humour. "'You want for nothing, I'm sure.' "'I should like,' faltered the child. "'Hey, Day,' interposed Mrs. Mann. "'I suppose you're going to say that you do want for something now. Why, you little wretch!' "'Stop, Mrs. Mann, stop,' said the beadle, raising his hand with a show of authority. "'Like what, sir, eh?' "'I should like,' faltered the child, "'if somebody that can write would put a few words down for me on a piece of paper, and fold it up, and seal it, and keep it for me, after I'm laid in the ground.' "'Why, what does the boy mean?' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, on whom the earnest manner and one aspect of the child had made some impression, accustomed as he was to such things. "'What do you mean, sir?' "'I should like,' said the child, "'to leave my dear love to poor Oliver Twist, and to let him know how often I've sat by myself and cried to think of his wandering about in the dark nights with nobody to help him and i should like to tell him said the child pressing his small hands together and speaking with great fervour that i was glad to die when i was very young for perhaps if i had lived to be a man and had grown old my little sister who is in heaven might forget me or be unlike me and it would be so much happier if we were both children there together mr bumble surveyed the little speaker from head to foot with indescribable astonishment and turning to his companion said they're all in one story mrs mann that audacious Oliver had demogalized them all. "'I couldn't have believed it, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, holding up her hands and looking malignantly at Dick. "'I never see such a hardened little wretch.' "'Take him away, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, imperiously. "'This must be stated to the board, Mrs. Mann.' "'I hope the gentleman will understand that it isn't my fault, sir.' said Mrs. Mann, whimpering pathetically. "'They shall understand that, ma'am. They shall be acquainted with the true state of the case,' said Mr. Bumble. "'There, take him away. I can't bear the sight on him.' Dick was immediately taken away, and locked up in the coal-cellar. 
Mr. Bumble shortly afterwards took himself off to prepare for his journey. At six o'clock next morning, Mr. Bumble, having exchanged his cocked hat for a round one, and encased his person in a blue greatcoat with a cape to it, took his place on the outside of the coach, accompanied by the criminals whose settlement was disputed, with whom in due course of time he arrived in London. He experienced no other crosses on the way than those which originated in the perverse behaviour of the two paupers, who persisted in shivering and complaining of the cold, in a manner which Mr. Bumble declared caused his teeth to chatter in his head, and made him feel quite uncomfortable, although he had a great coat on. Having disposed of these evil-minded persons for the night, Mr. Bumble sat himself down in the house at which the coach stopped, and took a temperate dinner of steaks, oyster-sauce, and porter. Putting a glass of hot gin and water on the chimney-piece, he drew his chair to the fire, and, with sundry moral reflections on the too prevalent sin of discontent and complaining, composed himself to read the paper. The very first paragraph, upon which Mr. Bumble's eye rested, was the following advertisement. Five Guineas Reward Whereas a young boy, named Oliver Twist, absconded, or was enticed, on Thursday evening last, from his home at Pentonville, and has not since been heard of. The above reward will be paid to any person who will give such information as will lead to the discovery of the said Oliver Twist, or tend to throw any light upon his previous history, in which the advertiser is, for many reasons, warmly interested. And then followed a full description of Oliver's dress, person, appearance, and disappearance, with the name and address of Mr. Brownlow at full length. Mr. Bumble opened his eyes, read the advertisement, slowly and carefully, three several times, and in something more than five minutes was on his way to Pentonville, having actually, in his excitement, left a glass of hot gin and water untasted. "'Is Mr. Brownlow at home?' inquired Mr. Bumble of the girl who opened the door. To this inquiry the girl returned the not uncommon, but rather evasive reply of, "'I don't know. Where do you come from?' Mr. Bumble no sooner uttered Oliver's name, an explanation of his errand, than Mrs. Bedwin, who had been listening at the parlour door, hastened into the passage in a breathless state. "'Come in! Come in!' said the old lady. "'I knew we should hear of him. Poor dear! I knew we should. I was certain of it. Bless his heart! I said so all along!' Having heard this, the worthy old lady hurried back into the parlour again, and seating herself on a sofa, burst into tears. The girl, who was not quite so susceptible, had run upstairs meanwhile, and now returned with a request that Mr. Bumble would follow her immediately, which he did. He was shown into the little back study, where sat Mr. Brownlow and his friend Mr. Grimwig, with decanters and glasses before them. The latter gentleman at once burst into the exclamation, "'A beetle! A parish beetle, or I'll eat my head!' "'Pray don't interrupt just now,' said Mr. Brownlow. Take a seat, will you?" Mr. Bumble sat himself down, quite confounded by the oddity of Mr. Grimwig's manner. Mr. Brownlow moved the lamp, so as to obtain an uninterrupted view of the beadle's countenance, and said, with a little impatience, "'Now, sir, you come in consequence of having seen the advertisement?' "'Yes, sir,' said Mr. Bumble. "'And you are a beadle, are you not?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'I am a parochial beadle, gentlemen,' returned Mr. Bumble proudly. "'Of course,' observed Mr. Grimwig aside to his friend. "'I knew he was. A beadle all over.' Mr. Brownlow gently shook his head to impose silence on his friend, and resumed. "'Do you know where this poor boy is now?' "'No more than nobody,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Well, what do you know of him?' inquired the old gentleman. "'Speak out, my friend, if you have anything to say. What do you know of him?' "'You don't happen to know any good of him, do you?' said Mr. Grimwig, caustically, after an attentive perusal of Mr. Bumble's features. Mr. Bumble, catching at the inquiry very quickly, shook his head with portentous solemnity. "'You see,' said Mr. Grimwig, looking triumphantly at Mr. Brownlow, Mr. Brownlow looked apprehensively at Mr. Bumble's pursed-up countenance, 
and requested him to communicate what he knew regarding Oliver in as few words as possible. Mr. Bumble put down his hat, unbuttoned his coat, folded his arms, inclined his head in a retrospective manner, and, after a few moments' reflection, commenced his story. It would be tedious if given in the beadle's words, occupying as it did some twenty minutes in the telling, but the sum and substance of it was that Oliver was a foundling, born of low and vicious parents, that he had from his birth displayed no better qualities than treachery, ingratitude, and malice, that he had terminated his brief career in the place of his birth, by making a sanguinary and cowardly attack on an unoffending lad, and running away in the night-time from his master's house. In proof of his really being the person he represented himself, Mr. Bumble laid upon the table the papers he had brought to town. Folding his arms again, he then awaited Mr. Brownlow's observations. "'I fear it is all too true,' said the old gentleman sorrowfully, after looking over the papers. "'This is not much for your intelligence, but I would gladly have given you treble the money, if it had been favourable to the boy.' It is not improbable that if Mr. Bumble had been possessed of this information at an earlier period of the interview, he might have imparted a very different colouring to his little history. It was too late to do it now, however, so he shook his head gravely, and, pocketing the five guineas, withdrew. Mr. Brownlow paced the room to and fro for some minutes, evidently so much disturbed by the beadle's tale, that even Mr. Grimwig forbore to vex him further. At length he stopped, and rang the bell violently. "'Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow, when the housekeeper appeared, "'that boy, Oliver, is an impostor. "'It can't be, sir. It cannot be,' said the old lady energetically. "'I tell you he is,' retorted the old gentleman. "'What do you mean by can't be? We have just heard a full account of him from his birth, and he has been a thorough-paced little villain all his life.' "'I never will believe it, sir,' replied the old lady firmly. "'Never!' "'You old women never believe anything but quack doctors, and lying story-books,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'I knew it all along. Why didn't you take my advice in the beginning? You would, if he hadn't had fever, I suppose, eh? He was interesting, wasn't he? Interesting? Pah!' And Mr. Grimwig poked the fire with a flourish. "'He was a dear, grateful, gentle child, sir.' retorted Mrs. Bedwin indignantly. "'I know what children are, sir, and have done these forty years. And people who can't say the same shouldn't say anything about them. That's my opinion.' This was a hard hit at Mr. Grimwig, who was a bachelor. As it extorted nothing from that gentleman but a smile, the old lady tossed her head and smoothed down her apron, preparatory to another speech, when she was stopped by Mr. Brownlow. "'Silence!' said the old gentleman, feigning an anger he was far from feeling. "'Never let me hear the boy's name again. I rang to tell you that. Never, never on any pretense, mind. You may leave the room, Mrs. Bedwin. Remember, I am in earnest.' There were sad hearts at Mr. Brownlow's that night. Oliver's heart sank within him when he thought of his good friends. It was well for him that he could not know what they had heard, or it might have broken out right. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens – Chapter 18 how Oliver passed his time in the improving society of his reputable friends. About noon next day, when the Dodger and Master Bates had gone out to pursue their customary avocations, Mr. Fagin took the opportunity of reading Oliver a long lecture on the crying sin of ingratitude, of which he clearly demonstrated he had been guilty, to no ordinary extent, in wilfully absenting himself from the society of his anxious friends and, still more, in endeavouring to escape from them after so much trouble and expense had been incurred in his recovery. 
Mr. Fagin laid great stress on the fact of his having taken Oliver in, and cherished him, when, without his timely aid, he might have perished with hunger, and he related the dismal and affecting history of a young lad whom, in his philanthropy, he had succoured under parallel circumstances, but who, proving unworthy of his confidence, and evincing a desire to communicate with the police, had unfortunately come to be hanged at the Old Bailey one morning. Mr. Fagin did not seek to conceal his share in the catastrophe, but lamented with tears in his eyes that the wrong-headed and treacherous behaviour of the young person in question had rendered it necessary that he should become the victim of certain evidence for the Crown, which, if it were not precisely true, was indispensably necessary for the safety of him, Mr. Fagin, and a few select friends. Mr. Fagin concluded by drawing a rather disagreeable picture of the discomforts of hanging and, with great friendliness and politeness of manner, expressed his anxious hopes that he might never be obliged to submit Oliver Twist to that unpleasant operation. Little Oliver's blood ran cold as he listened to the Jew's words, and imperfectly comprehended the dark threats conveyed in them, that it was possible, even for justice itself, to confound the innocent with the guilty, when they were in accidental companionship, he knew already and that deeply laid plans for the destruction of inconveniently knowing or over-communicative persons had been really devised and carried out by the Jew on more occasions than one, he thought by no means unlikely, when he recollected the general nature of the altercations between that gentleman and Mr. Sykes, which seemed to bear reference to some foregone conspiracy of the kind. As he glanced timidly up, and met the Jew's searching look, he felt that his pale face and trembling limbs were neither unnoticed nor unrelished by that wary old gentleman. The Jew, smiling hideously, patted Oliver on the head, and said that if he kept himself quiet and applied himself to business, he saw they would be very good friends yet. Then, taking his hat and covering himself with an old patched greatcoat, he went out and locked the room door behind him. And so Oliver remained all that day, and for the greater part of many subsequent days, seeing nobody, between early morning and midnight, and left during the long hours to commune with his own thoughts, which, never failing to revert to his kind friends, and the opinion they must long ago have formed of him, were sad indeed. After the lapse of a week or so, the Jew left the room door unlocked, and he was at liberty to wander about the house. It was a very dirty place. The rooms upstairs had great high wooden chimney-pieces and large doors, with panelled walls and cornices to the ceiling, which, although they were black with neglect and dust, were ornamented in various ways. From all of these tokens, Oliver concluded that a long time ago, before the old Jew was born, it had belonged to better people, and had perhaps been quite gay and handsome, dismal and dreary as it looked now. Spiders had built their webs in the angles of the walls and ceilings, and sometimes, when Oliver walked softly into a room, the mice would scamper across the floor, and run back terrified to their holes. With these exceptions there was neither sight nor sound of any living thing, and often, when it grew dark, and he was tired of wandering from room to room, he would crouch in the corner of the passage by the street door, to be as near living people as he could, and would remain there, listening and counting the hours, until the Jew or the boys returned. In all the rooms, the mouldering shutters were fast closed. The bars which held them were screwed tight into the wood. The only light which was admitted, stealing its way through round holes at the top, which made the rooms more gloomy, and filled them with strange shadows. There was a back garret window, with rusty bars outside, which had no shutter, and out of this Oliver often gazed, with a melancholy face, for hours together. But nothing was to be described from it but a confused and crowded mass of house-tops, blackened chimneys, and gable-ends. Sometimes, indeed, a grisly head might be seen, peering over the parapet wall of a distant house, but it was quickly withdrawn again, and as the window of Oliver's observatory was nailed down, and dimmed with the rain and smoke of years, it was as much as he could do to make out the forms of the different objects beyond, without making any attempt to be seen or heard, which he had as much chance of being as if he had lived inside the ball of St. Paul's Cathedral. One afternoon, 
the Dodger and Master Bates, being engaged out that evening, the first-named young gentleman took it into his head to evince some anxiety regarding the decoration of his person. To do him justice, this was by no means an habitual weakness with him. And, with this end and aim, he condescendingly commanded Oliver to assist him in his toilet straightway. Oliver was but too glad to make himself useful, too happy to have some faces, however bad, to look upon, too desirous to conciliate those about him when he could honestly do so, to throw any objection in the way of this proposal. So he at once expressed his readiness, and, kneeling on the floor, while the Dodger sat upon the table, so that he could take his foot in his laps, he applied himself to a process which Mr. Dawkins designated as Japanning his trotter-cases. The phrase, rendered into plain English, signifieth cleaning his boots. Whether it was the sense of freedom and independence, which a rational animal may be supposed to feel when he sits on a table in an easy attitude, smoking a pipe, swinging one leg carelessly to and fro, and having his boots cleaned all the time, without even the past trouble of having taken them off, or the prospective misery of putting them on to disturb his reflections, or whether it was the goodness of the tobacco that soothed the feelings of the dodger, or the mildness of the beer that mollified his thoughts. He was evidently tinctured, for the nonce, with a spice of romance and enthusiasm foreign to his general nature. He looked down on Oliver with a thoughtful countenance for a brief space, and then, raising his head and heaving a gentle sigh, said, half in abstraction, and half to Master Bates. "'What a pity it is he isn't a prig!' "'Ah!' said Master Charles Bates. "'He don't know what's good for him!' The Dodger sighed again, and resumed his pipe, as did Charlie Bates. They both smoked for some seconds in silence. "'I suppose you don't even know what a prig is,' said the Dodger mournfully. "'I think I know that,' replied Oliver, looking up. "'It's a—the—your uh, your one, are you not?' inquired Oliver, checking himself. "'I am,' replied the Dodger. "'I'd scorn to be anything else.' Mr. Dawkins gave his hat a ferocious cock, after delivering this sentiment, and looked at Master Bates, as if to denote that he would feel obliged by his saying anything to the contrary. "'I am,' repeated the Dodger. "'So's Charlie. So's Fagin. So's Sykes.' So's Nancy, so's Bet, so we all are down to the dog, and he's the downiest one of the lot, and the least given to peaching," added Charlie Bates. He wouldn't so much as bark in a witness box for fear of committing himself. No, not if you tied him up in one and left him there without whittles for a fortnight," said the Dodger. "Not a bit of it," observed Charlie. "He's a rum dog." "'Don't he look fierce at any strange cove that laughs or sings when he's in company?' pursued the Dodger. "'Won't he growl at all when he hears a fiddle playing? And only eight other dogs as ain't of his breed? <laughs> oh, no!' "'He's an out-and-out Christian,' said Charlie. This was merely intended as a tribute to the animal's abilities, but it was an appropriate remark in another sense, if Master Bates had only known it for there are a good many ladies and gentlemen claiming to be out-and-out -out Christians, between whom and Mr. Sykes's dog there exist strong and singular points of resemblance. "'Well, well,' said the Dodger, recurring to the point from which they had strayed, with that mindfulness of his profession which influenced all his proceedings. "'This hasn't got anything to do with young Green here.' "'No more it has,' said Charlie. "'Why don't you put yourself under Fagin, Oliver?' "'And make your fortune out of hand,' added the Dodger, with a grin. "'And so be able to retire on your property, and do the genteel, as I mean to, in the very next leap year but four that ever comes, and the forty-second Tuesday in Trinity Week,' said Charlie Bates. "'I don't like it,' rejoined Oliver timidly. "'I wish they would let me go. I, I would rather go.' "'And Fagin would rather not,' rejoined Charlie. Oliver knew this too well, but thinking it might be dangerous to express his feelings more openly, he only sighed, and went on with his boot-cleaning. "'Go!' exclaimed the Dodger. "'Why, where's your spirit? Don't you take any pride out of yourself? 
would you go and be dependent on your friends? Oh, blow that, said Master Bates, drawing two or three silk handkerchiefs from his pocket, and tossing them into a cupboard. That's too mean, that is. I couldn't do it said the Dodger, with an air of haughty disgust. "'You can leave your friends, though,' said Oliver, with a half-smile, "'and let them be punished for what you did.' "'That,' rejoined the Dodger, with a wave of his pipe, "'that was all out of consideration for Fagin. "'Cause the traps know that we work together, "'and he might have got into trouble if we hadn't made our lucky. "'That was a move, wasn't it, Charlie?' Master Bates nodded assent, and would have spoken, but the recollection of Oliver's flight came so suddenly upon him, that the smoke he was inhaling got entangled with a laugh, and went up into his head, and down into his throat, and brought on a fit of coughing and stamping about five minutes long. "'Look here,' said the Dodger, drawing forth a handful of shillings and halfpence. "'Here's a jolly life. What's the odds where it comes from? Here, catch hold.' There's plenty more where they were took from. You won't, won't you? Oh, you precious flat! It's naughty, ain't it, Oliver? inquired Charlie Bates. He'll come to be scragged, won't he? I don't know what that means, replied Oliver. Something in this way, old fellow, said Charlie. As he said it, Master Bates caught up an end of his neckerchief, and holding it erect in the air, dropped his head on his shoulder, and jerked a curious sound through his teeth, thereby indicating, by a lively pantomimic representation, that scragging and hanging were one and the same thing. "'That's what it means,' said Charlie. "'Look how he stares, Jack. I never did see such prime company as that here boy. He be the death of me, I know he will.' Master Charlie Bates, having laughed heartily again, resumed his pipe with tears in his eyes. "'You've been brought up bad,' said the Dodger, surveying his boots with much satisfaction when Oliver had polished them. "'Fagin will make something of you, though, or you'll be the first he ever had that turned out unprofitable. you better begin at once, for you'll come to the trade long before you think of it, and you're only losing time, Oliver.' Master Bates backed this advice with sundry moral admonitions of his own, which, being exhausted, he and his friend Mr. Dawkins launched into a glowing description of the numerous pleasures incidental to the life they led, interspersed with a variety of hints to Oliver, that the best thing he could do would be to secure Fagin's favour without more delay, by the means which they themselves had employed to gain it. "'And always put this in your pipe, Nolly,' said the Dodger, as the Jew was heard unlocking the door above. "'If you don't take fogles and tickers, "'What's the good of talking in that way?' interposed Master Bates. "'He don't know what you mean. "'If you don't take pocket handkerchiefs and watches,' said the Dodger, reducing his conversation to the level of Oliver's capacity, "'some other cove will, so that the coves that lose em will be all the worse, and you'll be all the worse too, and nobody half a hapeth the better, except the chaps what gets em and you've just as good a right to them as they have." "'To be sure, to be sure,' said the Jew, who had entered unseen by Oliver. "'It all lies in a nutshell, my dear, in a nutshell. Take the Dodger's word for it. <laughs> he understands the catechism of his trade.' The old man rubbed his hands gleefully together, as he corroborated the Dodger's reasoning in these terms, and chuckled with delight at his pupil's proficiency. The conversation proceeded no farther at this time, for the Jew had returned home, accompanied by Miss Betsy, and a gentleman whom Oliver had never seen before, but who was accosted by the Dodger as Tom Chitling, and who, having lingered on the stairs to exchange a few gallantries with the lady, now made his appearance. Mr. Chitling was older in years than the Dodger, having perhaps numbered eighteen winters, but there was a degree of deference in his deportment towards that young gentleman, which seemed to indicate that he felt himself conscious of a slight inferiority in point of genius and professional acquirements. 
he had small twinkling eyes, and a pock-marked face, wore a fur cap, a dark corduroy jacket, greasy fustian trousers, and an apron. His wardrobe was, in truth, rather out of repair, but he excused himself to the company by stating that his time was only out an hour before and that, in consequence of having worn the regimentals for six weeks past, he had not been able to bestow any attention on his private clothes. Mr. Chitling added, with strong marks of irritation, that the new way of fumigating clothes up yonder was infernal unconstitutional, for it burnt holes in them, and there was no remedy against the county. The same remark he considered to apply to the regulation mode of cutting the hair, which he held to be decidedly unlawful. Mr. Chitling wound up his observations by stating that he had not touched a drop of anything for forty-two moral, long, hard-working days, and that he wished he might be busted if he weren't as dry as a lime-basket. "'Where do you think the gentleman has come from, Oliver?' inquired the Jew with a grin, as the other boys put a bottle of spirits on the table. "'I—I I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Who's that?' inquired Tom Chitling, casting a contemptuous look at Oliver. "'A young friend of mine, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'He's in luck, then,' said the young man, with a meaning look at Fagin. "'Never mind where I came from, young un. You'll find your way there soon enough. I'll bet a crown.' At this sally the boys laughed. After some more jokes on the same subject, they exchanged a few short whispers with Fagin, and withdrew. After some words apart between the last comer and Fagin, they drew their chairs towards the fire, and the Jew, telling Oliver to come and sit by him, led the conversation to the topics most calculated to interest his hearers. These were the great advantages of the trade, the proficiency of the Dodger, the amiability of Charlie Bates, and the liberality of the Jew himself. At length these subjects displayed signs of being thoroughly exhausted, and Mr. Chitling did the same, for the house of correction becomes fatiguing after a week or two. Miss Betsy accordingly withdrew, and left the party to their repose. From this day Oliver was seldom left alone, but was placed in almost constant communication with the two boys, who played the old game with the Jew every day, whether for their own improvement or Oliver's, Mr. Fagin best knew. At other times the old man would tell them stories of robberies he had committed in his younger days, mixed up with so much that was droll and curious, that Oliver could not help laughing heartily, and showing that he was amused in spite of all his better feelings. In short, the wily old Jew had the boy in his toils. Having prepared his mind, by solitude and gloom, to prefer any society to the companionship of his own sad thoughts in such a dreary place, he was now slowly instilling into his soul the poison which he hoped would blacken it, and change its hue for ever. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Oliver Twist This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 19, in which a notable plan is discussed and determined on. It was a chill, damp, windy night, when the Jew, buttoning his great coat tight round his shrivelled body, and pulling the collar up over his ears, so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. He paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure, and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighbourhood of Whitechapel. The Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street, and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road, and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, 
the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course through many winding and narrow ways, until he reached Bethnal Green. Then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered, either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end. At the door of a house in this street he knocked. Having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it, he walked upstairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. "'Only me, Bill, only me, my dear,' said the Jew, looking in. "'Bring in your body, then,' said Sykes. "'Lie down, you stupid brute. Don't you know the devil, when he's got a great coat on?" Apparently, the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it, and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had risen, wagging his tail as he went, to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. "'Well,' said Sykes, "'Well, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'Ah, Nancy.' The latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behaviour. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his, without saying more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. "'It is cold, Nancy, dear,' said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. "'It seems to go right through one,' added the old man, touching his side. "'It must be a piercer, if it finds his way through your heart,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill.' to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave." Nancy quickly brought a bottle from a cupboard, in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids. Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. "'Quite enough, quite, thank ye, Bill,' replied the Jew, putting down the glass, after just setting his lips to it. "'What? You're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you?' inquired Sykes, fixing his eye on the Jew. "'Ugh!' With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass, and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes, as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced round the room, as his companion tossed down the second glassful, not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life-preserver that hung over the chimney-piece. "'There,' said Sykes, smacking his lips, "'now I'm ready.' "'For business?' inquired the Jew. "'For business,' replied Sykes. "'So, say what you've got to say.' "'About the crib at Chertsey, Bill,' said the Jew, drawing his chair forward, and speaking in a very low voice. "'Yes, what about it?' inquired Sykes. "'Ah, you know what I mean, my dear,' said the Jew. "'He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he?' "'No, he don't,' sneered Mr. Sykes. "'Or he won't. And that's the same thing. Speak out, and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in hints, as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. What do you mean?' 
"'Hush, Bill, hush!' said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. "'Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us.' "'Let him hear,' said Sykes. "'I don't care.' But as Mr. Sykes did care, on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words, and grew calmer. "'There, there,' said the Jew coaxingly. "'It was only my caution, nothing more. "'Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. "'When is it to be done, Bill, eh? "'When is it to be done? "'Such plate, my dear, such plate,' said the Jew, "'rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. "'Not at all,' replied Sykes coldly. "'Not to be done at all?' echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. "'No, not at all,' rejoined Sykes. "'At least, it can't be a put-up job as we expected.' "'Then it hasn't been properly gone about,' said the Jew, turning pale with anger. "'Don't tell me. But I will tell you,' retorted Sykes. "'Who are you? That's not to be told.' I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yes, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had him these twenty years, and if you were to give him five hundred pounds, they wouldn't be in it. "'But do you mean to say, my dear,' remonstrated the Jew, "'that the women can't be got over?' "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes. "'Not by flash, Toby Crackett,' said the Jew incredulously. "'Think what women are, Bill.' "'No, not even by flash, Toby Crackett,' replied Sykes. He says he's worn sham whiskers, and a canary waistcoat. The whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios, and a pair of military trousers, my dear," said the Jew. "'So he did,' rejoined Sykes, "'and they want of no more use than the other plant.' The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said, with a deep sigh, that if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. "'And yet,' said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, "'it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we'd set our hearts upon it.' "'So it is,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Worse luck.' A long silence ensued, during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. "'Fagin,' said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed. Is it worth fifty shiners extra, if it's safely done from the outside?" "'Yes,' said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. "'Is it a bargain?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, my dear, yes,' rejoined the Jew, his eyes glistening, and every muscle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. "'Then,' said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain. "'Let it come off as soon as you like. Toby and me were over the garden wall the night afore last, sounding the panels of the door and shutters. The crib's barred up at night like a jail, but there's one part we can crack, safe and softly.' "'Which is that, Bill?' asked the Jew eagerly. "'Why,' whispered Sykes, "'as you cross the lawn, "'Yes,' said the Jew, bending his head forward, with his eyes almost starting out of it. "'Hush!' 
cried Sykes, stopping short, as the girl, scarcely moving her head, looked suddenly round, and pointed for an instant to the Jew's face. "'Never mind which part it is. You can't do it without me, I know, but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you.' "'As you like, my dear, as you like,' replied the Jew. "'Is there no help wanted but yours and Toby's?' "'None,' said Sykes, "'cept a centre bit and a boy. The first we both got, the second you must find us.' "'A boy!' exclaimed the Jew. "'Oh, then it's a panel, eh?' "'Never mind what it is,' replied Sykes. "'I want a boy, and he mustn't be a big un. "'Lord!' said Mr. Sykes, reflectively. "'If I'd only got that young boy and Ned, the chimbley sweepers he kept him small on purpose, and let me out by the job. But the father gets lagged, and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he was earning money, teaches him to read and write, and in time makes a prentice of him. And so they go on,' said Mr. Sykes, his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs. So they go on, and, if they haven't got enough money, which it's a providence they haven't, we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the old trade in a year or two. No more we should, acquiesced the Jew, who had been considering during his speech, and had only caught the last sentence. Bill? What now? inquired Sykes. The Jew nodded his head towards Nancy, who was still gazing at the fire, and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room. Sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently, as if he thought the precaution unnecessary, but complied, nevertheless, by requesting Miss Nancy to fetch him a jug of beer. "'You don't want any beer,' said Nancy, folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly. "'I tell you, I do.' replied Sykes. "'Nonsense,' returned the girl coolly. "'Go on, Fagin. I know what he's going to say, Bill. He needn't mind me.' The Jew still hesitated. Sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise. "'Why, you don't mind the old girl, do you, Fagin?' he asked at length. "'You've known her long enough to trust her, or the devil's in it. She ain't want a blab. Are you, Nancy?' "'I should think not,' replied the young lady, drawing her chair up to the table, and putting her elbows upon it. "'No, no, my dear, I know you're not,' said the Jew. "'But—' and again the old man paused. "'But what?' inquired Sykes. "'I didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts, you know, my dear as she was the other night," replied the Jew. At this confession, Miss Nancy burst into a loud laugh, and, swallowing a glass of brandy, shook her head with an air of defiance, and burst into sundry exclamations of, "'Keep the game a-going! Never say die!' and the like. These seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen, for the Jew nodded his head with a satisfied air, and resumed his seat as did Mr. Sykes likewise. "'Now, Fagin,' said Nancy, with a laugh, "'tell Bill at once about Oliver.' "'Ah, you're a clever one, my dear, the sharpest girl I ever saw,' said the Jew, patting her on the neck. "'It was about Oliver I was going to speak, sure enough. <laughs> "'What about him?' demanded Sykes. "'He's the boy for you, my dear,' replied the Jew in a hoarse whisper, laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully. "'Eh?' exclaimed Sykes. "'Have him, Bill,' said Nancy. "'I would, if I was in your place. He mayn't be so much up as any of the others, but that's not what you want. If he's only to open a door for you, depend upon it, he's a safe one, Bill.' "'I know he is,' rejoined Fagin. "'He's been in good training these last few weeks, 
and it's time he began to work for his bread. Besides, the others are all too big. Well, he is just the size I want, said Mr. Sykes, ruminating. And we'll do everything you want, Bill, my dear, interposed the Jew. He can't help himself. That is, if you frighten him enough. Frighten him? echoed Sykes. It'll be no sham frightening, mind you. If there's anything queer about him, when we once get into the work, in for a penny, in for a pound, you won't see him alive again, Fagin. Think of that before you send him. Mark my words, said the robber, poising a crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead. I thought of it all, said the Jew with energy. I've... I've had my eye upon him, my dears, close, close. Once let him feel that he is one of us. Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief, and he's ours. Ours for life. Ho, <laughs> ho, He couldn't have come about better. The old man crossed his arms upon his breast, and, drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, literally hugged himself for joy. Ours, said Sykes. "'Yours, you mean?' "'Perhaps I do, my dear,' said the Jew, with a shrill chuckle. "'Mine, if you like, Bill.' "'And what?' said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend. "'What makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid, when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night, as you might pick and choose from?' "'Because—' "'They're of no use to me, my dear,' replied the Jew, with some confusion. "'Not worth the taking. Their looks convict them when they get into trouble, and I lose them all. With this boy properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides,' said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, "'he has us now if he could only give us leg-bail again.' and he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now, how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which would be dangerous, and we should lose by it besides. When is it to be done? asked Nancy stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he received Fagin's affectation of humanity. "'Ah, to be sure,' said the Jew. "'When is it to be done, Bill?' "'I'll plan with Toby the night out of to-morrow,' rejoined Sykes in a surly voice, "'if he heard nothing from me to the contrary.' "'Good,' said the Jew. "'There's no moon. No.' rejoined Sykes. "'It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it?' asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. "'And about—oh, ah, it's all planned,' rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. "'Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here to-morrow night. I shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue, and keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you'll have to do.' After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next evening, when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her. Fagin craftily observing that, if he evinced any disinclination to the task, he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had so recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else. It was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes, and further, that the said Sykes should deal with him as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him, it being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated in all important particulars by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, 
Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate, and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song, mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of housebreaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with, and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained, and the peculiar beauties of their construction, than he fell over the box upon the floor, and went to sleep where he fell. "'Good night, Nancy,' said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. "'Good night.' Their eyes met, and the Jew scrutinised her narrowly. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. The Jew again bade her good night, and, bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of Mr. Sykes while her back was turned, groped downstairs. "'Always the way,' muttered the Jew to himself, as he turned homeward. "'The worst of these women is that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold." Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the Dodger was sitting up impatiently awaiting his return. "'Is Oliver a bed? I want to speak to him,' was his first remark as they descended the stairs. "'Hours ago,' replied the Dodger, throwing open a door. "'Here he is.' The boy was lying fast asleep, on a rude bed upon the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness, and the closeness of his prison, that he looked like death. Not death as it shows in shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has, but an instant, fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. Not now," said the Jew, turning softly away. "Tomorrow, tomorrow." End of Chapter Nineteen. Chapter Twenty of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist. By Charles Dickens, Chapter Twenty, wherein Oliver is delivered over to Mr. William Sykes. When Oliver awoke in the morning, he was a good deal surprised to find that a new pair of shoes with strong, thick soles had been placed at his bedside, and that his old shoes had been removed. At first, he was pleased with the discovery, hoping that it might be the forerunner of his release, but such thoughts were quickly dispelled on his sitting down to breakfast along with the Jew, who told him, in a tone and manner which increased his alarm, that he was to be taken to the residence of Bill Sykes that night. "'To—to to stop there, sir?' asked Oliver anxiously. "'No, no, my dear, not to stop there,' replied the Jew. "'We shouldn't like to lose you. <laughs> Don't be afraid, Oliver.' You shall come back to us again. <laughs> we won't be so cruel as to send you away, my dear. Oh, no, no. The old man, who was stooping over the fire toasting a piece of bread, looked round as he bantered Oliver thus, and chuckled as if to show that he knew he would still be very glad to get away if he could. I suppose, said the Jew, fixing his eyes on Oliver. "'You want to know what you're going to Bill's for, eh, my dear?' Oliver coloured involuntarily, to find that the old thief had been reading his thoughts, but boldly said yes, he did want to know. "'Why do you think?' inquired Fagin, parrying the question. "'Indeed, I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. Bah said the Jew, turning away with a disappointed countenance from a close perusal of the boy's face. "'Wait till Bill tells you, then.' The Jew seemed much vexed by Oliver's not expressing any greater curiosity on the subject, 
But the truth is, that, although Oliver felt very anxious, he was too much confused by the earnest cunning of Fagin's looks, and his own speculations, to make any further inquiries just then. He had no other opportunity, for the Jew remained very surly and silent till night, when he prepared to go abroad. "'You may burn a candle,' said the Jew, putting one upon the table, "'and here's a book for you to read, till they come to fetch you. Good night.' "'Good night,' replied Oliver softly. The Jew walked to the door, looking over his shoulder at the boy as he went. Suddenly stopping, he called him by his name. Oliver looked up. The Jew, pointing to the candle, motioned him to light it. He did so, and, as he placed the candlestick upon the table, saw that the Jew was gazing fixedly at him, with lowering and contracted brows, from the dark end of the room. "'Take heed, Oliver, take heed,' said the old man, shaking his right hand before him in a warning manner. "'He's a rough man, and thinks nothing of blood when his own is up. Whatever falls out, say nothing, and do what he bids you mind.' Placing a strong emphasis on the last word, he suffered his features gradually to resolve themselves into a ghastly grin, and, nodding his head, left the room. Oliver leaned his head upon his hand when the old man disappeared, and pondered with a trembling heart on the words he had just heard. The more he thought of the Jew's admonition, the more he was at a loss to divine its real purpose and meaning. He could think of no bad object to be attained by sending him to Sykes, which would not be equally well answered by his remaining with Fagin, and after meditating for a long time, concluded that he had been selected to perform some ordinary menial offices for the housebreaker, until another boy, better suited for his purpose, could be engaged. He was too well accustomed to suffering, and had suffered too much where he was, to bewail the prospect of change very severely. He remained lost in thought for some minutes, and then, with a heavy sigh, snuffed the candle and, taking up the book which the Jew had left with him, began to read. He turned over the leaves, carelessly at first, but, lighting on a passage which attracted his attention, he soon became intent upon the volume. It was a history of the lives and trials of great criminals, and the pages were soiled and thumbed with use. Here he read of dreadful crimes that made the blood run cold of secret murders that had been committed by the lonely wayside, of bodies hidden from the eye of man in deep pits and wells, which would not keep them down, deep as they were, but had yielded them up at last after many years, and so maddened the murderers with the sight, that in their horror they had confessed their guilt, and yelled for the gibbet to end their agony. Here, too, he read of men who, lying in their beds at dead of night, had been tempted, so they said, and led on, by their own bad thoughts, to such dreadful bloodshed as it made the flesh creep and the limbs quail to think of. The terrible descriptions were so real and vivid that the sallow pages seemed to turn red with gore, and the words upon them to be sounded in his ears as if they were whispered in hollow murmurs by the spirits of the dead. In a paroxysm of fear, the boy closed the book and thrust it from him. Then, falling upon his knees, he prayed heaven to spare him from such deeds, and rather to will that he should die at once, than be reserved for crimes so fearful and appalling. By degrees he grew more calm, and besought in a low and broken voice that he might be rescued from his present dangers, and that if any aid were to be raised up for a poor outcast boy who had never known the love of friends or kindred, it might come to him now, when, desolate and deserted, he stood alone in the midst of wickedness and guilt. He had concluded his prayer, but still remained with his head buried in his hands, when a rustling noise aroused him. "'What's that?' he cried, starting up, and catching sight of a figure standing by the door. "'Who's there?' "'Me. Only me,' replied a tremulous voice. Oliver raised the candle above his head, and looked towards the door. It was Nancy. "'Put down the light.' said the girl, turning away her head. "'It hurts my eyes.' Oliver saw that she was very pale, 
and gently inquired if she were ill. The girl threw herself into a chair, with her back towards him, and wrung her hands, but made no reply. "'God forgive me!' she cried after a while. "'I never thought of this.' "'Has anything happened?' asked Oliver. "'Can I help you? I will if I can. I will indeed.' She rocked herself to and fro, caught her throat, and, uttering a gurgling sound, gasped for breath. "'Nancy!' cried Oliver. "'What is it?' The girl beat her hands upon her knees, and her feet upon the ground, and, suddenly stopping, drew her shawl close around her, and shivered with cold. Oliver stirred the fire. Drawing her chair close to it, she sat there, for a little time, without speaking, but at length she raised her head, and looked round. "'I don't know what comes over me sometimes,' said she, affecting to busy herself in arranging her dress. "'It's this damp, dirty room, I think. Now, Nolly, dear, are you ready?' "'Am I to go with you?' asked Oliver. "'Yes, I've come from Bill,' replied the girl. "'You ought to go with me.' "'What for?' asked Oliver, recoiling. "'What for?' echoed the girl, raising her eyes and averting them again, the moment they encountered the boy's face. "'Oh, for no harm.' "'I don't believe it,' said Oliver, who had watched her closely. "'Have it your own way.' rejoined the girl, affecting to laugh. "'For no good, then!' Oliver could see that he had some power over the girl's better feelings, and, for an instant, thought of appealing to her compassion for his helpless state. But then, the thought darted across his mind that it was barely eleven o'clock, and that many people were still in the streets, of whom surely some might be found to give credence to his tale. As the reflection occurred to him, he stepped forward, and said, somewhat hastily, that he was ready. Neither his brief consideration, nor its purport, were lost on his companion. She eyed him narrowly while he spoke, and cast upon him a look of intelligence which sufficiently showed that she guessed what had been passing in his thoughts. "'Hush!' said the girl, stooping over him, and pointing to the door, as she looked cautiously around. "'You can't help yourself. I have tried hard for you, but all to no purpose. You are hedged round and round. If ever you are to get loose from here, this is not the time." Struck by the energy of her manner, Oliver looked up in her face with great surprise. She seemed to speak the truth. Her countenance was white and agitated, and she trembled with very earnestness. "'I have saved you from being ill-used once, and I will again, and I do now,' continued the girl aloud. "'For those who would have fetched you, if I had not, would have been far more rough than me. I have promised for your being quiet and silent. If you are not, you will only do harm to yourself, and me too, and perhaps be my death. See here, I have borne all this for you already, as true as God sees me, show it." She pointed hastily to some livid bruises on her neck and arms, and continued with great rapidity. "'Remember this, and don't let me suffer more for you just now. If I could help you, I would, but I have not the power. They don't mean to harm you. Whatever they make you do is no fault of yours. Hush! Every word from you is a blow for me. Give me your hand. Make haste. Your hand." She caught the hand which Oliver instinctively placed in hers, and blowing out the light, drew him after her up the stairs. The door was opened quickly, by someone shrouded in the darkness, and was as quickly closed when they had passed out. A hackney cabriolet was in waiting. With the same vehemence which she had exhibited in addressing Oliver, the girl pulled him in with her, and drew the curtains close. The driver wanted no directions, but lashed his horse into full speed, without the delay of an instant. The girl still held Oliver fast by the hand, and continued to pour into his ear the warnings and assurances she had already imparted. All were so quick and hurried, that he had scarcely time to recollect where he was, or how he came there when the carriage stopped at the house to which the Jew's steps had been directed on the previous evening. For one brief moment Oliver cast a hurried glance along the empty street, and a cry for help hung upon his lips. But the girl's voice was in his ear, beseeching him in such tones of agony to remember her, that he had not the heart to utter it. While he hesitated, the opportunity was gone. He was already in the house, and the door was shut. 
this way, said the girl, releasing her hold for the first time. Bill? Hello, replied Sykes, appearing at the head of the stairs with a candle. Oh, that's the time of day. Come on. This was a very strong expression of approbation, an uncommonly hearty welcome, from a person of Mr. Sykes's temperament. Nancy, appearing much gratified thereby, saluted him cordially. "'Bull's eye's gone home with Tom,' observed Sykes as he lighted them up. "'He'd have been in the way.' "'That's right,' rejoined Nancy. "'So you got the kid,' said Sykes, when they had all reached the room, closing the door as he spoke. "'Yes, here he is,' replied Nancy. "'Did he come quiet?' inquired Sykes. "'Like a lamb.' rejoined Nancy. Oh, "'I'm glad to hear it,' said Sykes, looking grimly at Oliver, "'for the sake of his young carcass, as would otherwise have suffered for it. Come here, young un, and let me read you a lecture, which is as well got over at once.' Thus addressing his new pupil, Mr. Sykes pulled off Oliver's cap and threw it into a corner, and then, taking him by the shoulder, sat himself down by the table and stood the boy in front of him. "'Now, first, do you know what this is?' inquired Sykes, taking up a pocket-pistol which lay on the table. Oliver replied in the affirmative. "'Well, then, look here,' continued Sykes. "'This is powder. That is a bullet. And this is a little bit of an old hat for Wadden.' Oliver murmured his comprehension of the different bodies referred to, and Mr. Sykes proceeded to load the pistol with great nicety and deliberation. "'Now it's loaded,' said Mr. Sykes, when he had finished. "'Yes, I see it is, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Well,' said the robber, grasping Oliver's wrist, and putting the barrel so close to his temple that they touched, at which moment the boy could not repress a start. "'If you speak a word when you're out of doors with me, except when I speak to you, that loading will be in your head without notice. So, if you do make up your mind to speak without leave, say your prayers first. Having bestowed a scowl upon the object of this warning, to increase its effect, Mr. Sykes continued, "'As near as I know, there isn't anybody as would be asking very particular art of you if you was disposed of. So I needn't take this devil and all a trouble to explain matters to you, if it warn't for your own good. Do you hear me? The short and long of what you mean, said Nancy, speaking very emphatically and slightly frowning at Oliver, as if to bespeak his serious attention to her words, is that if you're crossed by him in this job, you have on hand— You'll prevent his ever telling tales afterwards, by shooting him through the head, and will take your chance of swinging for it, as you do for a great many other things in the way of business every month of your life." "'That's it,' observed Mr. Sykes approvedly. "'Women can always put things in fewest words, except when it's blowing up, and then they lengthens it out. And now he's thoroughly up to it. Let's have some supper, and get a snooze before starting.' In pursuance of this request, Nancy quickly laid the cloth. Disappearing for a few minutes, she presently returned with a pot of porter and a dish of sheep's heads, which gave occasion to several pleasant witticisms on the part of Mr. Sykes, founded upon the singular coincidence of Jemmy's being a can name common to them, and also to an ingenious implement much used in his profession. Indeed, the worthy gentleman, stimulated perhaps by the immediate prospect of being on active service, was in great spirits and good humour, in proof whereof it may be here remarked that he humorously drank all the beer at a draught, and did not utter, on a rough calculation, more than fourscore oaths during the whole progress of the meal. Supper being ended, it may be easily conceived that Oliver had no great appetite for it. Mr. Sykes disposed of a couple of glasses of spirits and water, and threw himself on the bed, ordering Nancy, with many imprecations in case of failure, to call him at five precisely. Oliver stretched himself in his clothes, by command of the same authority, on a mattress upon the floor, and the girl, mending the fire, 
sat before it in readiness to rouse them at the appointed time. For a long time Oliver lay awake, thinking it not impossible that Nancy might seek that opportunity of whispering some further advice, but the girl sat brooding over the fire, without moving, save now and then to trim the light. Weary with watching and anxiety, he at length fell asleep. When he awoke, the table was covered with tea-things, and Sykes was thrusting various articles into the pockets of his greatcoat, which hung over the back of a chair. Nancy was busily engaged in preparing breakfast. It was not yet daylight, for the candle was still burning, and it was quite dark outside. A sharp rain, too, was beating against the window-panes, and the sky looked black and cloudy. "'Now, then,' growled Sykes, as Oliver started up, "'half past five. Look sharp, or you'll get no breakfast, for it's late as it is.' Oliver was not long in making his toilet. Having taken some breakfast, he replied to a surly inquiry from Sykes, by saying that he was quite ready. Nancy, scarcely looking at the boy, threw him a handkerchief to tie round his throat. Sykes gave him a large rough cape to button over his shoulders. Thus attired, he gave his hand to the robber, who, merely pausing to show him, with a menacing gesture, that he had that same pistol in a side pocket of his greatcoat, clasped it firmly in his, and, exchanging a farewell with Nancy, led him away. Oliver turned, for an instant, when they reached the door, in the hope of meeting a look from the girl, but she had resumed her old seat in front of the fire, and sat perfectly motionless before it. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Oliver Twist is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty One. The Expedition. It was a cheerless morning when they got into the street, blowing and raining hard, and the clouds looking dull and stormy. The night had been very wet. Large pools of water had collected in the road, and the kennels were overflowing. There was a faint glimmering of the coming day in the sky, but it rather aggravated than relieved the gloom of the scene, the sombre light only serving to pale that which the street-lamps afforded, without shedding any warmer or brighter tints upon the wet house-tops and dreary streets. There appeared to be nobody stirring in that quarter of the town. The windows of the houses were all closely shut, and the streets through which they passed were noiseless and empty. By the time they had turned into the Bethnal Green Road, the day had fairly begun to break. Many of the lamps were already extinguished. A few country wagons were slowly toiling on towards London. Now and then a stage-coach, covered with mud, rattled briskly by, the driver bestowing as he passed an admonitory lash upon the heavy wagoner, who, by keeping on the wrong side of the road, had endangered his arriving at the office a quarter of a minute after his time. The public houses, with gas-lights burning inside, were already open. By degrees other shops began to be unclosed, and a few scattered people were met with. Then came straggling groups of labourers going to their work, then men and women with fish-baskets on their heads, donkey-carts laden with vegetables, chaise-carts filled with livestock, or whole carcasses of meat, milk-women with pails, an unbroken concourse of people trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town. As they approached the city, the noise and traffic gradually increased. When they threaded the streets between Shoreditch and Smithfield, it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle. It was as light as it was likely to be, till night came on again, and the busy morning of half of the London population had begun. Turning down Sun Street and Crown Street, and crossing Finsbury Square, Mr. Sykes struck, by way of Chiswell Street, into Barbican, thence into Long Lane, and so into Smithfield, from which latter place arose a tumult of discordant sounds that filled Oliver Twist with amazement. It was market morning. The ground was covered nearly ankle-deep with filth and mire, a thick steam perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle, and mingling with the fog, which seemed to rest upon the chimney-tops, hung heavily above. All the pens in the centre of the large area, 
and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space, were filled with sheep, tied up to posts by the gutter side, were long lines of beasts and oxen, three or four deep. Countrymen, butchers, drovers, hawkers, boys, thieves, idlers, and vagabonds of every low grade, were mingled together in a mass. The whistling of drovers, the barking dogs, the bellowing and plunging of the oxen, the bleating of sheep, the grunting and squeaking of pigs, the cries of hawkers, the shouts, oaths, and quarrelling on all sides, the ringing of bells and roar of voices that issued from every public house, the crowding, pushing, driving, beating, whooping, and yelling, the hideous and discordant dim that resounded from every corner of the market, and the unwashed, unshaven, squalid, and dirty figures constantly running to and fro, and bursting in and out of the throng, rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene which quite confounded the senses. Mr. Sykes, dragging Oliver after him, elbowed his way through the thickest of the crowd, and bestowed very little attention on the numerous sights and sounds which so astonished the boy. He nodded twice or thrice to a passing friend, and, resisting as many invitations to take a morning dram, pressed steadily onward, until they were clear of the turmoil, and had made their way through Hosier Lane into Hoban. "'Now, young un,' said Sykes, looking up at the clock of St. Andrew's Church, "'hard upon seven. You must step out. Come, don't lag behind already, lazy legs.' Mr. Sykes accompanied this speech with a jerk at his little companion's wrist. Oliver, quickening up his pace into a kind of trot between a fast walk and a run, kept up with the rapid strides of the housebreaker as well as he could. They held their course at this rate until they had passed Hyde Park Corner, and were on their way to Kensington, when Sykes relaxed his pace, until an empty cart, which was at some little distance behind, came up. Seeing Hounslow written on it, he asked the driver, with as much civility as he could assume, if he would give them a lift as far as Islesworth. "'Jump up!' said the man. "'Is that your boy?' "'Yes, he's my boy,' replied Sykes, looking hard at Oliver, and putting his hand abstractedly into the pocket where the pistol was. "'Your father walks rather too quick for you, don't he, my man?' inquired the driver, seeing that Oliver was out of breath. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes, interposing. "'He's used to it. Here, take hold of my hand, Ned. In with you.' Thus addressing Oliver, he helped him into the cart, and the driver, pointing to a heap of sacks, told him to lie down there and rest himself. As they passed the different milestones, Oliver wondered more and more where his companion meant to take him. Kensington, Hammersmith, Chiswick, Kew Bridge, Brentford, were all past, and yet they went on as steadily as if they had only just begun their journey. At length they came to a public-house called the Coach and Horses, a little way beyond which another road appeared to run off, and here the cart stopped. Sykes dismounted with great precipitation, holding Oliver by the hand all the while, and lifting him down directly bestowed a furious look upon him, and wrapped the side pocket with his fist in a significant manner. "'Good-bye, boy,' said the man. "'He's sulky,' replied Sykes, giving him a shake. "'He's sulky. A young dog. Don't mind him.' "'Not I,' rejoined the other, getting into his cart. "'It's a fine day, after all.' And he drove away. Sykes waited until he had fairly gone, and then, telling Oliver he might look about him if he wanted, once again led him onward on his journey. They turned round to the left, a short way past the public-house, and then, taking a right-hand road, walked on for a long time, passing many large gardens and gentlemen's houses on both sides of the way, and stopping for nothing but a little beer, until they reached a town. Here against the wall of a house, Oliver saw written up in pretty large letters, Hampton. They lingered about in the fields for some hours. At length they came back into the town, and, turning into an old public-house with a defaced signboard, ordered some dinner by the kitchen fire. The kitchen was an old, low-roofed room, with a great beam across the middle of the ceiling, and benches with high backs to them by the fire, on which were seated several rough men in smock-frocks, drinking and smoking. 
they took no notice of Oliver, and very little of Sykes, and, as Sykes took very little notice of them, he and his young comrade sat in a corner by themselves, without being much troubled by their company. They had some cold meat for dinner, and sat so long after it, while Mr. Sykes indulged himself with three or four pipes, that Oliver began to feel quite certain they were not going any further. Being much tired with the walk, and getting up so early, he dozed a little at first. Then, quite overpowered by fatigue and the fumes of the tobacco, fell asleep. It was quite dark when he was awakened by a push from Sykes. Rousing himself sufficiently to sit up and look about him, he found that worthy in close fellowship and communication with a labouring man over a pint of ale. "'So, you're going on to Lower Halliford, are you?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, I am,' replied the man, who seemed a little the worse, or better, as the case might be, for drinking. "'And not slow about it, neither. My horse hasn't got a load behind him going back, as he had coming up in the morning, and he won't be long a-doing of it. He is luck to him. He cod. He's a good un. "'Could you give me and my boy a lift as far as there?' demanded Sykes, pushing the ale towards his new friend. "'If you're going to write directly, I can,' replied the man, looking out of the pot. "'Are you going to Alliford?' "'You're not a Shepperton,' replied Sykes. "'I'm your man as far as I go,' replied the other. "'Is all paid, Becky?' "'Yes, the other gentleman's paid,' replied the girl. "'I say,' said the man, with tipsy gravity, "'that won't do, you know.' "'Why not?' rejoined Sykes. "'You're a-going to accommodate us.' and what's to prevent my standing treat for a pint or so, in return?" The stranger reflected upon this argument with a very profound face. Having done so, he seized Sykes by the hand, and declared he was a real good fellow, to which Mr. Sykes replied he was joking, as if he had been sober there would have been strong reason to suppose he was. After the exchange of a few more compliments, they bade the company good-night, and went out, the girl gathering up the pots and glasses as they did so, and lounging out to the door with her hands full to see the party start. The horse, whose health had been drunk in his absence, was standing outside, ready harnessed to the cart. Oliver and Sykes got in without any further ceremony, and the man to whom he belonged, having lingered for a minute or two to bear him up, and to defy the hostler and the world to produce his equal, mounted also. Then the hostler was told to give the horse his head, and, his head being given him, he made a very unpleasant use of it, tossing it into the air with great disdain, and running into the parlour windows over the way, after performing those feats, and supporting himself for a short time on his hind legs, he started off at great speed, and rattled out of the town right gallantly. The night was very dark. A damp mist rose from the river and the marshy ground about, and spread itself over the dreary fields. It was piercingly cold, too. All was gloomy and black. Not a word was spoken, for the driver had grown sleepy, and Sykes was in no mood to lead him into conversation. Oliver sat huddled together in a corner of the cart, bewildered with alarm and apprehension, and figuring strange objects in the gaunt trees whose branches waved grimly to and fro, as if in some fantastic joy at the desolation of the scene. As they passed Sunbury Church, the clock struck seven. There was a light in the ferry-house window opposite, which streamed across the road, and threw into more sombre shadow a dark yew-tree with graves beneath it. There was a dull sound of falling water not far off, and the leaves of the old tree stirred gently in the night wind. It seemed like quiet music for the repose of the dead. Sunbury was passed through, and they came again into the lonely road. Two or three miles more, and the cart stopped. Sykes alighted, took Oliver by the hand, and they once again walked on. They turned into no house at Shepperton, as the weary boy had expected, but still kept walking on, in mud and darkness, 
through gloomy lanes and over cold open wastes, until they came within sight of the lights of a town at no great distance. On looking intently forward, Oliver saw that the water was just below them, and that they were coming to the foot of a bridge. Sykes kept straight on, until they were close upon the bridge, then turned suddenly down a bank upon the left. "'The water!' thought Oliver, turning sick with fear. "'He has brought me to this lonely place to murder me!' He was about to throw himself on the ground, and make one struggle for his young life, when he saw that they stood before a solitary house, all ruinous and decayed. There was a window on each side of the dilapidated entrance, and one story above, but no light was visible. The house was dark, dismantled, and the all appearance uninhabited. Sykes, with Oliver's hand still in his, softly approached the low porch and raised the latch. The door yielded to the pressure, and they passed in together. End of chapter 21《ハッピーニューアルバム》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Two. The Burglary. Hello! cried a loud, hoarse voice as soon as they set foot in the passage. Don't make such a row," said Sykes, bolting the door. "Show a glim, Toby." "'Aha, my pal!' cried the same voice. "'A glim, Barney! A glim! Show the gentleman in, Barney! Wake up first, if convenient!' The speaker appeared to throw a boot-jack, or some such article, at the person he addressed, to rouse him from his slumbers. For the noise of a wooden body, falling violently, was heard, and then an indistinct muttering, as of a man between sleep and awake. "'Dear!' cried the same voice. "'There's Bill Sykes in the passage, with nobody to do the civil with him. And you sleep in there, as if you took laudanum with your meals and nothing stronger. Are you any fresher now, or do you want the iron candlestick to wake you thoroughly?' A pair of slipshod feet shuffled hastily across the bare floor of the room, as this interrogatory was put, and there issued from a door on the right hand first a feeble candle, and next the form of the same individual who has been heretofore described as labouring under the infirmity of speaking through his nose, and officiating as waiter at the public-house on Saffron Hill. "'Bisty Sykes!' exclaimed Barney, with real or counterfeit joy. "'Cubbid, sir! Cubbid!' "'Here, you get on first, said Sykes, putting Oliver in front of him. "'Quicker!' or I shall tread upon your heels." Muttering a curse upon his tardiness, Sykes pushed Oliver before him, and they entered a low dark room with a smoky fire, two or three broken chairs, a table, and a very old couch, on which, with his legs much higher than his head, a man was reposing at full length, smoking a long clay pipe. He was dressed in a smartly cut, snuff-coloured coat, with large brass buttons, an orange neckerchief, a coarse, staring, shawl-pattern waistcoat, and drab breeches. Mr. Crackett, for he it was, had no very great quantity of hair, either upon his head or face, but what he had was of a reddish dye, and tortured into long corkscrew curls, through which he occasionally thrust some very dirty fingers, ornamented with large common rings. He was a trifle above the middle size, and apparently rather weak in the legs but this circumstance by no means detracted from his own admiration of his top-boots, which he contemplated in their elevated situation with lively satisfaction. "'Bill, my boy,' said this figure, turning his head towards the door, "'I'm glad to see you. I was almost afraid you'd given it up, in which case I should have made a personal winter. Hello. Uttering this exclamation in a tone of great surprise, as his eyes rested on Oliver, Mr. Toby Crackett brought himself into a sitting posture, and demanded who that was. "'The boy! Only the boy!' replied Sykes, drawing a chair towards the fire. 
"'What of Mr. Fagin's lads?' exclaimed Barney with a grin. "'Fagin's, eh?' exclaimed Toby, looking at Oliver. "'What an inwallable boy that'll make for the old lady's pockets in chapels. His mug is a fortin to him.' "'There, there's enough of that,' interposed Sykes impatiently, and stooping over his recumbent friend, he whispered a few words in his ear, at which Mr. Crackett laughed immensely, and honoured Oliver with a long stare of astonishment. "'Now,' said Sykes, as he resumed his seat, "'if you'll give us something to eat and drink, while we're waiting, you'll put some art in us, or in me at all events. Sit down by the fire, younker, and rest yourself, for you'll have to go out with us again to-night, though not very far off.' Oliver looked at Sykes, in mute and timid wonder, and drawing a stool to the fire, sat with his aching head upon his hands, scarcely knowing where he was, or what was passing around him. "'Here,' said Toby, as the young Jew placed some fragments of food and a bottle upon the table, "'success to the crack!' He rose to honour the toast, and, carefully depositing his empty pipe in a corner, advanced to the table filled a glass with spirits, and drank off its contents. Mr. Sykes did the same. "'A drain for the boy?' said Toby, half filling a wine-glass. "'Down with it, innocence!' "'Indeed,' said Oliver, looking piteously up into the man's face. "'Indeed, I down with it!' echoed Toby. "'Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Tell him to drink it, Bill.' "'He had better!' said Sykes, clapping his hand upon his pocket. "'Burn my body, if he isn't more trouble than a whole family of dodgers. Drink it, you perverse imp, drink it!' Frightened by the menacing gestures of the two men, Oliver hastily swallowed the contents of the glass, and immediately fell into a violent fit of coughing, which delighted Toby Crackett and Barney, and even drew a smile from the surly Mr. Sykes. This done, and Sykes having satisfied his appetite, Oliver could eat nothing but a small crust of bread which they made him swallow. The two men laid themselves down on chairs for a short nap. Oliver retained his stool by the fire. Barney, wrapped in a blanket, stretched himself on the floor, close outside the fender. They slept, or appeared to sleep, for some time, nobody stirring but Barney, who rose once or twice to throw coals on the fire. Oliver fell into a heavy doze, imagining himself straying along the gloomy lanes, or wandering about the dark churchyard, or retracing some one or other of the scenes of the past day, when he was roused by Toby Crackett, jumping up, and declaring it was half-past one. In an instant the other two were on their legs, and all were actively engaged in busy preparation. Sykes and his companion enveloped their necks and chins in large dark shawls and drew on their greatcoats. Barney, opening a cupboard, brought forth several articles, which he hastily crammed into the pockets. "'Barkers for me, Barney,' said Toby Crackett. "'Here they are,' replied Barney, producing a pair of pistols. "'You loaded Deb yourself.' "'All right,' replied Toby, stowing them away. "'The persuaders!' "'I've got him," replied Sykes. Grape. "'Keys? Centipits? Darkies? Nothing forgotten?' inquired Toby, fastening a small crowbar to a loop inside the skirt of his coat. "'All right,' rejoined his companion. "'Bring them bits of timber, Barney. That's the time of day.' With these words he took a thick stick from Barney's hands, who, having delivered another to Toby, busied himself in fastening on Oliver's cape. "'Now, then!' said Sykes, holding out his hand. Oliver, who was completely stupefied by the unwonted exercise, and the air, and the drink which had been forced upon him, put his hand mechanically into that which Sykes extended for the purpose. "'Take his other hand, Toby,' said Sykes. "'Look out, Barney!' The man went to the door, and returned to announce that all was quiet. The two robbers issued forth, with Oliver between them. Barney, having made all fast, rolled himself up as before, and was soon asleep again. 
It was now intensely dark. The fog was much heavier than it had been in the early part of the night, and the atmosphere was so damp that, although no rain fell, Oliver's hair and eyebrows, within a few minutes after leaving the house, had become stiff with the half-frozen moisture that was floating about. They crossed the bridge, and kept on towards the lights which he had seen before. They were at no great distance off, and as they walked pretty briskly, they soon arrived at Chertsey. "'Slap through the town,' whispered Sykes. "'There'll be nobody in the way to-night to see us.' Toby acquiesced and they hurried through the main street of the little town, which at that late hour was wholly deserted. A dim light shone at intervals from some bedroom window, and the hoarse barking of dogs occasionally broke the silence of the night, but there was nobody abroad. They had cleared the town as the church bell struck two. Quickening their pace, they turned up a road upon the left hand. After walking about a quarter of a mile, they stopped before a detached house surrounded by a wall to the top of which Toby Crackett, scarcely pausing to take breath, climbed in a twinkling. "'The boy next,' said Toby. "'Hoist him up. I'll catch hold of him.' Before Oliver had time to look round, Sykes had caught him under the arms, and in three or four seconds he and Toby were lying on the grass on the other side. Sykes followed directly, and they stole cautiously towards the house. And now, for the first time, Oliver, well-nigh mad with grief and terror, saw that housebreaking and robbery, if not murder, were the objects of the expedition. He clasped his hands together, and involuntarily uttered a subdued exclamation of horror. A mist came before his eyes, the cold sweat stood upon his ashy face, his limbs failed him, and he sank upon his knees. "'Get up!' murmured Sykes, trembling with rage, and drawing the pistol from his pocket. "'Get up, or I'll strew your brains upon the grass!' "'Oh, for God's sake, let me go!' cried Oliver. "'Let me run away and die in the fields. I will never come near London. Never, never. Oh, pray, have mercy on me, and do not make me steal. For the love of all the bright angels is rest in heaven. Have mercy upon me!' The man to whom this appeal was made swore a dreadful oath, and had cocked the pistol, when Toby, striking it from his grasp, placed his hand upon the boy's mouth, and dragged him to the house. "'Hush!' cried the man. "'He won't answer here. Say another word, and I'll do your business myself with a crack on the head. That makes no noise, and is quite as certain and more genteel. Here, Bill, winch the shutter open.' He's game enough now, I'll engage. I've seen older hands of his age took the same way for a minute or two on a cold night." Sykes, invoking terrific imprecations upon Fagin's head for sending Oliver on such an errand, plied the crowbar vigorously, but with little noise. After some delay, and some assistance from Toby, the shutter to which he had referred swung open on its hinges. It was a little lattice window about five feet and a half above the ground at the back of the house, which belonged to a scullery or small brewing-place at the end of the passage. The aperture was so small that the inmates had probably not thought it worth while to defend it more securely, but it was large enough to admit a boy of Oliver's size nevertheless. A very brief exercise of Mr. Sykes' art sufficed to overcome the fastening of the lattice, and it soon stood wide open also. "'Now, listen!' "'You young limb!' whispered Sykes, drawing a dark lantern from his pocket, and throwing the glare full on Oliver's face. "'I'm a-going to put you through there. Take this light, go softly up the steps straight afore you, and along the little hall to the street door. Unfasten it, and let us in. "'There's a bolt at the top you won't be able to reach,' interposed Toby. Stand upon one of the old chairs. There are three there, Bill, with a jolly large blue unicorn and gold pitchfork on em, which is the old lady's arms. Keep quiet, can't you? replied Sykes with a threatening look. The room door is open, is it? Wide, replied Toby, after peeping in to satisfy himself. The game of that is, 
and they always leave it open with a catch, so that the dog, who's got a bed in here, may walk up and down the passage when he feels wakeful. <laughs> Barney toised him away to-night. So neat." Although Mr. Crackett spoke in a scarcely audible whisper, and laughed without noise, Sykes imperiously commanded him to be silent, and to get to work. Toby complied, by first producing his lantern, and placing it on the ground, then by planting himself firmly with his head against the wall beneath the window, and his hands upon his knees, so as to make a step of his back. This was no sooner done, than Sykes, mounting upon him, put Oliver gently through the window with his feet first, and, without leaving hold of his collar, planted him safely on the floor inside. "'Take this lantern,' said Sykes, looking into the room. "'You see the stairs afore you?' Oliver, more dead than alive, gasped out, "'Yes!' Sykes, pointing to the street door with a pistol barrel, briefly advised him to take notice that he was within shot all the way, and that if he faltered he would fall dead that instant. "'It's done in a minute,' said Sykes, in the same low whisper. "'Directly I leave go of you. Do your work.' "'Hark! What's that?' whispered the other man. They listened intently. "'Nothing.' said Sykes, releasing his hold of Oliver. Now! In the short time he had had to collect his senses, the boy had firmly resolved that, whether he died in the attempt or not, he would make one effort to dart upstairs from the hall and alarm the family. Filled with this idea, he advanced at once, but stealthily. Come back! Suddenly cried Sykes aloud. Back! Back! Scared by the sudden breaking of the dead stillness of the place, and by a loud cry which followed it, Oliver let his lantern fall, and knew not whether to advance or fly. The cry was repeated. A light appeared. A vision of two terrified half-dressed men at the top of the stairs swam before his eyes. A flash, a loud noise, a smoke, a crash somewhere, but where he knew not, and he staggered back. Sykes had disappeared for an instant, but he was up again and had him by the collar before the smoke had cleared away. He fired his own pistol after the men, who were already retreating, and dragged the boy up. "'Clasp your arm tighter,' said Sykes, as he drew him through the window. "'Give me a shawl here. They've hit him. Quick! How the boy bleeds!' Then came the loud ringing of a bell, mingled with the noise of firearms and the shouts of men and the sensation of being carried over uneven ground at a rapid pace, and then the noises grew confused in the distance, and a cold, deadly feeling crept over the boy's heart, and he saw or heard no more. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Oliver Twist This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 23. Which contains the substance of a pleasant conversation between Mr. Bumble and a lady, and shows that even a beadle may be susceptible on some points. The night was bitter cold. The snow lay on the ground, frozen into a hard thick crust, so that only the heaps that had drifted into byways and corners were affected by the sharp wind that howled abroad, which, as if expending increased fury on such prey as it found, caught it savagely up in clouds, and, whirling it into a thousand misty eddies, scattered it in air. Bleak, dark, and piercing cold, it was a night for the well-housed and fed to draw round the bright fire. And thank God they were at home, and for the homeless, starving wretch to lay him down and die. Many hunger-worn outcasts close their eyes in our bare streets at such times, who, let their crimes have been what they may, can hardly open them in a more bitter world. Such was the aspect of out-of-doors affairs, when Mrs. Corney, the matron of the workhouse to which our readers have been already introduced as the birthplace of Oliver Twist, sat herself down before a cheerful fire in her own little room and glanced, with no small degree of complacency, at a small round table, on which stood a tray of corresponding size, 
furnished with all necessary materials for the most grateful meal that matrons enjoy. In fact, Mrs. Corney was about to solace herself with a cup of tea. As she glanced from the table to the fireplace, where the smallest of all possible kettles was singing a small song in a small voice, her inward satisfaction evidently increased. So much so, indeed, that Mrs. Corney smiled. Well, said the matron, leaning her elbow on the table, and looking reflectively at the fire, I am sure we have all on us a great deal to be grateful for. A great deal, if we did but know it. Ha! <laughs> Mrs. Corney shook her head mournfully, as if deploring the mental blindness of those paupers who did not know it, and trusting a silver spoon, private property, into the inmost recesses of a two-ounce tin tea-caddy, proceeded to make the tea. How slight a thing will disturb the equanimity of our frail minds! The black teapot, being very small and easily filled, ran over while Mrs. Corney was moralising and the water slightly scalded Mrs. Corney's hand. "'How oh, dread the pot!' said the worthy matron, setting it down very hastily on the hob. "'A little stupid thing, that only holds a couple of cups. What use is it of to anybody, except,' said Mrs. Corney, pausing, "'except to a poor, desolate creature like me. Oh, dear!' With these words, the matron dropped into her chair, and once more resting her elbow on the table, thought of her solitary fate. The small teapot, and the single cup, had awakened in her mind sad recollections of Mr. Corney, who had not been dead more than five-and-twenty years, and she was overpowered. "'I shall never get another,' said Mrs. Corney, pettishly. "'I shall never get another like him.' Whether this remark bore reference to the husband or the teapot is uncertain. It might have been the latter for Mrs. Corney looked at it as she spoke, and took it up afterwards. She had just tasted her first cup, when she was disturbed by a soft tap at the room door. "'Oh, come in with you,' said Mrs. Corney sharply. "'Some of the old women dying, I suppose. They always die when I'm at meals. Don't stand there letting the cold air in, don't. What's amiss now, eh?' "'Nothing, ma'am, nothing,' replied a man's voice. "'Oh, dear me!' exclaimed the matron in a much sweeter tone. "'Is that Mr. Bumble?' "'At your service, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, who had been stopping outside to rub his shoes clean, and to shake the snow off his coat, and who now made his appearance, bearing the cocked hat in one hand and a bundle in the other. "'Shall I shut the door, ma'am?' The lady modestly hesitated to reply lest there should be any impropriety in holding an interview with Mr. Bumble with closed doors. Mr. Bumble, taking advantage of the hesitation, and being very cold himself, shut it without permission. "'Hard weather, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'Hard indeed, ma'am,' replied the beadle. "'Any parochial weather this, ma'am. We have given away, Mrs. Corney, we have given away a matter of twenty quartern loaves and a cheese and a half, this very blessed afternoon. And yet them paupers are not contented." "'Of course not. When would they be, Mr. Bumble?' said the matron, sipping her tea. "'When indeed, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'Why, he is one man that, in consideration of his wife and large family, has a quartern loaf and a good pound of cheese full weight. Is he grateful, ma'am? Is he grateful? not a copper farthing's worth of it. What does he do, ma'am, but ask for a few coals? If it's only a pocket handkerchief full, he says. Coals? What would he do with coals? Toast his cheese with them, and then come back for more? That's the way with these people, ma'am. Give them an apron full of coals to-day, and they'll come back for another the day after to-morrow, as brazen as alabaster." The matron expressed her entire concurrence in this intelligible simile, and the beadle went on. "'I never,' said Mr. Bumble, "'see anything like the pitch it's got to. The day afore yesterday, a man—you have been a married woman, ma'am, and I may mention it to you—a man, with hardly a rag upon his back—here Mrs. Corney looked at the floor—goes to our overseer's door, when he has got company coming to dinner and says he must be relieved, Mrs. Corney. As he wouldn't go away, 
and shocked the company very much. Our overseer sent him out a pound of potatoes and half a pint of oatmeal. "'My heart, says the ungrateful villain, "'what's the use of this to me? "'You might as well give me a pair of iron spectacles.' "'Very good,' says our overseer, taking them away again. "'You won't get anything else here. "'Then I'll die in the streets,' says the vagrant. "'Oh, no, you won't,' says our overseer. <laughs> oh, that was very good. So like Mr. Granite, wasn't it? interposed the matron. Well, Mr. Pample. Well, ma'am, rejoined the beadle, he went away, and he did die in the streets. There's an obstinate pauper before you. It beats anything I could have believed, observed the matron emphatically. But don't you think out of door relief a very bad thing anyway, Mr. Pample? You're a gentleman of experience, and ought to know. Come." "'Mrs. Corney,' said the beadle, smiling as men smile, who are conscious of superior information, "'out of door relief, properly managed, properly managed, ma'am, is the parochial safeguard. The great principle of out of door relief is to give the paupers exactly what they don't want, and then they get tired of coming.' "'Dear me!' exclaimed Mrs. Corney. Well, <laughs> that is a good one, too. Yes, betwixt you and me, ma'am, returned Mr. Bumble, that's the great principle, and that's the reason why, if you look at any cases that get into them audacious newspapers, you'll always observe that sick families have been relieved with slices of cheese. That's the rule now, Mrs. Corney, all over the country. But however, said the beadle, stopping to unpack his bundle. These are official secrets, ma'am, not to be spoken of, except, as I may say, among the parochial officers, such as ourselves. This is the port wine, ma'am, that the board ordered for the infirmary. Real, fresh, genuine port wine. Only out of the cask this forenoon. Clear as a bell, no sediment. Having held the first bottle up to the light, and shaken it well to test its excellence, Mr. Bumble placed them both on top of a chest of drawers, folded the handkerchief in which they had been wrapped, put it carefully in his pocket, and took up his hat as if to go. "'You'll have a very cold walk, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'It blows, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble, turning up his coat-collar, "'enough to cut one's ears off.' The matron looked from the little kettle to the beadle, who was moving towards the door, and as the beadle coughed, preparatory to bidding her good-night, bashfully inquired whether, whether he wouldn't take a cup of tea. Mr. Bumble instantaneously turned back his collar again, laid his hat and stick upon a chair, and drew another chair up to the table. As he slowly seated himself, he looked at the lady. She fixed her eyes upon the little teapot. Mr. Bumble coughed again, and slightly smiled. Mrs. Corney rose to get another cup and saucer from the closet. As she sat down, her eyes once again encountered those of the gallant beadle. She coloured, and applied herself to the task of making his tea. Again Mr. Bumble coughed, louder this time than he had coughed yet. "'Sweet, Mr. Bumble?' inquired the matron, taking up the sugar-basin. "'Very sweet indeed, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble. He fixed his eyes on Mrs. Corney as he said this and if ever a beadle looked tender, Mr. Bumble was that beadle at that moment. The tea was made, and handed in silence, Mr. Bumble having spread a handkerchief over his knees to prevent the crumbs from sullying the splendour of his shorts, began to eat and drink, varying these amusements occasionally by fetching a deep sigh, which, however, had no injurious effect upon his appetite, but, on the contrary, rather seemed to facilitate his operations in the tea and toast department. "'You have a cat, ma'am, I see,' said Mr. Bumble, glancing at one who, in the centre of her family, was basking before the fire. "'And kittens, too, I declare.' Oh, "'I'm so fond of them, Mr. Bumble. You can't think,' replied the matron. "'They're so happy, so frolicsome, and so cheerful that they are quite companions for me." "'Very nice animals, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble approvingly. 
so very domestic. Oh, yes, rejoined the matron with enthusiasm. So fond of their home, too. That is quite a pleasure, I'm sure. Mrs. Corney, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble, slowly, and marking the time with his spoon. I mean to say this, ma'am, that any cat or kitten that could live with you, ma'am, and not be fond of its home, must be a ass, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Bumble, remonstrated Mrs. Corney. It's of no use disguising facts, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble, slowly flourishing the teaspoon with a kind of amorous dignity which made him doubly impressive. I would drown it myself, with pleasure. Then you're a cruel man, said the matron vivaciously, as she held out her hand for the beadle's cup. And a very hard-hearted man besides. Hard-hearted, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble. Hard? Mr. Bumble resigned his cup without another word, squeezed Mrs. Corney's little finger as she took it, and inflicting two open-handed slaps upon his laced waistcoat, gave a mighty sigh, and hitched his chair a very little morsel farther from the fire. It was a round table, and as Mrs. Corney and Mr. Bumble had been sitting opposite each other, with no great space between them, and fronting the fire, it will be seen that Mr. Bumble, in receding from the fire, and still keeping at the table, increased the distance between himself and Mrs. Corney, which proceeding some prudent readers will doubtless be disposed to admire, and to consider an act of great heroism on Mr. Bumble's part, he being in some sort tempted by time, place, and opportunity to give utterance to certain soft nothings, which however well they may have become the lips of the light and thoughtless, do seem immeasurably beneath the dignity of judges of the land, members of Parliament, ministers of state, lord mayors, and other great public functionaries, but more particularly beneath the stateliness and gravity of a beadle, who, as is well known, should be the sternest and most inflexible among them all. Whatever were Mr. Bumble's intentions, however, and no doubt they were of the best, it unfortunately happened, as has been twice before remarked, that the table was a round one. Consequently, Mr. Bumble, moving his chair by little and little, soon began to diminish the distance between himself and the matron, and, continuing to travel round the outer edge of the circle, brought his chair, in time, close to that in which the matron was seated. Indeed, the two chairs touched, and when they did so, Mr. Bumble stopped. Now, if the matron had moved her chair to the right, she would have been scorched by the fire, and if to the left, she must have fallen into Mr. Bumble's arms. So, being a discreet matron, and no doubt foreseeing these consequences at a glance, she remained where she was, and handed Mr. Bumble another cup of tea. "'Hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stirring his tea and looking up into the matron's face. "'Are you hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney?' "'Dear me!' exclaimed the matron. What a very curious question from a single man! What can you want to know for, Mr. Bumble?" The beadle drank his tea to the last drop, finished a piece of toast, whisked the crumbs off his knees, wiped his lips, and deliberately kissed the matron. "'Mr. Bumble!' cried that discreet lady in a whisper, for the fright was so great that she had quite lost her voice. "'Mr. Bumble! I shall scream!' Mr. Bumble made no reply, but in a slow and dignified manner put his arm round the matron's waist. As the lady had stated her intention of screaming, of course she would have screamed at this additional boldness, but that the exertion was rendered unnecessary by a hasty knocking at the door, which was no sooner heard than Mr. Bumble darted with much agility to the wine-bottles, and began dusting them with great violence, while the matron sharply demanded who was there. It is worthy of remark, as a curious physical instance of the efficacy of a sudden surprise in counteracting the effects of extreme fear, that her voice had quite recovered all its official asperity. "'If you please, mistress,' said a withered old female pauper, hideously ugly, putting her head in the door, "'Old Sally is a-going fast.' "'Well, what's that to me?' 
angrily demanded the matron. "'I can't keep her alive, can I?' "'No, no, mistress,' replied the old woman. "'Nobody can. She's far beyond the reach of help. I've seen a many people die, little babes and great strong men, and I know when death's a coming well enough. But she's troubled in her mind, and when the fits are not on her, and that's not often, for she's dying very hard, she says she has got something to tell which you must hear.' she'll never die quiet till you come mistress at this intelligence the worthy mrs corney muttered a variety of invectives against old women who couldn't even die without purposely annoying their betters and muffling herself in a thick shawl which she hastily caught up briefly requested mr bumble to stay till she came back lest anything particular should occur bidding the messenger walk fast and not be all night hobbling up the stairs she followed her from the room with a very ill grace, scolding all the way. Mr. Bumble's conduct on being left to himself was rather inexplicable. He opened the closet, counted the teaspoons, weighed the sugar-tongs, closely inspected a silver milk-pot to ascertain that it was of the genuine metal, and, having satisfied his curiosity on these points, put on his cocked hat corner-wise, and danced with much gravity four distinct times round the table. Having gone through this very extraordinary performance, he took off the cocked hat again, and, spreading himself before the fire, with his back towards it, seemed to be mentally engaged in taking an exact inventory of the furniture. End of chapter 23